Lord of Destiny, written by Andrzej Sapkowski, translated from the Polish by David French, and read by Peter Kenny. The Bounds of Reason Chapter 1 he won't get out of there, I'm telling you, the pockmarked man said, shaking his head with conviction. He's been an hour and a quarter since he went down. That's the end of him. The townspeople, crammed among the ruins, stared in silence at the black hole gaping in the debris, at the rubble-strewn opening. A fat man in a yellow jerkin shifted from one foot to the other, cleared his throat, and took off his crumpled biretta. Let's wait a little longer he said, wiping the sweat from his thinning eyebrows. For what? the spotty-faced man snarled. Have you forgotten, Alderman, that a basilisk is lurking in that there dungeon? No one who goes in there comes out. Haven't enough people perished? Why wait? But we struck a deal, the fat man muttered hesitantly. This just isn't right. We made a deal with a living man, Alderman, said the spotty-faced man's companion a giant in a leather butcher's apron. And now he's dead, sure as eggs is eggs. It was plain from the start he was headed to his doom, just like the others. Why, he even went in without a looking glass, taking only a sword. And you can't kill a basilisk without a looking glass. Everyone knows that. You saved yourself a shilling, Alderman, the spotty-faced man added, for there is no one to pay for the basilisk. So... Get off home nice and easy, and we'll take the sorcerer's horse and chattels. Shame to let goods go to waste. Aye, the butcher said. A sturdy mare and saddlebags, nicely stuffed. Let's take a peek at what's inside. This isn't right. What are you doing? Quiet, Alderman, and stay out of this, or you're in for a hiding, the spotty-faced man warned. Sturdy mare, the butcher repeated. Leave that horse alone, comrade. The butcher turned slowly towards the newcomer, who had appeared from a recess in the wall, and the people gathered around the entrance to the dungeon. The stranger had thick, curly chestnut hair. He was wearing a dark brown tunic over a padded coat and high riding boots, and he was not carrying a weapon. Move away from the horse, he repeated, smiling venomously. What is this? Another man's horse, saddlebags and property, and you can't take your watery little eyes off them, can't wait to get your scabby mitts on them. Is that fitting behaviour? The spotty-faced man, slowly sliding a hand under his coat, glanced at the butcher. The butcher nodded and beckoned towards a part of the crowd from which stepped two stocky men with close-cropped hair. They were holding clubs of the kind used to stun animals in a slaughterhouse. Who are you? the spotty-faced man asked, still holding his hand inside his coat, to tell us what is right and what is not. That is not your concern, comrade. You carry no weapon. Tis true. The stranger smiled even more venomously. I do not. That's too bad. The spotty-faced man removed his hand, and with it a long knife from inside his coat. It is very unfortunate that you do not. The butcher also drew a knife, as long as a cutlass. The other two men stepped forward, raising their clubs. I have no need, the stranger said, remaining where he stood. My weapons follow me. Two young women came out from behind the ruins, treading with soft, sure steps. The crowd immediately parted, then stepped back and thinned out. The two women grinned flashing their teeth and narrowing their eyes, from whose corners broad tattooed stripes ran towards their ears. The muscles of their powerful thighs were visible beneath lynx skins wrapped around their hips and on their sinuous arms naked above their male gloves. Sabre hilts stuck up behind their shoulders, which were also protected by chain mail. Slowly, very slowly, the spotty-faced man bent his knees and dropped his knife on the ground. A rattle of stones and a scraping sound echoed from the hole in the rubble, and then two hands, clinging to the jagged edge of the wall, emerged from the darkness. After the hands then appeared, in turn, a head of white hair streaked with brick dust, a pale face and a sword hilt projecting above the shoulders. 
the crowd murmured. The white-haired man reached down to haul a grotesque shape from the hole, a bizarre bulk smeared in blood-soaked dust. Holding the creature by its long reptilian tail, he threw it without a word at the fat alderman's feet. He sprang back, tripping against a collapsed fragment of wall, and looked at the curved, bird-like beak, webbed wings, and the hooked talons on the scaly feet, at the swollen dewlap, once crimson, now a dirty russet, and at the glazed, sunken eyes. There's your basilisk, the white-haired man said, brushing the dust from his trousers. As agreed. Now, my two hundred lintars, if you please. Honest lintars, not too clipped. I'll check them, you can count on it. The alderman drew out a pouch with trembling hands. The white-haired man looked around and then fixed his gaze for a moment on the spotty-faced man and the knife lying by his foot. He looked at the man in the dark brown tunic and at the young women in the lynx skins. As usual, he said, taking the pouch from the alderman's trembling hands. I risk my neck for you for a paltry sum, and in the meantime you go after my things. You never change. A pox on the lot of you. Haven't been touched, the butcher muttered, moving back. The men with the clubs had melted into the crowd long before. Your things haven't been touched, sir. That pleases me greatly, the white-haired man smiled. At the sight of the smile burgeoning on his pale face like a wound bursting, the small crowd began to quickly disperse. And for that reason, friend, you shall also remain untouched. Go in peace, but make haste. The spotty-faced man was also retreating. The spots on his white face were unpleasantly conspicuous. Hey, stop there, the man in the dark brown tunic said to him. You've forgotten something. What is that, sir? You drew a knife on me. The taller of the women suddenly swayed, legs planted widely apart, and twisted her hips. Her sabre, which no one saw her draw, hissed sharply through the air. The spotty-faced man's head flew upwards in an arc and fell into the gaping opening to the dungeon. His body toppled stiffly and heavily, like a tree being felled among the crushed bricks. The crowd let out a scream. The second woman, hand on her sword hilt, whirled around nimbly, protecting her partner's back. Needlessly. The crowd, stumbling and falling over on the rubble, fled towards the town as fast as they could. The alderman loped at the front with impressive strides, outdistancing the huge butcher by only a few yards. An excellent stroke, the white-haired man commented coldly, shielding his eyes from the sun with a black-gloved hand. An excellent stroke from a Zeracanian sabre. I bow before the skill and beauty of the free warriors. I'm Geralt of Rivia. And I, the stranger in the dark brown tunic, pointed at the faded coat of arms on the front of his garment depicting three black birds sitting in a row in the centre of a uniformly gold field. Amborch, also known as Three Jackdaws. And these are my girls, Thea and Vea. That's what I call them, because you'll twist your tongue on their right names. They are both, as you correctly surmised, Zerikinian. Thanks to them, it appears, I still have my horse and belongings. I thank you, warriors. My thanks to you too, sir. Three jackdaws, and you can drop the sir. Does anything detain you in this little town, Geralt of Rivia? Quite the opposite. Excellent. I have a proposal. Not far from here, at the crossroads on the road to the riverport, is an inn. It's called the Pensive Dragon. The victuals there have no equal in these parts. I'm heading there with food and lodging in mind. It would be my honour should you choose to keep me company. Boch. The white-haired man turned around from his horse and looked into the stranger's bright eyes. I wouldn't want anything left unclear between us. I'm a witcher. I guessed as much, but you said it as you might have said, I'm a leper. There are those, Geralt said slowly, who prefer the company of lepers to that of a witcher. There are also those, three jackdaws laughed, who prefer sheep to girls. Ah, well. One can only sympathise with the former and the latter. I repeat my proposal. Geralt took off his glove and shook the hand being proffered. 
I accept. Glad to have made your acquaintance. Then let us go, for I hunger. Chapter 2 The innkeeper wiped the rough tabletop with a cloth, bowed and smiled. Two of his front teeth were missing. Right then. Three jackdaws looked up for a while at the blackened ceiling and the spiders dancing about beneath it. First, first beer, to save your legs an entire keg, and to go with the beer. <laughs> what do you propose with the beer, comrade? Cheese? risked the innkeeper. No, Boch grimaced. We'll have cheese for dessert. We want something sour and spicy with the beer. At your service. The innkeeper smiled even more broadly. His two front teeth were not the only ones he lacked. Elvers with garlic in olive oil and green pepper pods in vinegar or marinated. Very well, we'll take both. And then that soup I once ate here with uh, diverse mollusks, little fish and other tasty morsels floating in it. Log dry for soup? The very same. And then roast lamb with onions and then three score crayfish. Uh, throw as much dill into the pot as you can. After that, sheep's cheese and lettuce. And then we'll see. At your service. Is that for everyone? I mean, four times. The taller Zeracanian shook her head, patting herself knowingly on her waist, which was now hugged by a tight linen blouse. <laughs> I forgot. Three jackdaws winked at Geralt. The girls are watching their figures. A lamb just for the two of us, innkeeper. Serve the beer right now with those elvers. No, wait a while so they don't go cold. We didn't come here to stuff ourselves, but simply to spend some time in conversation. Very good. The innkeeper bowed once more. Prudence is a matter of import in your profession. Give me your hand, comrade. Gold coins jingled. The innkeeper opened his gap-toothed mouth to the limit. That is not an advance, three jackdaws announced. It is a bonus. And now hurry off to the kitchen, good fellow. It was warm in the snug. Geralt unbuckled his belt, took off his tunic and rolled up his shirt sleeves. I see, he said, that you aren't troubled by a shortage of funds. Do you live on the privileges of a knightly estate? Partially. Three jackdaws smiled without offering further details. They dealt quickly with the elvers and a quarter of the keg. Neither of the two Zeracanians stinted on the beer, and soon were both in visible good humour. They were whispering something to each other. Vea, the taller one, suddenly burst out in throaty laughter. Are the warriors versed in the common speech? Geralt asked quietly, sneaking a sideways glance at them. Poorly. And they are not garrulous, for which they deserve credit. How do you find the soup, Geralt? Hmm. Let us drink. Hmm. Geralt, three jackdaws began, putting aside his spoon and hiccuping in a dignified manner. I wish to return, for a moment, to the conversation we had on the road. I understand that you, a witcher, wander from one end of the world to the other, and should you come across a monster along the way, you kill it. And you earn money doing that. Does that describe the witcher's trade? More or less. And does it ever happen that someone specifically summons you somewhere, on a special commission, let's say? Then what? You go and carry it out? That depends on who asks me and why. And for how much? That too. The witcher shrugged. Prices are going up, and one has to live, as a sorcerer's acquaintance of mine used to say. Quite a selective approach. Very practical, I'd say. But at the root of it lies some idea, Geralt. The conflict between the forces of order and the forces of chaos, as a sorcerer acquaintance of mine used to say. I imagine that you carry out your mission, defending people from evil always and everywhere, without distinction. You stand on a clearly defined side of the palisade. The forces of order, the forces of chaos. Awfully high-flown words, Borg. You desperately want to position me on one side of the palisade in a conflict which is generally thought to be perennial, began long before us and will endure long after we've gone. On which side does the farrier shoeing horses stand? 
or our innkeeper hurrying here with a cauldron of lamb? What, in your opinion, defines the border between chaos and order? A very simple thing, said Three Jackdaws, and looked him straight in the eye. That which represents chaos is menace, is the aggressive side, while order is the side being threatened, in need of protection, in need of a defender. But let us drink, and make a start on the lamb. Rightly said. The Zeracanians, watching their figures, were taking a break from eating, time they spent drinking more quickly. Vera, leaning over on her companion's shoulder, whispered something again, brushing the tabletop with her plaid. Thea, the shorter of the two, laughed loudly, cheerfully, narrowing her tattooed eyelids. Yes, Borch said, picking a bone clean. Let us continue our talk, if you will. I understand you aren't keen on being placed on either side. You do your job. That's correct. But you cannot escape the conflict between chaos and order. Although it was your comparison, you are not a farrier. I've seen you work. You go down into a dungeon among some ruins and come out with a slaughtered basilisk. There is, comrade, a difference between shoeing horses and killing basilisks. You said that if the payment is fair, you'll hurry to the end of the world and dispatch the monster you're asked to. Let's say a fierce dragon is wreaking havoc on a bad example, Geralt interrupted. You see, right away, you've mixed up chaos and order, because I do not kill dragons, and they, without doubt, represent chaos. How so? Three jackdaws licked his fingers. Well, I never. After all, among all monsters, dragons are probably the most bestial, the cruelest and fiercest, the most revolting of reptiles. They attack people, breathe fire, and carry off, you know, virgins. There's no shortage of tales like that. It can't be that you, a witcher, don't have a few dragons on your trophy list. I don't hunt dragons, Geralt said dryly. I hunt folk tales for sure, and drake lizards, and flying drakes, but not true dragons, the green, the black, or the red. Take note, please. You astonish me. Three Jackdaws said. Very well, I've taken note. In any case, that's enough about dragons for the moment. I see something red on the horizon, and it is surely a crayfish. Let us drink. Their teeth crunched through the red shells, and they sucked out the white flesh. The salt water, stinging painfully, trickled down over their wrists. Borg poured the beer, by now scraping the ladle across the bottom of the keg. The Zeracanians were even more cheerful, the two of them looking around the inn and smiling ominously. The Witcher was convinced they were searching out an opportunity for a brawl. Three jackdaws must also have noticed, because he suddenly shook a crayfish he was holding by the tail at them. The women giggled, and Tia pouted her lips for a kiss and winked. Combined with her tattooed face, this made for a gruesome sight. They are as savage as wildcats, Three jackdaws murmured to Geralt. They need watching. With them, comrade, suddenly, before you know it, the floor is covered in guts. But they're worth every penny, if you knew what they're capable of. I know, Geralt nodded. You couldn't find a better escort. Zeracanians are born warriors, trained to fight from childhood. I didn't mean that. Borch spat a crayfish claw onto the table. I meant what they're like in bed. Geralt glanced anxiously at the women. They both smiled. Veer reached for the dish with a swift, almost imperceptible movement. Looking at the witcher through narrowed eyes, she bit open a shell with a crack. Her lips glistened with the salt water. Three jackdaws belched loudly. And so, Geralt, he said, you don't hunt dragons, neither green nor any other colour. I've made a note of it. And why, may I ask, only those three colours? Four, to be precise. You mentioned three. Dragons interest you, Borg. For any particular reason? No, but pure curiosity. Uh-huh. Well, about those colours, it's customary to define true dragons like that, although they're not precise terms. Green dragons, the most common are actually greyish, like ordinary Dracol lizards. 
Red dragons are in fact reddish or brick red. It's customary to call the large dark brown ones black. White dragons are the rarest. I've never seen one. They occur in the distant north, reputedly. Interesting. And do you know what other dragons I've also heard about? I do. Geralt sipped his beer. The same ones I've heard about. Golden dragons. There are no such creatures. On what grounds do you claim that? Because you've never seen one? Apparently you haven't seen a white one either. That's not the point. Beyond the seas in Ophir and Zangvebar, there are white horses with black stripes. I haven't seen them, but I know they exist. But golden dragons are mythical creatures, fabled. Like the phoenix, let's say. There are no phoenixes or golden dragons. Vea, leaning on her elbows, looked at him curiously. You must know what you're talking about. You're a witcher. Borch ladled beer from the keg. But I think that every myth, every fable must have some roots. Something lies among those roots. It does, Geralt confirmed. Most often a dream, a wish, a desire, a yearning. Faith that there are no limits to possibility, and occasionally chance. Precisely, chance. Perhaps there once was a golden dragon, an accidental, unique mutation. If there were, it met the fate of all mutants. The witcher turned his head away. It differed too much to endure. Ha! Huh? Three Jackdaws said. Now you are denying the laws of nature, Geralt. My sorcerer acquaintance was wont to say that every being has its own continuation in nature and survives in some way or another. The end of one is the beginning of another. There are no limits to possibility, or at least nature doesn't know any. Your sorcerer acquaintance was a great optimist, but he failed to take one thing into consideration, a mistake committed by nature, or by those who trifle with it. Golden dragons and other similar mutants, were they to exist, couldn't survive, for a very natural limit of possibilities prevents it. What limit is that? Mutants. The muscles in Geralt's jaw twitched violently. Mutants are sterile, Borg. Only in fables survives what cannot survive in nature. Only myths and fables do not know the limits of possibility. Three jackdaws said nothing. Geralt looked at the Zeracanians, at their faces suddenly grown serious. Vea unexpectedly leant over towards him and put a hard, muscular arm around his neck. He felt her lips wet from beer on his cheek. They like you. Three jackdaws said slowly. Well, I'll be damned. They like you. What's strange about that? The witcher smiled sadly. Nothing, but we must drink to it. Innkeeper, another keg. Take it easy, a pitcher at most. Two pitchers, three jackdaws yelled. Thea, I have to go out for a while. The Zeracanian stood up took her sabre from the bench and swept the room with a wistful gaze. Although previously, as the witcher had observed, several pairs of eyes had lit up greedily at the sight of Borch's bulging purse, no one seemed in a hurry to go after him as he staggered slightly towards the door to the courtyard. Tear shrugged, following her employer. What is your real name? Geralt asked the one who had remained at the table. Vea flashed her white teeth. Her blouse was very loosely laced, almost to the limits of possibility. The witcher had no doubt it was intentionally provocative. Alvirnirli. Pretty. The witcher was sure the Zeracanian would purse her lips and wink at him. He was not mistaken. Vea. Mm. Why do you ride with Borg, you free warriors? Would you mind telling me? Mm? What? Yes. The Zeracanian, frowning, searched for the words. He is the most beautiful. The witcher nodded. Not for the first time. The criteria by which women judged the attractiveness of men remained a mystery to him. Three jackdaws lurched back into the snug, 
fastening his trousers, and issued loud instructions to the innkeeper. Thea, walking two steps behind him, feigning boredom, looked around the inn, and the merchants and log drivers carefully avoided her gaze. Thea was sucking the contents from another crayfish, and continually throwing the witcher meaningful glances. I've ordered us an eel each, baked this time. Three jackdaws sat down heavily, his unfastened belt clinking. I struggled with those crayfish and seemed to have worked up an appetite. And I've organized a bed for you, Garat. There's no sense in you roaming around tonight. We can still amuse ourselves. Here's to you, girls. Vesechial, Thea said, saluting him with her beaker. Thea winked and stretched, and her bosom, contrary to Geralt's expectations, did not split the front of her blouse. Let's make merry. Three jackdaws leant across the table and slapped Thea on the backside. Let's make merry, witcher. Hey, a landlord, over here. The innkeeper scuttled briskly over, wiping his hands on his apron. Could you lay your hands on a tub, the kind you launder clothes in, sturdy and large? Uh, how large, sir? For four people. For four? The innkeeper opened his mouth. For four? Three jackdaws confirmed, drawing a full purse from his pocket. I could. The innkeeper licked his lips. Splendid, Borch laughed. Have it carried upstairs to my room and filled with hot water, with all speed, comrade, and have beer brought there too. Three pitchers. The Zeracanians giggled and winked at the same time. Which one do you prefer? Three jackdaws asked. Eh, Geralt? The witcher scratched the back of his head. I know, it's difficult to choose, said three jackdaws understandingly. I occasionally have difficulty myself. Never mind, we'll give it some thought in the tub. Hey, girls, help me up the stairs. Chapter 3 There was a barrier on the bridge. The way was barred by a long, solid beam set on wooden trestles. In front and behind it stood halberdiers in studded leather coats and male hoods. A purple banner bearing the emblem of a silver griffin fluttered lazily above the barrier. What the devil? Three jackdaws said in surprise, approaching at a walk. Is there no way through? Go aside, conduct, the nearest halberdier asked, without taking the stick he was chewing, either from hunger or to kill time from his mouth. Sif conduct? What is it? The plague? Or war, perhaps? On whose orders do you obstruct the way? Those of King Nidame, a lord of Cairngorm, the guardsman replied, shifting the stick to the other side of his mouth and pointing at the banner. Without a safe conduct, you can't go up. Some sort of idiocy, Geralt said in a tired voice. This isn't Cairngorm, but Bearfield's territory. Bearfield, not Cairngorm, levies tolls from the bridges on the Brae. What has Nidame to do with it? Don't ask me, the guard said, spitting out his stick. Not my business. I'm here to check safe conduct. If you want, talk to Aldecurian. And where might he be? He's basking in the sun over there, behind the toll collector's lodgings, the Halberdia said, looking not at Geralt, but at the naked thighs of the Zeracanians, who were stretching languidly in their saddles. Behind the toll collector's cottage sat a guard on a pile of dry logs, drawing a woman in the sand with the end of his halberd. It was actually a certain part of a woman, seen from an unusual perspective. Beside him, a slim man with a fanciful plum bonnet pulled down over his eyes, adorned with a silver buckle and a long, twitching heron's feather, was reclining, gently plucking the strings of a lute. Geralt knew that bonnet and that feather, which were famed from the Buina to the Yuruga, known in manor houses, fortresses, inns, taverns, and whorehouses, particularly whorehouses. Dandelion! Geralt the Witcher! A pair of cheerful cornflower blue eyes shone from under the bonnet, now shoved back on his head. Well, I never! You're here too? You don't have a safe conduct by any chance? What's everyone's problem with this safe conduct? The Witcher dismounted. What's happening here, Dandelion? We wanted to cross the Brea, myself and this knight, Borch, three jackdaws, and our escort, and we cannot, it appears. I can't either. Dandelion stood up, took off his bonnet, and bowed to the Zeracanians with exaggerated courtesy. 
They don't want to let me cross either. This Decurion here won't let me. Dandelion, the most celebrated minstrel and poet within a thousand miles through, although he's also an artist, as you can see. I won't let anyone cross without a safe conduct, the Decurion said resolutely, at which he completed his drawing with a final detail, prodding the end of his halberd shaft in the sand. No matter, the witcher said. We'll ride along the left bank. The road to Hengfors is longer that way, but needs must. To Hengfors? the bard said, surprised. Aren't you following Nidomir, Geralt, and the dragon? What dragon? Three jackdaws asked with interest. You don't know? You really don't know? Oh, I shall have to tell you everything, gentlemen. I'm waiting here in any case. Perhaps someone who knows me will come with a safe conduct and let me join them. Please be seated. Uh, just a moment, Three jackdaws said. Uh, the sun is almost a quarter to the noontide, and I have an awful thirst. We cannot talk on an empty stomach. There, there, head back to the town at a trot and buy a cake. I like the cut of your jib, sire. Borg, also known as Three Jackdaws. Uh, Dandelion, also known as the Unparalleled, by certain girls. Talk, Dandelion, the witcher said impatiently. We aren't going to loiter around here till evening. The bard seized the fingerboard of his lute and plucked the strings vigorously. How would you prefer it, in verse or in normal speech? Normal speech. As you please, Dandelion said, not putting his lute down. Listen then, noble gentleman, to what occurred a week ago near the free town of Bearfield. Twas thus that at the crack of dawn, when the rising sun had barely tinged pink, the shrouds of mist hanging pendant above the meadows, it was supposed to be normal speech. Geralt reminded him. Isn't it? Oh, very well, very well. I understand. Concise without metaphors. A dragon alighted on the pastures outside Bearfield. Oh, come on, the witcher said. It doesn't seem very likely to me. No one has seen a dragon in these parts for years. Wasn't it just a common old garden draco lizard? Draco lizard specimens can occasionally be as large as... Don't insult me, witcher. I know what I'm talking about. I saw it. As luck would have it, I was at the market in Bearfield and saw it all with my own eyes. The balance composed, but you didn't want go on. Was it big? The length of three horses. No taller than a horse at the withers, but much fatter. Sand grey. In other words, green. Yes. It swooped down unexpectedly, flew right into a flock of sheep, scattered the shepherds, did for about a dozen beasts, devoured four of them and flew away. Flew away. Geralt shook his head. And that was all? No, because it came again the next day, this time nearer to the town. It swooped down on a knot of women washing their linen on the banks of the Brea. <laughs> and how they bolted, old friend. I've never laughed so much. Then the dragon circled Bearfield a couple of times and flew towards the pastures, where it fell on the sheep again. Only then did the chaos and confusion begin, because few had believed the herdsmen before. The mayor called out the town constabulary and the guilds, but before they could form up, the plebs took matters into their own hands and did for it. How? In a forceful peasant manner. The local master cobbler, a certain sheep bagger, came up with a way of dealing with the brute. They killed a sheep, stuffed it full of hellebore, deadly nightshade, poison parsley, brimstone and cobbler's tar, but just to be sure, the local apothecary poured in two quarts of his concoction for carbuncles, and the priest from the temple of Craver said prayers over the carcass. Then they stood the poisoned sheep among the flock, held up by a stake. If truth be told, no one believed the dragon would be lured by that shit, which stank to high heaven. But reality surpassed our expectations. Ignoring the living and bleating bar lambs, the reptile swallowed the bait and the stake. And what then? Go on, Dandelion. What do you think I'm doing? I am telling you. Listen to what happened next. In less time than a skilled man needs to unlace a woman's corset, the dragon suddenly began to roar and vent smoke from its front and rear ends. It turned somersaults, tried to take off and then collapsed and laid still. Two volunteers set off to check whether the poisoned reptile was still breathing. It was the local gravedigger and the town halfwit, the fruit of the union between the retarded daughter of a woodcutter and a squad of hired pikemen who marched through Bearfield at the time of Warlord Nelumbo's rebellion. Now you're lying, Dandelion. 
not lying, just embellishing, and there's a difference. Not much of one. Speak on, we're wasting time. Well then, as I was saying, the grave digger and the doughty idiot set off as scouts. Afterwards, we built them a small but pleasing burial mound. Aha, Bor said. That means the dragon was still alive. And how? Dandelion said cheerfully. It was alive, but it was so weak it didn't devour either the grave digger or the half-wit. It just lapped up their blood. And then, to general consternation, it flew away, taking flight with some difficulty. Every furlong it fell with a clatter and then rose again. It walked occasionally, dragging its back legs. Some courageous individuals followed it, keeping it in view. And do you know what? Speak, Dundelion. The dragon disappeared among the ravines of the Kestrel Mountains, near the source of the Brea, and hid in the caves there. Now everything's clear, Geralt said. The dragon has probably lived in those caves for centuries, in a state of torpor. I've heard of cases like that, and his treasure hoard must be there too. Now I know why they're blocking the bridge. Someone wants to get his greedy hands on the treasure, and that someone is Nidamir of Cairngorm. Exactly, the troubadour confirmed. The whole of Bearfield is fair seething for that reason, because they claim that the dragon and its hoard belongs to them. But they hesitate to cross Nidamir. Nidamir is a young whelp who hasn't started shaving, but he's already proved it doesn't pay to fall foul of him. And he wants that dragon like the very devil, which is why he's reacted so fast. Wants the treasure, you mean? Actually, more the dragon than the treasure, for you see, Nidamir has his eye on the kingdom of Maliore. A princess of a, so to speak, bedable age was left there after the sudden and odd death of the prince. The noblemen of Maliore look on Nidamir and the other suitors with reluctance, for they know that the new ruler will keep them on a short leash, unlike the callow princess. So they dug up some dusty old prophecy, saying that the mitre and the lass's hand belong to the man who vanquishes the dragon. Because no one has seen a dragon there for ages, they thought they were safe. Nidamir, of course, laughed at the legend, took Maleore by force, and that was that. But when the news of the Bearfield dragon got out, he realised he could hoist the Maleore nobility by their own petard. If he showed up there clutching the dragon's head, the people would greet him like a monarch sent by the gods, and the nobleman wouldn't dare breathe a word. Does it surprise you, then, that he rushed after the dragon like a scalded cat? Particularly since it's dead on its feet. For him it's a real godsend, a stroke of luck by thunder. And they shot the competition out. So it would appear. And the people of Bearfield, except that he sent riders with safe conduct throughout the countryside. Uh, they're for the ones who are supposed to actually kill the dragon, because neither Mere himself is in no hurry to walk into a cave wielding a sword. In a flash, he drafted in the most renowned dragon slayers. Uh, you probably know most of them, Geralt. Possibly. Who's turned up? Ike of Denisla, to begin with. Damn. The witcher whistled softly. The pious and virtuous Ike, a knight without flaw or blemish in person. Do you know him, Geralt? Borch asked. Is he really the scourge of dragons? Not just dragons. Ike is a match for any monster. He's even killed manticores and griffins. He's dispatched a few dragons, so I've heard. He's good. But he spoils my business, the swine, because he doesn't take any money for it. Who else, Dandelion? The Crinfield Reavers. Well, that's the dragon done for. Even if it has recovered, that trio are a good team. They fight pretty dirty, but they're effective. They've wiped out all the Draco lizards and forktails in Redania, not to mention three red and one black dragon, which they also dispatched. And that's no mean feat. Is that everybody? No. Six dwarves under the command of Yarpin Zigrin have joined in. I don't know him. But you have heard of the dragon Ockvist from Quartz Mountain? Yes, and I saw some gemstones from its hoard. There are sapphires of remarkable colour and diamonds as large as cherries. Well, know you that, because Yarp and Zigrid and his dwarves did for Ockvist. A ballad was composed about it, but it was lousy because it wasn't one of mine. You've missed nothing if you haven't heard it. Is that everybody? Yes, not counting you. You claim not to know about the dragon. Who knows? Perhaps that's true. But now you do. Well? Nothing. That dragon doesn't interest me. Ha! 
Very crafty, Geralt, because you don't have a safe conduct anyway. The dragon doesn't interest me, I told you. But what about you, Dandelion? What draws you here? The usual, the troubadour shrugged. I need to be near the action and the excitement. Everyone will be talking about the fight with the dragon. Of course, I could compose a ballad based on reports, but it'll sound different sung by someone who saw the fight with his own eyes. Fight? Three jackdaws laughed. More like some kind of pig sticking or a carcass being quartered. I'm listening and I'm astounded. Celebrated warriors rushing here as fast as they can to finish off a half-dead dragon poisoned by a peasant? It makes me want to laugh and vomit. You're wrong, Geralt said. If the dragon hasn't expired from the poison, its constitution has probably already fought it off and it's back at full strength. It actually doesn't make much difference. The Crinfrid Reavers will kill it anyway, but it'll put up a fight if you want to know. So you're betting on the Reavers, Geralt? Naturally. Don't be so sure. The artistic guard, who'd been silent up to then, spoke up. A dragon is a magical creature, and you can't kill it any other way than with spells. If anybody can deal with it, then it's that sorceress who rode through yesterday. Who was that? Geralt cocked his head. The sorceress, the guard repeated. I told you. Did she give her name? She did, but I've forgotten it. She had a safe conduct. She was young. Comely in her own way, but those eyes. You know how it is, sire. You come over all cold when they look at you. Know anything about this, Dandelion? Who could it be? No, the bard grimaced. Young, comely, and those eyes. Some help that is. They're all like that. Not one of them that I know, and I know plenty, looks older than twenty-five, thirty. Though some of them, I've heard, can recall the times when the forest suffed as far as where Novigrad stands today. Anyway, what are elixirs and mandrake for? And they also sprinkle mandrake in their eyes to make them shine, as women will. Was her hair red? The witch asked. No, Zaya, the decurion said. Coal black. And her horse. What colour was it? Chestnut with a white star. No, black, like her hair. Well, gentlemen, I'm telling you, she'll kill the dragon. A dragon's a job for a sorcerer. Human strength isn't enough against it. I wonder what the cobbler sheepbagger would have to say about that, Dandelion laughed. If he'd had something stronger to hand than hellebore and deadly nightshade, the dragon's skin would be drying on the barefield stockade, the ballad would be ready, and I wouldn't be fading in this sun. Why exactly didn't Nidamir take you with him? Geralt asked, looking askance at the poet. You were in Burfield when he set off, after all. Could it be that the king doesn't like artists? How come you're fade in here instead of strumming an air by the royal stirrups? The cause was a certain young widow, Dandelion said dejectedly. The hell with it. I tarried, and the next day Nidamir and the others were already over the river. They even took that sheep bagger with them and some scouts from the Barefield Constabulary. They just forgot about me. I've explained it to the Decurion, but he keeps repeating, If there's a safe conduct, I'll let you through, the Halberdier said dispassionately, relieving himself on the wall of the toll collector's cottage. If there isn't, I don't let you through. I've got me orders. Oh, three jackdaws interrupted him. The girls are returning with the beer. And they aren't alone, Dandelion added, standing up. Look at that horse, big as a dragon. The Zeracanians galloped up from the birchwood, flanking a rider sitting on a large, restless warhorse. The Witcher also stood up. The rider was wearing a long purple velvet caftan with silver braid and a short coat trimmed with sable fur. Sitting erect in the saddle, he looked imperiously down at them. Geralt knew that kind of look and was not fond of it. Greetings, gentlemen. I am Dorigre. The rider introduced himself dismounting slowly and with dignity. Master Dorigre, sorcerer. Master Geralt, witcher. Master Dandelion, poet. Borg, also known as Three Jackdaws, and my girls, who are removing the bung from that keg, you have already met, Master Dorigre. That is so indeed, the sorcerer said without a smile. We exchanged bows, I and the beautiful warriors from Zeracania. Well then, cheers. 
Dandelion distributed the leather cups brought by Veer. Drink with us, Master Sorcerer. My Lord Borch, shall I also serve the Decurion? Of course. Join us, soldier. I presume, the Sorcerer said, after taking a small, distinguished sip, that the same purpose has brought you gentlemen to the barrier on the bridge as it has me. If you have the dragon in mind, Master Dorigore, Dandelion said, that is so indeed. I want to be there and compose a ballad. Unfortunately, that Decurion there, clearly a fellow without refinement, doesn't want to let me through. He demands a safe conduct. I beg your pardon, the Halberdia said, draining his cup and smacking his lips. I've been ordered on pain of death not to let anyone through without a safe conduct. And I'm told the whole of Bearfield has already gathered with wagons and plans to head up after the dragon. I have my orders. Your orders, soldier, Dorigare frowned. Apply to the rabble who might hinder. Trollops who might spread debauchery and foul sicknesses. Thieves, scum and rabble. But not to me. I won't let anyone through without a safe conduct. The decurion glowered. I swear, don't swear. Three jackdaws interrupted him. A better to have another drink. Taya, pour this stout-hearted soldier a beer, and let us be seated, gentlemen. Drinking standing up in a rush and without due reverence does not become the nobility. They sat down on logs around the keg. The halberdia, newly raised to nobility, blushed with pleasure. Drink, brave centurion. Three jackdaws urged. But I am a decurion, not a centurion, the halberdier said, blushing even more intensely. But you will be a centurion for certain, Borch grinned. You're an astute fellow. You'll be promoted in no time. Dorigore, declining a refill, turned towards Geralt. People are still talking about the basilisk in town, witcher, sir. And you now have your eye on the dragon, I see, he said softly. I wonder whether you're so short of money, or whether you murder endangered creatures for the simple pleasure of it. Curious interest, Geralt answered, coming from someone who is rushing not to be late for the butchering of a dragon, in order to knock out its teeth, so crucial, after all, in the making of magical cures and elixirs. Is it true, sorcerer, sir, that the best ones are those removed from a living dragon? Are you certain that is why I am going there? I am. But someone has already beaten you to it, Dorigare. A female companion of yours has already gone through with a safe conduct, which you don't have. She is black-haired, if that's of any interest to you. On a black horse? Apparently. Yennefer, Dorigare said glumly. Unnoticed by anybody, the witcher twitched. A silence fell broken only by the belching of the future centurion. Nobody, without a safe conduct, will two hundred lintar suffice. Geralt calmly took from his pocket the purse received from the fat alderman. Ah, Geralt. Three jackdaws smiled mysteriously. So you... Uh, my apologies, Buck. I'm sorry, but I won't ride with you to Hengfors. Another time, perhaps. Perhaps we'll meet again. I have no interest in going to Hengfors, three jackdaws said slowly. Not at all, Geralt. Put away that purse, sire, the future centurion said menacingly. That's sheer bribery. I won't even let you through for three hundred. And for five hundred? Borch took out his pouch. Put away that purse, Geralt. I'll pay the toll. This has begun to amuse me. Five hundred, soldiers, sir? One hundred apiece, counting my girls as one gorgeous item. What? Oh, dear, oh, dear, the future centurion said, distressed, stowing Borch's pouch away under his jacket. What will I tell the king? Tell him, Dorigare said, straightening up and removing an ornate ivory wand from his belt, that you were overcome by fear when you saw it. So what, sire? The sorcerer, flourished his wand and shouted an incantation. A pine tree on the riverbank burst into flames. In one moment, the entire tree was engulfed from top to bottom in a blaze of fire. To horse, cried Dandelion, springing up and slinging his lute across his back. To horse, gentlemen and ladies. Rise the barrier, 
the rich Decurion, with a good chance of becoming a centurion, shouted to the halberdiers. On the bridge, beyond the barrier, there reined in her horse. It skittered, hooves thudding on the planking. The woman, tossing her plaits, screamed piercingly. That's right, there, three jackdaws shouted back. Onwards, my lords, to horse. We'll ride in the Zeracanian fashion, with a thundering and a yelling. Chapter 4 Well, just look, said the oldest of the reavers, Bolholt, massive and burly, like the trunk of an old oak tree. So, Nidomir didn't chase you away, my good sirs, though I was certain he would. But it's not for us paupers to question royal commands. Join us by the campfire. Make yourselves a pallet, boys. And between you and me, Witcher, what did you talk to the king about? About nothing, Geralt said, making himself comfortable by leaning back against his saddle, which he had dragged over beside the fire. He didn't even come out of his tent to talk to us. He just sent that flunky of his. What's his name? Gillenstuen, said Yarpen Zigrin, a stocky bearded dwarf who was rolling a huge resinous tree stump he had dragged from the undergrowth into the fire. Pompous upstart, fat hog. When we joined the hunt, he came over, nose stuck up towards the heavens. Poo poo, remember you dwarves, he says, who's in command, who you have to obey. King Nidomir gives the orders here, and his word is law, and so on. I stood and listened, and I thought to myself, I'll have my lads knock him to the ground, and I'll piss all over his cape. But I dropped the idea, you know, because word would get around again that dwarves are nasty, that we're aggressive, that they're horse sons, and it's impossible to live with them in... What the hell was it? Ammonium, or wherever it was. And right away there'd be another pogrom somewhere, in some little town or other. So I just listened politely and nodded. It looks like that's all Lord Gillenstein knows, Geralt said, because he said the same to us, and all we did was nod too. And I reckon, the second reaver said, spreading a blanket over a pile of brushwood, it was a bad thing neither me didn't chase you away. Doesn't bear thinking how many people were after this dragon. Swarms of them. It's not a hunting expedition no more. It's a funeral procession. I need elbow room when I'm fighting. Come off it, Gar, Boholt said. The more the merrier. What, never hunted a dragon before? There's always a swarm of people behind a dragon, a noisy rabble, a veritable bordello on wheels. But when the reptile shows up, guess who's left standing in the field? Us, that's who. Boholt was silent for a moment, took a long draw from a large wickerbound demijohn, blew his nose loudly and coughed. Another thing, he continued. In practice, it's often only after the dragon's been killed that the merrymaking and bloodletting begins and the heads start rolling. It's only when the treasure's being shared out that the hunters go for each other's throats. Right, Geralt? Boy, am I right? Witcher, I'm talking to you. I'm aware of cases like that, Geralt concurred dryly. How well, you say? <laughs> No doubt from hearsay, because I can't say I've ever heard of you stalking a dragon. Never in all my born days have I heard of a witcher hunting dragons, which makes it all the stranger you're here. True, drawled Kennet, also known as Beanpole, the youngest reaver. That's strange, and we... Wait, Beanpole, I'm talking, Boholt cut in. And besides, I don't plan to talk for too long. Anyway, the witcher knows what I'm on about. I know him, and he knows me, and up to now we haven't got in each other's way, and we probably never will. You see, lads, if I wanted to disrupt the witcher's work or snatch the loot from under his nose, the witcher would waste no time slashing me with that witcher razor of his, and he'd be within his rights. Agreed? No one seconded or challenged this. There was nothing to suggest that Boholt cared either way. Aye, he continued, the more the merrier, as I said. And the Witcher may prove useful to the company. It's wild and deserted around here, and should a Frightener or Iliocharis or a Strigger jump out at us, there might be trouble. But if Geralt's standing by, there won't be any trouble, because that's his speciality. But dragons aren't his speciality, right? Once more, no one seconded or challenged this. Lord Three Jackdaws is with Geralt, continued Boholt, handing the demijohn to Yarpen. And that's enough of a guarantee for me. So, who's bothering you, Gar, Beanpole? 
Can't be dandelion, can it? Dandelion, Yarpen Zigrin said, passing the demijohn to the bard. Always tags along whenever something interesting's happening, and everybody knows he doesn't interfere, doesn't help, and won't slow the march down. Bit like a bird on a dog's tail, right, boys? The boys, stocky bearded dwarves, cackled, shaking their beards. Dandelion pushed his bonnet back and drank from the demijohn. <coughs> Bloody hell, he groaned, gasping for air. It takes your voice away. What was it distilled from? Scorpions? There's one thing irking me, Geralt, Beanpole said, taking the demijohn from the minstrel. And that's you bringing that sorcerer along. We can hardly move for sorcerers. That's true, the dwarf butted in. Beanpole's right. We need that dorigary like a pig needs a saddle. For some time now we've had our very own witch, the noble Yennefer. Ugh. He spat her name. Yes, indeed, Boholt said, scratching himself on his bull neck, from which a moment earlier he'd unfastened a leather collar, bristling with steel studs. There are too many sorcerers here, gentlemen, too, too many, to be precise, and they're a sight too thick with our Nidomir. Just look, we are under the stars and under fire, and they, gentlemen, are in the warm, plotting in the royal tent, the cunning foxes. Nidomir, the witch, the wizard, and Gillenstiern. And Yennefer's the worst. And do you want to know what they're plotting? How to cheat us, that's what. I'm stuffing themselves with venison, Beanpole interjected gloomily. And what did we eat? Marmot. And what's a marmot, I ask you? A rat, nothing else. So what have we eaten? Rat. Never mind, Gar said. We'll soon be sampling dragon's tail. There's nothing like dragon's tail roasted over charcoal. Yennefer, Boholt went on, is a foul, nasty, mouthy bit. Not like your lasses, Lord Borch. They are quiet and agreeable. Just look, they've sat down by the horses. They're sharpening their sabres. I walked past, said something witty. They smiled and showed their little teeth. <laughs> yes, I'm glad they're here. Not like Yennefer. All she does is scheme and scheme. And I tell you, we have to watch out, because we'll end up with shit all from our agreement. What agreement, Boholt? Well, Yarpen, do we tell the Witcher? Ain't got nothing against it, the dwarf answered. There's no more booze, Beanpole interjected, turning the demijohn upside down. Get some, then. You're the youngest, my lord. The agreement was our idea, Geralt, because we aren't hirelings or paid servants, and we won't be having Nidomir send us after that dragon and then toss a few pieces of gold in our direction. The truth is, we'll cope with that dragon without Nidomir, but Nidomir won't cope without us. So, it's clear from that who's worth more and whose share should be bigger. And we put the case fairly. Whoever takes on the dragon in mortal combat and bests it takes half of the treasure hoard. Nidomir, by virtue of his birthright and title, takes a quarter in any event. And the rest, provided they help, will share the remaining quarter between themselves equally. What do you think about that? What does Nidomir think about it? He said neither yes nor no, but he'd better not put up a fight, the whippersnapper. I told you, he won't take on the dragon himself. He has to count on experts, which means us, the Reavers, and Yarpen and his lads. We and no one else will beat the dragon at a sword's length. The rest, including the sorcerers, if they give honest assistance, will share a quarter of the treasure among themselves. Who do you include in the rest, apart from the sorcerers? Dandelion asked with interest. Certainly not buskers and poetisters, Yarp and Zigrin cackled. We include those who put in some work with a battle axe, not a loot. Aha, three jackdaws said looking up at the starry sky. And how will the cobbler Sheepbagger and his rabble be contributing? Yarpin Zegrin spat into the campfire, muttering something in Dwarven. The constabulary from Bearfield know these bloody mountains and will act as guides, Boholt said softly. Hence it will be fair to allow them a share of the spoils. It's a slightly different matter with the cobbler. You see, it will go ill if the peasantry become convinced that when a dragon shows up in the land, instead of sending for professionals, they can casually poison it and go back to humping wenches in the long grass. 
If such a practice became widespread, we'd probably have to start begging. Yes? That's right, Yapin added. For which reason, I tell you, something bad ought to befall that cobbler before the bastard passes into legend. If it's meant to befall him, it'll befall him, Gar said with conviction. Leave it to me. And Dandelion, the dwarf took up, will blacken his name in a ballad, make him look a fool, so that he'll suffer shame and dishonour for generations to come. You've forgotten about one thing, Geralt said. There's one person here who could throw a spoke in the wheel, or won't assent to any divisions or agreements. I mean, Ike of Denesley. Have you talked to him? What about? Boholt said, grinding his teeth, using a stout stick to move the logs around in the campfire. You won't get anywhere with Ike, Geralt. He knows nothing about business. As we rode up to your camp, Trejactor said, we met him. He was kneeling on the rocks in full armour, staring at the sky. He's always doing that, Beanpole said. He's meditating or saying his prayers. He says he must, because he has orders from the gods to protect people from evil. Back home in Crinfrid, Boholt muttered, we keep people like that on a chain in the cowshed and give them a piece of coal so they can draw outlandish pictures on the walls. But that's enough gossip about my neighbours. We are talking business. A petite young woman with black hair, held tightly by a gold hairnet, wrapped in a woolen cloak, noiselessly entered the circle of light. What reeks so much round here? Yapin Zirin asked, pretending not to see her. Not brimstone, is it? No. Boholt, glancing to the side and sniffing pointedly. It's musk or some other scent. No, it has to be. The dwarf grimaced. Oh, why, it's the noble Madame Yennefer. Welcome, welcome. The sorceress's eyes slowly swept over the company, her shining eyes coming to rest for a while on the witcher. Geralt smiled faintly. May I join you? But of course, good lady, Boholt said and hiccuped. Uh, sit down here on the saddle. Move your ass, Kenneth, and give the noble sorceress the saddle. From what I hear, you're talking business, gentlemen. Yennefer sat down, stretching out her shapely black-stockinged legs in front of her. Without me? We didn't dare, Yapin Zirid said. Trouble such an important personage. It would be better, Yapin. Yennefer narrowed her eyes, turning her head towards the dwarf. If you kept quiet. From the very first day, you've been treating me as if I were nothing but air. So please continue. Don't let me bother you because it doesn't bother me, either. Really, my lady? Yarpen's smile revealed uneven teeth. May I be infested by ticks if I haven't been treating you better than the air? I've been known, for example, to spoil the air, which there's no way I dare to do in your presence. The bearded boys roared with thunderous laughter, but fell silent immediately at the sight of the blue glow which suddenly enveloped the sorceress. One more. Word, and you'll end as spoiled air, Yapen, Yennefer said, in a voice with a metallic edge, and a black stain on the grass. Indeed. Boholt cleared his throat, relieving the silence that had fallen. Uh, quiet, Zigrin. Uh, let's hear what Madame Yennefer has to say to us. She just complained that we're talking about business without her, from which I conclude she has some kind of offer for us. Let's hear, my lords, what kind of offer it is, as long as she doesn't suggest killing the dragon by herself using spells. And what if I do? Yennefer raised her head. Don't think it's possible, Boholt. It might be possible, but it's not profitable, because you'd be certain to demand half the dragon's hoard. At least half, the sorceress said coldly. Well, you'll see for yourself there's no profit in it for us. We, my lady, are poor warriors, and if the loot passes us by, hunger will come beckoning. We live on sorrel and pigweed. Only once in a blue moon do we manage to catch a marmot. Yarpen Zigrin interrupted in a sombre voice. We drink spring water. Boholt took a swig from the demijohn and shuddered slightly. There's no choice for us, Madame Yennefer. It's either loot or freeze to death in the winter, huddled against a fence, 
for inns cost money. Beer does too, Gar added. And dirty strumpets, Beanpole said, daydreaming. Which is why, Boholt said, looking up at the sky, we will kill the dragon by ourselves, without spells and without your help. Are you certain about that? Just remember, there are limits to what is possible, Boholt. Perhaps there are, but I've never come across them. No, my lady, I repeat, we'll kill the dragon ourselves, without any spells. Particularly, Yarpin Zegrin added, since spells surely have their own limits, which, unlike our own, we don't know. Did you come up with that yourself? Yennefer asked slowly. Or did someone put you up to it? Does the presence of the Witcher in this select company give you the right to such brazenness? No, Boholt replied, looking at Geralt, who seemed to be dozing, stretched out lazily on a blanket with his saddle beneath his head. The Witcher has nothing to do with it. Listen, noble Yennefer, we put forward a proposition to the king, but he hasn't honoured us with an answer. We are patient. We'll wait till the morning. Should the king agree to a settlement, we ride on together. If not, we go back. Us too, the dwarf snarled. There won't be any bargaining, Boholt continued. Take it or leave it. Repeat our words to Nidamir, Madame Yennefer, and I'll tell you a deal's also good for you and for Dorigore, if you come to an agreement with him. We don't need the dragon's carcass, mark you. We'll take but the tail, and the rest is yours. You can have whatever you want. We won't stint you with the teeth or the brain. We'll keep nothing that you need for sorcery. Of course, Yapin Zigrin added, chuckling. The carrion will be for you sorcerers. No one will take it from you, unless some other vultures do. Yennefer stood up, throwing her cloak over her shoulder. Nidamir won't wait until morning, she said sharply. He has agreed to your conditions already, against mine and Dorigare's advice, mark you. Nidamir, Boholt slowly drawled, is displaying astonishing wisdom for one so young. Uh, to me, Madam Yennefer, wisdom includes the ability to turn a deaf ear to foolish or insincere advice. Yapin Zigrin snorted into his beard. You'll be singing a different tune. The sorceress put her hands on her hips. When the dragon lacerates and perforates you, and shatters your shin bones, you'll be licking my shoes and begging for help, as usual. How well, oh, how very well, do I know your sort. I know you so well it makes me sick. She turned away and disappeared into the gloom without saying goodbye. In my day, Yarpin Zegrin said, sorceresses stayed in their towers, read learned books and stirred cauldrons. They didn't get under warriors' feet, didn't interfere in our business, or didn't wiggle their bottoms in front of a fellow. Frankly speaking, she can wiggle all she likes, Dandelion said, tuning his lute. Right, Geralt? Geralt? Hey, where's the witcher? What do we care? Boholt muttered throwing another log on the fire. He went somewhere. Perhaps he had to relieve himself, my lord. It's his business. That's right, the bard agreed, and strummed the strings. Shall I sing you something? Sing, damn it, Yapin Zigrid said and spat. But don't be thinking, Dandelion, that I'll give you as much as a shilling for your bleating. It's not the royal court, son. I can see that, the troubadour nodded. Chapter 5 Yennefer She turned around as though surprised, though the witcher was in no doubt she had heard his steps well before. She placed a small wooden pail on the floor, straightened up and brushed aside some hair, which had freed itself from her golden hairnet and fell in curls onto her shoulders. Geralt? She was wearing just two colours, as usual, black and white. Black hair, long black eyelashes, forcing one to guess the colour of the eyes concealed beneath them. A black skirt and a short black tunic with a white fur collar. A white blouse of the sheerest linen. On her neck, a black velvet ribbon adorned with an obsidian star bestrewn with tiny diamonds. You haven't changed at all. Neither have you, she sneered. 
and in both cases it is equally normal, or, if you prefer, equally abnormal. In any case, the mention of it, though it may not be a bad way to begin the conversation, is meaningless. Am I right? You are, he nodded, looking to one side, towards Nidomir's tent and the fires of the royal bowmen, obscured by the dark shapes of wagons. From the more distant campfire floated Dandelion's sonorous voice singing The Stars Above the Path, one of his most popular romantic ballads. Well, now that we have the preliminaries out of the way, the sorceress said, I wonder what's coming next. You see, Yennefer, I see, she interrupted sharply, but I don't understand. Why did you come here, Geralt? Surely not because of the dragon. I presume nothing has changed in that regard. No, nothing's changed. Why then, I pray, have you joined the party? If I said that it was because of you, would you believe me? She looked at him in silence, and there was something in her flashing eyes which Geralt did not like. I believe you. Why not? She finally said. Men like to meet their former lovers, like to relive memories. They like to imagine that erstwhile erotic ecstasies give them some kind of perpetual ownership of their partner. It enhances their self-importance. You are no exception, in spite of everything. Nevertheless, he smiled. You're right, Yennefer. The sight of you makes me feel wonderful. In other words, I'm glad to see you. And is that all? Well, let's say I'm also glad. Having said that, I wish you good night. I am retiring for the night, as you can see. Before that, I intend to bathe, and I usually get undressed to perform that activity. Withdraw, then, in order graciously to assure me a minimum of discretion. Yen. He held his hands out to her. Don't call me that! She hissed furiously, springing back, blue and red sparks streaming from her extended fingers. And if you touch me, I'll scorch your eyes out, you bastard! The witcher moved back. The sorceress, somewhat calmer, brushed her hair aside once again and stood before him with her fists resting on her hips. What did you think, Geralt? That we'd have a nice, cheerful gossip? That we'd reminisce about the old days? That perhaps at the end of our chat we'd get onto a wagon and make love on the sheepskins just like that for old time's sake, did you? Geralt? not certain if the sorceress was magically reading his mind or had only guessed right, kept silent, smiling wryly. Those four years left their mark, Geralt. I'm over it now, which is the only reason why I didn't spit in your eyes during today's encounter. But don't let my civility deceive you. Yennefer, be quiet! I gave you more than I've ever given any other man, you scoundrel! I don't know myself why I gave it to you. And you... Oh, no, my dear. I'm not a slut or an elf woman met by chance in the forest who can be discarded in the morning, walked out on without being woken with a posy of violets left on the table, who can be made a mockery of. Beware. Utter a single word and you will regret it. Geralt did not utter a single word correctly sensing the anger seething in Yennefer. The sorceress once again brushed aside some unruly locks and looked him in the eyes from close up. We've met. That's too bad, she said softly. But we shall not make a spectacle of ourselves for everybody. We shall say face. We'll pretend to be good friends. But don't be mistaken, Geralt. There is nothing between us now. Nothing. Understood. And be glad of it, because it means I have now abandoned the plans which, until recently, I still harboured regarding you. But that in no way means I've forgiven you. I shall never forgive you, Witcher. Never. She turned around suddenly, seized the pail, spraying water around, and disappeared behind a wagon. Geralt chased away a mosquito whining above his ear, and slowly walked back towards the campfire where Dandelion's performance was being rewarded with half-hearted applause. He looked up at the dark blue sky above the black, serrated sawblade of the mountain peaks. He felt like bursting out laughing. He did not know why. 
Chapter 6 Careful up there, take heed, Boholt called, turning around on the coachman's seat to look back towards the column. Closer to the rocks, take heed. The wagons trundled along, bouncing on stones. The wagoners swore, lashing the horses with their reins and leaning out. They glanced anxiously to see if the wheels were sufficiently far from the edge of the ravine, along which ran a narrow, uneven road. Below, at the bottom of the chasm, the waters of the river Brea foamed white among the boulders. Geralt reined back his horse, pressing himself against the rock wall, which was covered with sparse brown moss and white lichen. He let the reaver's wagon overtake him. Beanpole galloped up from the head of the column where he'd been leading the cavalcade with the Bearfield scouts. Right, he shouted, with a will. It widens out up ahead. King Nidamir and Gillenstian, both on horseback, accompanied by several mounted bowmen, came alongside Geralt. Behind them rattled the wagons of the royal caravan. Even further back trundled the dwarves' wagon, driven by Yarp and Zigrin, who was yelling relentlessly. Nidamir, a very thin, freckled youngster in a white sheepskin jacket, passed the witcher, casting him a haughty, though distinctly bored look. Gillenstiern straightened up and reined in his horse. Over here, witcher, sir, he said overbearingly. Yes? Geralt jabbed his mare with his heels and rode slowly over to the Chancellor behind the caravan. He was astonished that, in spite of having such an impressive paunch, Gillenstiern preferred horseback to a comfortable ride in a wagon. Yesterday, Gillenstiern said, gently tugging his gold-studded reins and throwing a turquoise cape off his shoulder. Yesterday, you said the dragon does not interest you. What does interest you then, witcher sir? Why do you ride with us? It's a free country, Chancellor. For the moment... But in this cortege, my dear Geralt, everyone should know his place, and the role he is to fulfil, according to the will of King Nidamir. Do you comprehend that? What are you driving at, my dear Gillenstiern? I shall tell you. I've heard that it has recently become tiresome to negotiate with you witches. The thing is that whenever a witcher is shown a monster to be killed, the witcher, rather than take his sword and slaughter it, begins to ponder whether it is right whether it is transgressing the limits of what is possible, whether it is not contrary to the code, and whether the monster really is a monster, as though it wasn't clear at first glance. It seems to me that you are simply doing too well. In my day, witches didn't have two pennies to rub together, just two stinking boots. They didn't question, they slaughtered what they were ordered to, whether it was a werewolf, a dragon, or a tax collector. All that counted was a clean cut. So, get out. Do you have a job for me, Gillenstiern? The witch asked coldly. If so, tell me what. I'll think it over. But if you don't, there's no sense wasting our breath, is there? Job? The Chancellor sighed. No, I don't. This all concerns a dragon, and that clearly transgresses your limits, witcher. So I prefer the Reavers. I merely wanted to alert you, warn you. King Nidamir and I may tolerate the whims of witches and their classification of monsters into good and bad, but we do not wish to hear about them, much less see them affected in our presence. Don't meddle in royal matters, witcher, and don't consort with Dorigore. I'm not accustomed to consulting with sorcerers. Why such an inference? Dorigore, Gillenstiern said, surpasses even witches with his whims. He does not stop at categorizing monsters into good and bad. He considers them all good. That's overstating the case somewhat. Clearly, but he defends his views with astonishing obstinacy. I truly would not be surprised if something befell him. And the fact he joined us keeping such curious company. I am not Dorigore's companion, and neither is he mine. Don't interrupt. The company is strange. A witcher crawling with scruples like a fox's pelt with fleas. A sorcerer spouting druidic humbug about equilibrium in nature. The silent knight Borg three jackdaws and his escort from Zaricania, where, as is generally known, sacrifices are made before the image of a dragon. 
and suddenly they all join in the hunt. Strange, isn't it? If you insist, then yes, it is. No, then, the Chancellor said, that the most mysterious problems find, as experience proves, the simplest solutions. Don't compel me, Witcher, to use them. I don't understand. Oh, but you do. Thank you for the conversation, Geralt. Geralt stopped. Gillenstien urged his horse on and joined the king, catching up with the caravan. Ike of the Nesla rode alongside wearing a quilted caftan of light-coloured leather, marked with the impressions of a breastplate, pulling a pack horse laden with a suit of armour, a uniformly silver shield and a powerful lance. Geralt greeted him by raising his hand, but the knight-errant turned his head to the side, tightening his thin lips, and spurred his horse on. He isn't keen on you, Dorigare said, riding over. Eh, Geralt? Clearly. Competition, isn't it? The two of you have similar occupations, except that Ike is an idealist and you are a professional. A minor difference, particularly for the ones you kill. Don't compare me to Ike, Dorigare. The devil knows who you're wrong with that comparison, him or me, but don't compare us. As you wish. To me, frankly speaking, you are equally loathsome. Thank you. Don't mention it. The sorcerer patted the neck of his horse, which had been scared by all the yelling from Yarpen and his dwarves. To me, Witcher, calling killing a vocation is loathsome, low and nonsensical. Our world is in equilibrium. The annihilation, the killing of any creatures that inhabit this world upsets that equilibrium. And a lack of equilibrium brings closer extinction. Extinction and the end of the world as we know it. A druidic theory, Geralt pronounced. I know it. An old hierophant expounded it to me once back in Rivia. Two days after our conversation, he was torn apart by were-rats. It was impossible to prove any upset in equilibrium. The world, I repeat, Dorigare glanced at him indifferently, is in equilibrium. Natural equilibrium. Every species has its own natural enemies. Everyone is the natural enemy of other species. That also includes humans. The extermination of the natural enemies of humans, which you dedicate yourself to, and which one can begin to observe, threatens the degeneration of the race. Do you know what, sorcerer? Geralt said, annoyed. One day, take yourself to a mother whose child has been devoured by a basilisk, and tell her she ought to be glad, because thanks to that, the human race has escaped degeneration. See what she says to you. A good argument, witch, Yennefer said, riding up to them on her large black horse. And you, Dorigare, be careful what you say. I am not accustomed to concealing my views. Yennefer rode between them. The witcher noticed that the golden hairnet had been replaced by a rolled-up white kerchief. Start concealing them as quickly as possible, Dorigare, she said, especially before Nidamir and the Reavers, who already suspect you plan to interfere in the killing of the dragon. As long as you only talk, they treat you like a harmless maniac. If, however... You try to start anything, they'll break your neck before you manage to let out a sigh. The sorcerer smiled contemptuously and condescendingly. And besides, Yennefer continued, by expressing those views, you damage the solemnity of our profession and vocation. How so? You can apply your theory to all sorts of creatures and vermin, Dorigare, but not to dragons, for dragons are the natural greatest enemies of man. And I do not refer to the degeneration of the human race, but to its survival. In order to survive, one has to crush one's enemies. Enemies which might prevent that survival. Dragons aren't man's enemies, Geralt broke in. The sorceress looked at him and smiled, but only with her lips. In that matter, she said, leave the judging to us humans. Your role, Witcher, is not to judge. It's to get a job done. Like a programmed servile golem. That was your comparison, not mine, Yennefer replied coldly. But, well, it's apt. Yennefer, Dorigare said, for a woman of your education and age, you are coming out with some astonishing tripe. Why is it that dragons have been promoted in your eyes to become the foremost enemies of man? 
Why not other, a hundredfold more dangerous creatures, those that have a hundredfold more victims on their consciences than dragons? Why not hiricas, forktails, manticores, amphisbanas, or griffins? Why not wolves? I'll tell you why not. The advantage of men over other races and species, the fight for their due place in nature, for living space, can only be won when nomadism, wandering from place to place in search of sustenance in accordance with nature's calendar, is finally eliminated. Otherwise, the proper rhythm of reproduction will not be achieved, since human children are dependent for too long. Only a woman, safe and secure behind town walls or in a stronghold, can bear children according to the proper rhythm, which means once a year. Fecundity, Dorigare, is growth, is the condition for survival and domination. And now we come to dragons. Only a dragon and no other monster can threaten a town or stronghold. Were dragons not to be wiped out, people would, for their own safety, disperse instead of cleaving together, because dragon's fire in a densely populated settlement is a nightmare, means hundreds of victims and terrible destruction. That is why dragons must be utterly wiped out, Dorigare. Dorigare looked at her with a strange smile on his face. Do you know what, Yennefer? I wouldn't like to see the day your idea of the dominance of man comes about when people like you will occupy their due place in nature. Fortunately, it will never come to that. You would rather poison or slaughter each other, expire from typhoid fever and typhus, because it is filth and lice and not dragons which threaten your splendid cities, where women are delivered of children once a year, but where only one newborn baby in ten lives longer than ten days. Yes, Yennefer. Fecundity, fecundity, and once again, fecundity. So, take up bearing children, my dear. It's the most natural pursuit for you. It will occupy the time you are currently fruitlessly wasting on dreaming up nonsense. Farewell. Urging on his horse, the sorcerer galloped off towards the head of the column. Geralt, having glanced at Yennefer's pale, furiously twisted face, began to feel sorry for him in advance. He knew what this was about. Yennefer, like most sorceresses, was barren. But unlike most sorceresses, she bemoaned the fact and reacted with genuine rage at the mention of it. Dorigare certainly knew that, but he probably did not know how vengeful she was. He's in trouble, she hissed. Oh, yes, beware, Geralt. Don't think that when the time comes and you don't show good sense, I'll protect you. Never fear, he smiled. We, and I mean witches and servile golems, always act sensibly, since the limits within which we operate are clearly and explicitly demarcated. Well, I never, Yennefer said, looking at him still pale. You're taking umbrage like a tart whose lack of chastity has been pointed out to her. You're a witcher. You can't change that. Your vocation, that's enough about vocations, Yen, because it's beginning to make me queasy. I told you not to call me that. And I'm not especially bothered about your queasiness, nor any other reactions in your limited witcher's range of reactions. Nevertheless, you'll see some of them if you don't stop plying me with tales about lofty missions and the fight between good and evil and about dragons, the dreadful enemies of the human tribe. I know better. Oh, yes. The sorceress narrowed her eyes. And what do you know, Witcher? Only, Geralt said, ignoring the sudden warning vibration of the medallion around his neck, that if dragons didn't have treasure hoards, not a soul would be interested in them, and certainly not sorcerers. Isn't it interesting that whenever a dragon is being hunted, some sorcerer closely linked to the goldsmith's guild is always hanging around, just like you. And later, although a deal of gemstones ought to end up on the market, it never happens, and their price doesn't go down. So don't talk to me about vocation and the fight for the survival of the race. I know you too well. I've known you too long. Too long, she repeated, sneering malevolently. Unfortunately. But don't think you know me well, you whore's son. Damn it! How stupid I've been! Oh, 
Go to hell! I can't stand the sight of you! She screamed, yanked her horse's reins, and galloped fiercely ahead. The witcher reined back his mount and let through the wagon of dwarves, yelling, cursing, and whistling through bone pipes. Among them, sprawled on some sacks of oats, lay Dandelion, plucking his lute. Hey! roared Yarp and Zigrin, who was sitting on the box, pointing at Yennefer. There's something black on the trail. I wonder what it is. It looks like a nag. Without doubt, Dandelion shouted, shoving his plum bonnet back. It's a nag, riding a gelding. Astounding! The beards of Yarpen's boys shook in general laughter. Yennefer pretended not to hear. Geralt reined back his horse again and let Nidomir's mounted bowmen through. Borch was riding slowly some distance beyond them, and the Zeracanians brought up the rear just behind him. Geralt waited for them to catch up and led his mare alongside Borch's horse. They rode on in silence. Witcher, three jackdaws suddenly said, I want to ask you a question. Ask it. Why don't you turn back? The witcher looked at him in silence for a moment. Do you really want to know? Yes, I do, three jackdaws said, turning his face towards Geralt. I'm riding with him because I'm a servile golem, because I'm a whisk of oakum blown by the wind along the highway. Tell me, where should I go, and for what? At least here some people have gathered with whom I have something to talk about. People who don't break off their conversations when I approach. People who, though they may not like me, say it to my face, and don't throw stones from behind a fence. I'm riding with them for the same reason I rode with you to the log driver's inn. Because it's all the same to me. I don't have a goal to head towards. I don't have a destination at the end of the road. Three jackdaws cleared his throat. There's a destination at the end of every road. Everybody has one, even you, although you like to think you're somehow different. Now I'll ask you a question. Ask it. Do you have a destination at the end of the road? I do. Lucky for you. It is not a matter of luck, Geralt. It is a matter of what you believe in and what you serve. No one ought to know that better than... than a witcher. I keep hearing about goals today, Geralt sighed. Nidomir's aim is to seize Maliori. Ike of Denesli's calling is to protect people from dragons. Dorigare feels obligated to something quite the opposite. Yennefer, by virtue of certain changes which her body was subjected to, cannot fulfil her wishes and is terribly undecided. Damn it! Only the reavers and the dwarves don't feel a calling and simply want to line their pockets. Perhaps that's why I'm so drawn to them. You aren't drawn to them, Geralt of Livia. I'm neither blind nor deaf. It wasn't at the sound of their name you pulled out that pouch. But I surmise there's no need to surmise, the witcher said without anger. I apologise. There's no need to apologise. They reined back their horses just in time, in order not to ride into the column of bowmen from Cairngorm, which had suddenly been called to a halt. What has happened? Geralt stood up in his stirrups. Why have we stopped? I don't know. Borg turned his head away. Vea, her face strangely contorted, uttered a few quick words. I'll ride up to the front, the witcher said, to see what's going on. Stay here. Why? Three jackdaws were silent for a moment eyes fixed on the ground. Why? Geralt repeated. Go, Burr said. Perhaps it'll be better that way. What'll be better? Go. The bridge connecting the two edges of the chasm looked sound. It was built from thick pine timbers and supported on a quadrangular pier against which the current crashed and roared in long strands of foam. Hey, Beanpole, yelled Boholt, who was driving the wagon. Why have you stopped? I don't know if the bridge will hold. Why are we taking this road? Gillenstern asked, riding over. It's not to my liking to take the wagons across the bridge. Nay, a cobbler. Why are you leading us this way and not by the trail? The trail continues on towards the west, doesn't it? 
the heroic poisoner of Bearfield approached, removing his sheepskin cap. He looked ridiculous, dressed up in an old-fashioned half-armour, probably hammered out during the reign of King Sambuk, pulled down tightly over a shepherd's smock. "'The road's shorter this way, Your Majesty,' he said, not to the Chancellor, but directly to Nidamere, whose face still expressed thoroughly excruciated boredom. "'How is that?' Gillenstein asked, frowning. Nidamere did not even grace the cobbler with a more attentive glance. "'Dams,' Sheepbagger said, indicating the three notched peaks towering over the surrounding area, "'is Kiava, Great Kestrel, and Harbinger's Fang. The trail leads down towards the ruins of the old stronghold and skirts around Kiava from the north, beyond the river's source. But we can shorten the way by taking the bridge. We'll pass through the gorge and onto the plain between the mountains.' And, if we don't find no sign of the dragon there, we'll continue on eastwards. We'll search the ravines. And even further eastward, there are flat pastures, where there's a straight road to Cairngorm, towards your land, sire. And where, sheep beggar, did you acquire such knowledge about these mountains? Boholt asked. At your cobbler's last? No, sir. I herded sheep here as a young'un. And that bridge won't give way? Boholt stood up on the box and looked downwards at the foaming river. That must be a drop of forty fathoms. A little old, sir. What's a bridge doing in this wilderness, anyhow? That there bridge, Sheepbagger said, was built by trolls in the olden days, and whoever came this way had to pay them a pretty penny. But since folks seldom came this way, the trolls were reduced to beggary. But the bridge remains. I repeat, Gillenstern said irately, we have wagons with tackle and provender, and we may become bogged down in the wilderness. Is it not better to take the trail? We could take the trail, the cobbler shrugged, but it's longer that way, and the king said he'd give his ear teeth to get that dragon soon. Eye teeth, the chancellor corrected him. Have it your way, eye teeth, Sheepbagger agreed, but it's still quicker by the bridge. Right, let's go, Sheepbagger, Boholt decided. Forge ahead, you and your men. We have a custom of letting the most valiant through first. No more than one wagon at a time, Gillenstern warned. Right. Boholt lashed his horses, and the wagon rumbled onto the bridge's timbers. Follow us, Beanpole. Make sure the wheels are rolling smoothly. Geralt reined back his horse, his way barred by Nidamir's bowmen in their purple and gold tunics, crowded on the stone bridgehead. The witch's mare snorted. The earth shuddered. The mountains trembled. The jagged edge of the rock wall beside them became blurred against the sky, and the wall itself suddenly spoke with a dull but audible rumbling. Look out! Boholt yelled, now on the other side of the bridge. Look out there! The first small stones pattered and rattled down the spasmodically shuddering rock wall. Geralt watched as part of the road they had followed, very rapidly widening into a yawning black crack, broke off and plunged into the chasm with a thunderous clatter. To horse, Gillenstern yelled. Your Majesty, to the other side! Nidamir, head buried in his horse's mane, charged onto the bridge, and Gillenstern and several bowmen leapt after him. Behind them, the royal wagon with its flapping griffin banner rumbled onto the creaking timbers. It's a landslide! Get out of the way! Yup and Zigrin bellowed from behind, lashing his horse's rumps, overtaking Nidamir's second wagon and jostling the bowmen. Out of the way! Witcher, out of the way! Ike of Denesla, stiff and erect, galloped beside the dwarves' wagon. Were it not for his deathly pale face and mouth contorted in a quivering grimace, one might have thought the knight-errant had not noticed the stones and boulders falling onto the trail. Further back, someone in the group of bowmen screamed wildly and horses whinnied. Geralt tugged at the reins and spurred his horse, as right in front of him the earth boiled from the boulders cascading down. The dwarves' wagon rattled over the stones. Just before the bridge, it jumped up and landed with a crack on its side onto a broken axle. A wheel bounced off the railing and plunged downwards into the spume. The witch's mare, lacerated by sharp shards of stone, reared up. Geralt tried to dismount, but caught his boot buckle in the stirrup and fell to the side onto the trail. His mare neighed and dashed ahead straight towards the bridge, dancing over the chasm. The dwarves ran across the bridge, yelling and cursing. Hurry, Geralt! Dandelion yelled, running behind him and looking back. 
Jump on, Witcher, Dorigare called, thrashing about in the saddle, struggling to control his terrified horse. Further back, behind them, the entire road was engulfed in a cloud of dust, stirred up by falling rocks, shattering Nidomir's wagons. The Witcher seized the straps of the sorcerer's saddlebags. He heard a cry. Yennefer had fallen with her horse, rolled to the side, away from the wildly kicking hooves, and flattened herself to the ground, shielding her head with her arms. The Witcher let go of the saddle, ran towards her, diving into the deluge of stones and leaping across the rift, opening under his feet. Yennefer, yanked by the arm, got up onto her knees. Her eyes were wide open, and the trickle of blood running down from her cut brow had already reached her ear. Stand up, Yen! Geralt, look out! An enormous, flat block of stone, scraping against the side of the rock wall with a grinding, clattering sound, slid down and plummeted towards them. Geralt dropped, shielding the sorceress with his body. At the very same moment, the block exploded, bursting into a billion fragments, which rained down on them, stinging like wasps. Quick! Dorigare cried. Brandishing his wand atop the skittering horse, he blasted more boulders, which were tumbling down from the cliff into dust. On to the bridge, Witcher! Yennefer waved a hand, bending her fingers and shrieking incomprehensibly. As the stones came into contact with the bluish hemisphere, which had suddenly materialised above their heads, they vaporised like drops of water falling on red-hot metal. On to the bridge, Geralt! the sorceress yelled. Stay close to me! They ran, following Dorigare and several fleeing bowmen. The bridge rocked and creaked, the timbers bending in all directions as it flung them from railing to railing. Quick! The bridge suddenly slumped with a piercing, penetrating crack, and the half they had just crossed broke off, tumbling with a clatter into the gulf, taking the dwarves' wagon with it, which shattered against the rocky teeth to the sound of the horses' frantic whinnying. The part they were now standing on was still intact, but Geralt suddenly realised they were now running upwards across a rapidly tilting slope. Yennefer panted a curse. Get down, Yen. Hang on. The rest of the bridge grated, cracked and sagged into a ramp. They fell with it, digging their fingers into the cracks between the timbers. Yennefer could not hold on. She squealed like a little girl and dropped. Geralt, hanging on with one hand, drew a dagger, plunged the blade between the timbers and seized the haft in both hands. His elbow joints creaked as Yennefer tugged him down, suspended by the belt and scabbard slung across his back. The bridge made a cracking noise again and tilted even more, almost vertically. Yen, the witcher grunted, do something. Cast a bloody spell. How can I? He heard a furious muffled snarl. I'm hanging on. Free one of your hands. I can't. Hey, Dandelion yelled from above. Can you hold on? Hey! Geralt did not deign to reply. Throw down a rope! Dandelion bellowed. Quickly, damn it! The Reavers, the Dwarves and Gillenstiern appeared beside the troubadour. Geralt heard Boholt's quiet words. Wait, Busker. She'll soon fall. Then we'll pull the Witcher up. Yennefer hissed like a viper, writhing and suspended from Geralt's back. His belt dug painfully into his chest. Yen, can you find a hold? Using your legs, can you do anything with your legs? Yes, she groaned. Swing them around. Geralt looked down at the river, seething and swirling among the sharp rocks, against which some bridge timbers, a horse and a body in the bright colours of Cairngorm, were bumping. Beyond the rocks, in the emerald, transparent maelstrom, he saw the tapered bodies of large trout, languidly moving in the current. Can you hold on, Yen? Just about. Yes. Heave yourself up. You have to get a foothold. I can't. Throw down a rope, Dandelion yelled. Have you all gone mad? They'll both fall. Perhaps that's not so bad, Gillenstiern wondered out of sight. The bridge creaked and sagged even more. Geralt's fingers, gripping the hilt of his dagger, began to go numb. Yen, shut up! And stop wriggling about. Yen, don't call me that. Can you hold on? No, she said coldly. She was no longer struggling, but simply hanging from his back, a lifeless, inert weight. Yen, shut up. Yen, forgive me. No, never. Something crept downwards over the timbers. Swiftly, 
like a snake, a rope emanating with a cold glow, twisting and curling as though alive, searched for and found Geralt's neck with its moving tip, slid under his armpits and raveled itself into a loose knot. The sorceress beneath him moaned, sucking in air. He was certain she would start sobbing. He was mistaken. Careful, Dandelion shouted from above. We're pulling you up. Gar? Kennet, pull them up. Heave. A tug, the painful constricting tension of the taut rope. Yennefer sighed heavily. They quickly travelled upwards, bellies scraping against the coarse timbers. At the top, Yennefer was the first to stand up. Chapter 7 we saved but one wagon from the entire caravan, your majesty, Gillenstiern said, not counting the weaver's wagon. Seven bowmen remain from the troop. There's no longer a road on the far side of the chasm, just scree and a smooth wall as far as the breach permits one to look. We know not if anyone survived of those who remained when the bridge collapsed. Nidomir did not answer. Ike Odenesler, standing erect, stood before the king, staring at him with shining, feverish eyes. The ire of the gods is hounding us, he said, raising his arms. We have sinned, King Nidomir. It was a sacred expedition, an expedition against evil. For the dragon is evil, yes, each dragon is evil incarnate. I do not pass by evil indifferently. I crush it beneath my foot, annihilate it, just as the gods and the holy book demand. What is he driveling on about? Behold asked, frowning. I don't know, Geralt said, adjusting his mare's harness. I didn't understand a single word. Be quiet, Dandelion said. I'm trying to remember it. Perhaps I'll be able to use it if I can get it to rhyme. The holy book says, Ike said, now yelling loudly, that the serpent, the foul dragon with seven heads and ten horns, will come forth from the abyss, and on his back will sit a woman in purple and scarlet, and a golden goblet will be in her hand, and on her forehead will be written the sign of all and ultimate whoredom. I know her, Dandelion said, delighted. It's Cilia, the wife of the alderman of Somholder. Quieten down, poet, sir, Gillenstead said, and you, O oh knight from Denesley, speak more plainly, if you would. One should act against evil, O oh king, Ike called, and with a pure heart and conscience, with head raised. But who do we see here? Dwarves who are pagans, are born in the darkness and bow down before dark forces. Blasphemous sorcerers, usurping divine laws, powers and privileges. A witcher, who is an odious aberration, an accursed unnatural creature. Are you surprised that a punishment has befallen us, King Nidomir? We have reached the limits of possibility. Divine grace is being sorely tested. I call you, King, to purge the filth from our ranks before... Not a word about me, Dandelion interjected woefully. Not a mention of poets, and I try so hard. Geralt smiled at Yarpin Zigrin, who, with slow movements, was stroking the blade of his battle-axe, which was stuck into his belt. The dwarf, amused, grinned. Yennefer turned away ostentatiously, pretending that her skirt, torn up to her hip, distressed her more than Ike's words. I think you are exaggerating a little, Sir Ike, Dorigaray said sharply, although no doubt for noble reasons. I regard the making known of your views about sorcerers, dwarves and witches as quite unnecessary. Although I think we have all become accustomed to such opinions, it is neither polite nor chivalrous, Sir Ike and it is utterly incomprehensible after you and no one else ran and used a magical elven rope to save a witcher and a sorceress whose lives were in danger. I conclude from what you say that you should rather have been praying for them to fall. Damn it, Geralt whispered to Dandelion. Did he throw us that rope? Ike, not Dorigere. No, the bard muttered. Ike it was, indeed. Geralt shook his head in disbelief. Yennefer cursed under her breath and straightened up. Sir Ike, she said with a smile that anyone other than Geralt might have mistaken as pleasant and friendly. Why was that? I'm blasphemous, but you saved my life. You are a lady, Madam Yennefer, the knight bowed stiffly, and your comely and honest face permits me to believe that you will one day renounce this accursed sorcery. Boholt snorted. I thank you, Sir Knight. 
Yennefer said dryly. And the witcher Geralt also thanks you. Thank him, Geralt? I'd rather drop dead, the witcher sighed, disarmingly frank. What exactly should I thank him for? I'm an odious aberration, and my uncomely face does not augur any hope for an improvement. Sir Ike hauled me out of the chasm by accident, simply because I was tightly clutching the comely damsel. Had I been hanging there alone, Ike would not have lifted a finger. I'm not mistaken, am I, Sir Knight? You are mistaken, Geralt, sir, the knight errant replied calmly. I never refuse anybody in need of help, even a witcher. Thank him, Geralt, and apologise, the sorceress said sharply. Otherwise, you will be confirming that, at least with regard to you, Ike was quite right. You are unable to coexist with people because you are different. Your participation in this expedition is a mistake. A nonsensical purpose brought you here. Thus it would be sensible to leave the party. I think you understand that now. And if not, it's time you did. What purpose are you talking about, madam? Gillenstiern cut in. The sorceress looked at him but did not answer. Dandelion and Yop and Zegrin smiled meaningfully at each other, but so that the sorceress would not notice. The witcher looked into Yennefer's eyes. They were cold. I apologise and thank you, O Knight of Denesle. He bowed. I thank everybody here present for the swift rescue offered at once. I heard, as I hung there, how you were all raring to help. I ask everybody here present for forgiveness, with the exception of the noble Yennefer, whom I thank but ask for nothing. Farewell. The dregs leave the company of their own free will, because these dregs have had enough of you. Goodbye, Dandelion. Hey, Geralt, the hold called. Don't pout like a maiden. Don't make a mountain out of a molehill. To hell with. Look out, everyone! Sheepbagger and several members of the Bearfield Constabulary, who had been sent ahead to reconnoitre, were running back from the narrow opening to the gorge. What is he? Why is he bellowing like that? Gar lifted his head up. Good people, your excellencies, the cobbler panted. Get it out, man, Gillenstiern said, hooking his thumbs into his golden belt. A, a dragon! There's a dragon there! Where? Beyond the gorge, on level ground! So you, he, to horse, Gillenstiern ordered. Gar, Bohol yelled, onto the wagon. Beanpole, get mounted and follow me. You lively lads, Yarp and Zegrin roared. Look lively by thunder. Hey, wait for me. Dandelion slung his loot over his shoulder. Geralt, take me with you. Jump on. The gorge ended in a mound of light-coloured rocks, which gradually thinned out, creating an irregular ring. Beyond them, the ground descended gently into a grassy, undulating mountain pasture, enclosed on all sides by limestone walls, gaping with thousands of openings. Three narrow canyons, the mouths of dried-up streams, opened out onto the pasture. Bolt, the first to gallop to the barrier of rocks, suddenly reined in his horse and stood up in his stirrups. Oh, hell, he said. Oh, bloody hell. It, it can't be. What? Dorigare asked, riding up. Beside him, Yennefer, dismounting from the reaver's wagon, pressed her chest against the rocky block, peeped out, moved back and rubbed her eyes. What? What is it? Dandelion shouted, leaning out from behind Geralt's back. What is it, Boholt? That dragon is golden. No further than a hundred paces from the gorge's rocky entrance from which they had emerged on the road to the northward leading canyon, on a gently curving low hill, sat the creature. It was sitting, arching its long, slender neck in a smooth curve, inclining its narrow head onto its domed chest, wrapping its tail around its extended front feet. There was something inexpressibly graceful in the creature and the way it was sitting, something feline, something that contradicted its clearly reptilian origins. But it was also undeniably reptilian, for the creature was covered in distinctly outlined scales which shone with a glaring blaze of bright, yellow gold. For the creature sitting on the hillock was golden, golden from the tips of its talons dug into the ground to the end of its long tail, 
which was moving very gently among the thistles growing on the hill. Looking at them with its large golden eyes, the creature unfurled its broad golden bat-like wings and remained motionless, demanding to be admired. A golden dragon, Dorigore whispered. It's impossible, a living fable. There's no such thing as a bloody golden dragon, Gar pronounced and spat. I know what I'm talking about. Then what's sitting on that hillock? Dandelion asked pointedly. It's some kind of trickery, an illusion. It is not an illusion, Yennefer said. It's a golden dragon, Gillenstein said. An absolutely genuine golden dragon. Golden dragons only exist in fables. Stop that, all of you. Boholt suddenly broke in. There's no point getting worked up. Any blockhead can see it's a golden dragon. And what difference does it make, my lords, if it's golden, lapis lazuli, shit-coloured or checkered? It's not that big. We'll sort it out in no time. Beanpole, Gar, clear the debris off the wagon and get the gear out. What's the difference if it's golden or not? There is a difference, Boholt, Beanpole said, and a vital one. That isn't the dragon we are stalking. Not the one that was poisoned outside Bearfield, which is now sitting in its cave on a pile of ore and jewels. That one's just sitting on its arse. What bloody use is it to us? That dragon is golden, Kennet, Yarp and Zigrin snarled. Have you ever seen anything like it? Don't you understand? We'll get more for its eye than we would for a normal treasure hoard. And, without flooding the market with precious stones, Yennefer added, smiling unpleasantly. Yarpin's right. The agreement is still binding. Quite something to divide up, isn't it? Aye, Bauhaut, Gar shouted from the wagon, where he was clattering amongst the tackle. What shall we equip ourselves and the horses with? What could that golden reptile belch, eh? Fire? Acid? Steam? I haven't got an effing clue, Bauhaut said, sounding worried. Hey, sorcerers, anything in the fables about golden dragons, about how to kill them? How do you kill them? The usual way, Sheepbagger suddenly shouted. No point pondering. Give us an animal, we stuff it full of something poisonous, and feed it to the reptile in good riddance. Dorigore looked askance at the cobbler. Boholt spat, and Dandelion turned his head away with a grimace of disgust. Yarpin Zigrin smiled repulsively, hands on hips. What are you looking at? Sheepbagger asked. Let's get to work. We have to decide what to stuff the carcass with so the reptile quickly perishes. It has to be something which is extremely toxic, poisonous, or rotten. Aha! The dwarf spoke, still smiling. Well, what's poisonous, foul, and stinks? Do you know what, she bagger? Looks like it's you. What? You bloody herd, you lost bodger, out of my sight. Lord Donegare, Boholt said, walking over to the sorcerer. Make yourself useful. Call to mind some fables and tales. What do you know about golden dragons? The sorcerer smiled, straightening up self-importantly. What do I know about golden dragons, you ask? Not much, but enough. We're well, listening. Then listen, and listen attentively. Over there before us sits a golden dragon, a living legend, possibly the last and only creature of its kind to have survived your murderer's frenzy. One doesn't kill legends. I, Dorigare, will not allow you to touch that dragon. Is that understood? You can get packed, fasten your saddlebags, and go home. Geralt was convinced an uproar would ensue. He was mistaken. Noble sorcerer, sir. Gillenstein's voice interrupted the silence. Heed what and whom you speak. King Nidomir may order you, Dorigare, to fasten your saddlebags and go to hell. But not the other way round. Is that clear? No, the sorcerer said proudly. It is not, for I am Master Dorigore, and will not be ordered around by someone whose kingdom encompasses an area visible from the height of the palisade on a mangy, filthy, stinking stronghold. Do you know, Lord Gillenstiern, that were I to speak a charm and wave my hand, you would change into a cowpat, and your underage king into something ineffably worse? Is that clear? Gillenstiern did not manage to answer, for Boholt walked up to Dorigare, caught him by the shoulder, and pulled him around to face him. Gar and Beanpole, silent and grim, 
appeared from behind Boholt. Just listen, magician, sir, the enormous reaver said. Before you wave that hand, listen to me. I could spend a long time explaining what I would do with your prohibitions, your fables and your foolish chatter, but I have no wish to. Let this suffice as my answer. Boholt placed a finger against his nose and from a short distance ejected the contents onto the toes of the sorcerer's boots. Dorigere blanched but did not move. He saw, as everyone did, the morning star mace on a cubit long shaft hanging low at Gar's side. He knew, as everyone did, that the time he needed to cast a spell was incomparably longer than the time Gar needed to smash his head to pieces. Very well, Boholt said. And now move nicely out of the way, your lordship, and should the desire to open your gob occur to you, quickly shove a bunch of grass into it, because if I hear you whining again, I'll give you something to remember me by. Boholt turned away and rubbed his hands. Right, Gar, Beanpole, let's get to work, because that reptile won't hang around forever. Doesn't seem to be planning on going anywhere, Dandelion said, looking at the foreground. Look at it. The golden dragon on the hill yawned, lifted its head, waved its wings, and lashed the ground with its tail. King Nidamir and you knights, it yelled with a roar like a brass trumpet. I am the dragon Vilentretenmerth. As I see the landslide which I though I say it as shouldn't, sent down on your heads, did not completely stop you. You have come this far. As you know, there are only three ways out of this valley, east towards Bearfield and west towards Cairngorm, and you may use those roads. You will not take the northern gorge, gentlemen, because I... Villain Treten Merth forbid you. However, if anyone does not wish to respect my injunction, I challenge him to fight an honourable knightly duel. With conventional weapons, without spells, without breathing fire. A fight to the utter capitulation of one of the sides. I await an answer through your herald, as custom dictates. Everyone stood with their mouths open wide. It can talk, Boholt panted. Remarkable! Not only that, but very intelligently, Yapin Zegrin said. Anyone know what a confessional weapon is? An ordinary non-magical one, Yennefer said frowning. But something else puzzles me. With a forked tongue, it's not capable of articulated speech. The rogue is using telepathy. Be careful. It works in both directions. It can read your thoughts. Has it gone completely balmy or what? Kenneth Beanpole said, annoyed. An honourable duel with a stupid reptile? Not a chance. We'll attack him together. There's strength in numbers. No. They looked around. Ike of Denesla, already mounted in full armour, with his lance set by his stirrup, looked much better than he had on foot. His feverish eyes blazed from beneath his raised visor, and his face was pale. No, Kenneth, sir, the knight repeated, unless it is over my dead body. I will not permit knightly honor to be insulted in my presence. Whomsoever dares to violate the principles of this honorable duel. Ike was talking louder and louder. His exalted voice was cracking, and he was trembling with excitement. Whomsoever affronts honour also affronts me, and his or my blood will be shed on this tired earth. The beast calls for a duel? Very well. Let the herald trumpet my name. May divine judgment decide. On the dragon's side is the power of fang and talon and infernal fury, and on my side... What a moron, Yapin Zigrin muttered. On my side, righteousness, faith. The tears of virgins, whom this reptile... That's enough, Ike. You make me want to puke, Boholt yelled. Go on to the lists. Don't talk. Set about that dragon. Hey, Boholt, wait. One of the dwarves tugging on his beard suddenly said, Forgotten about the agreement? 
If I glaze Law the serpent, he'll take half. Ike won't take anything, Bold grinned. I know him. He'll be happy if Dandelion writes a song about him. Silence, Gillenstiern declared. Let it be. Against the dragon will ride out the virtuous knight errant Ike of Denesle, fighting in the colours of Cairngorm as the lance and sword of King Nidamir. That is the kingly will. There you have it, Yarpin Zigrin gnashed his teeth. The lance and sword of Nidamir. The Cairngorm kinglet has fixed us. What now? Nothing, Boholt spat. I reckon you don't want to cross Ike, Yarpin. He talks nonsense, but if he's already mounted his horse and roused himself, better get out of his way. Let him go, damn it, and sort the dragon out, and then we'll see. Who shall be the herald? Dandelion asked. Uh, the dragon wanted a herald. Uh, maybe me? No, we don't need a song, Dandelion, Boholt frowned. Yarpin Zigrin can be the herald. He's got a voice like a bull. Very well, no bother, Yarpin said. Bring me a flag-bearer with a banner, so that everything is as it should be. Just talk politely, dwarf, sir, and courteously, Gillenstiern cautioned. Don't learn me how to talk. The dwarf proudly stuck out his belly. I was sent on diplomatic missions when you lot were still knee-high to a grasshopper. The dragon continued to sit patiently on the hillock, waving its tail cheerfully. The dwarf clambered up onto the largest boulder hawked and spat. Hey, you there, he yelled, putting his hands on his hips. You fucking dragon, you. Listen to what the herald has to say. That means me. The first one to take on honourably will be the meandering knight, Ike of Denesle, and he will stick his lance in your paunch, according to the holy custom, to your confusion and to the joy of poor virgins and King Nidemir. It will be a fair fight and honourable. Breathing fire is not allowed, and you may only lambast the other confessionally until the other gives up the ghost or expires, which we sincerely wish on you. And as to dragon... The dragon yawned, flapped its wings, and then, flattening itself to the ground, quickly descended from the hillock to level ground. I have understood, noble herald, it yelled back. Then may the virtuous psyche of the Nesla enter the fray. I am ready. What a pantomime, Berholt spat, following Ike with a grim expression as he walked his horse over the barrier and boulders. A ruddy barrel of laughs. Shut your yap, Berholt, Dandelion shouted, rubbing his hands. Look, Ike is preparing to charge. It'll be a bloody beautiful ballad. Hurrah! Long live Ike! Someone shouted from Nidamir's troop of bowmen. An oi! Sheepmagger said gloomily, would still have stuffed him full of brimstone just to be certain. Ike, already in the field, saluted the dragon with his upraised lance, slammed down his visor, and struck his horse with his spurs. Well, well, the dwarf said. He may be stupid, but he rules out a charge. Look at him go. Ike leant forward, braced in the saddle, lowered his lance at full gallop. The dragon, contrary to Geralt's expectations, did not leap aside, did not move in a semicircle, but flattened to the ground, rushed straight at the attacking knight. It's him! It's him, Ike! Yarpen yelled. Ike, although in full gallop, did not strike headlong, straight ahead. At the last moment, he nimbly changed direction, shifting the lance over his horse's head. Flashing past the dragon, he thrust with all his might, standing up in the stirrups. Everybody shouted in unison. Geralt did not join in with the choir. The dragon evaded the blow with a delicate, agile, graceful turn and, coiling like a living golden ribbon, as quick as lightning, but softly, cat-like, reached a foot beneath the horse's belly. The horse squealed, jerking its crop high up, and the knight rocked in the saddle, but did not release his lance. Just as the horse was about to hit the ground snout first, the dragon swept Ike from the saddle with a fierce swipe of his clawed foot. Everybody saw his breastplate spinning upwards, and everybody heard the clanking and thudding with which the knight fell onto the ground. The dragon, sitting on its haunches, pinned the horse with a foot and lowered its toothy jaws. The horse squealed shrilly, struggled, and then was quiet. In the silence that fell, 
everybody heard the deep voice of the dragon, Vilentretenmeth. The doughty Ike of the Nestle may now be taken from the battlefield, for he is incapable of fighting any longer. Next, please. Oh, fuck, Yapin Zigrin said in the silence that followed. Chapter 8 Both legs, Yennefer said, wiping her hands on a linen cloth, and probably something with his spine. The armour on his back is dented as though he'd been hit by a pile driver. He injured his legs with his own lance. He won't be mounting a horse for some time, if he ever mounts one again. Professional hazard, Geralt muttered. The sorceress frowned. Is that all you have to say? And what else would you like to hear, Yennefer? That dragon is unbelievably fast, Geralt. Too fast for a man to fight it. I understand. No, Yen, not me. Principles? The sorceress smiled spitefully. Or ordinary commonplace fear. The only human feeling that wasn't eradicated in you. One and the other. The Witcher agreed dispassionately. What difference does it make? Precisely. Yennefer came closer. None. Principles may be broken. Fear can be overcome. Kill that dragon, Geralt. For me. For you. For me. I want that dragon, Geralt. In one piece. I want to have him all for myself. So? Cast a spell and kill it? No. You kill it, and I'll use my spells to hold back the Reavers and the others so they don't interfere. You'll kill them, Yennefer. Since when has that ever bothered you? You take care of the dragon, I'll deal with the people. Yennefer, the Witcher said coldly, I don't understand. What do you want with that dragon? Does the yellowness of its scales dazzle you to that degree? You don't suffer from poverty, after all. You have numerous sources of income. You're famous. What are you about? Just don't talk about a calling, I beg you. Yennefer was silent. Then, finally, twisting her lips, aimed a powerful kick at a stone lying in the grass. There's someone who can help me, Geralt. Apparently it's... You know what I'm talking about. Apparently it isn't irreversible. There's a chance. I could still have... Do you understand? I do. It's a complex operation, costly, but in exchange for a golden dragon. Geralt! The Witcher remained silent. When we were hanging on the bridge, the sorceress said, you asked me for something. I'll meet your request, in spite of everything. The Witcher smiled sadly and touched the obsidian star on Yennefer's neck with his index finger. It's too late, Yen. We aren't hanging now. It stopped mattering to me, in spite of everything. He expected the worst. A cascade of fire, lightning, a smack in the face, abuse, curses. He was surprised just to see the suppressed trembling of her lips. Yennefer slowly turned away. Geralt regretted his words. He regretted the emotion which had engendered them. The limit of possibility overstepped, now snapped like a lute string. He looked at Dandelion and saw the troubadour quickly turn his head away and avoid his gaze. Well, we've got the issue of knightly honour out of the way, my lords, Bohort called, now dressed in armour and standing before Nidomir, who was still sitting on a stone with an unvarying expression of boredom on his face. Knightly honour is lying there groaning softly. It was a lousy idea, Lord Gillenstiern, to send out Ike as your knight and vassal. I wouldn't dream of pointing the finger, but I know whom Ike can thank for his broken pins. Yes, I swear we've killed two birds with one stone. One was a lunatic, insanely reviving the legends of how a bold knight defeats a dragon in a duel, and the other, a swindler, who wanted to make money from it. Do you know who I'm talking about, Gillenstiern? What? Good. And now our move. Now the dragon is ours. Now we, the Reavers, will sort out that dragon, but by ourselves. And the agreement, Boholt? The Chancellor drawled. What about the agreement? 
I don't give a shit about the agreement. This is outrageous. This is lesser majesty. Gillenstein stamped his foot. King Nidamir, what about the king? Boholt yelled, resting on an enormous two-handed sword. Perhaps the king will personally decide to take on the dragon by himself. Or perhaps you, his faithful chancellor, will squeeze your belly into a suit of armour and go into battle. Why not? Please do. We'll wait, my lord. You had your chance, Gillenstiern. Had Ike mortally lanced the dragon, you would have taken it in its entirety. Nothing would have been left to us because we hadn't helped. Not one golden scale on its back. But it's too late now. Open your eyes. There's no one to fight under Cairngorm's colours. You won't find another chump like Ike. Uh, that's not true, the cobbler sheepbagger said, hurrying to the king, who was still busy watching a point on the horizon of interest only to him. Oh, king, just wait a little, and our men from Bearfield will be arriving. They'll be here any moment. To hell with a cocksure nobility. Chase them away. You'll see who is really brave, who is strong indeed, and not just in word. Shut your trap. Boholt said calmly, wiping a spot of rust from his breastplate. Shut your trap, peasant, because if you don't, I'll shut it so hard I'll shove your teeth down your throat. Sheepbagger, seeing Kennet and Gar approaching, quickly backed away and hid among the Bearfield constables. King, Gillenstiern called. Oh, King, what do you command? The expression of boredom suddenly vanished from Nidamir's face. The underage monarch wrinkled his freckly nose and stood up. "'What do I command?' he said in a shrill voice. "'You finally asked, Gillenstiern, rather than decide for me and speak for me and on my behalf. "'I'm very pleased, and may it thus remain, Gillenstiern. "'From this moment you will be silent and listen to my orders. "'Here is the first of them. "'Muster the men and order Ike of Denesley to be placed on a wagon. "'We're going back to Cairngorm.' "'But, Zaya, not!' A word, Gillenstiern. Madam Yennefer, noble lords, I bid you farewell. I've lost some time on this expedition, but have gained much. I have learned a great deal. Thank you for your words, Madam Yennefer, Master Dorigore, Sir Boholt, and thank you for your silence, Sir Geralt. Oh, King, Gillenstiern said. What do you mean? The dragon is in our grasp. It's there for the taking. King, your dream, my dream, Nidamir repeated pensively. I do not have it yet. And should I stay here, then I might never have it. But Mariore, and the hand of the princess? The chancellor waved his arms, not giving up. And the throne, king. The people there will acknowledge you as... I don't give a shit about the people there, as Sir Boholt would say. Nidamir laughed. The throne of Maliore is mine anyway, because in Cairngorm I have three hundred armoured troops and fifteen hundred foot soldiers against their thousand crappy spearmen. Do they acknowledge me? They will have to. I'll keep hanging, beheading and dismembering until they do. And their princess is a fat goose and a hell with her hand. I only need her womb. Let her bear me an heir, and then I'll poison her anyway, using Master Sheepbagger's method. That's enough chatter, Gillenstiern. Is that about carrying out my orders? Indeed, Dandelion whispered to Geralt. He has learnt a great deal. A great deal, Geralt confirmed, looking at the hillock where the golden dragon, with its triangular head lowered, was licking something grey-green, sitting in the grass beside it with its forked scarlet tongue. But I wouldn't like to be his subject, Dandelion. And what do you think will happen now? The witcher looked calmly at the tiny grey-green creature, fluttering its bat-like wings beside the golden talons of the stooping dragon. And what's your opinion about all this, Dandelion? What do you think? What does it matter what I think? I'm a poet, Geralt. Does my opinion matter at all? Yes, it does. Well, I'll tell you then. When I see a reptile, Geralt, a viper, let's say, or some other serpent, it gives me the creeps. The vileness disgusts and terrifies me. But that dragon... Yeah? It's... It's pretty, Geralt. Thank you, Dandelion. What for? Geralt turned his head away and with a slow movement reached for the buckle of his belt, which crossed his chest diagonally and shortened it by two holes. He lifted his right hand to check if his sword hilt was positioned correctly. Dandelion looked on with eyes wide open. Geralt? Do you mean to... Yes, the witcher said calmly. There is a limit to what I can accept as possible. I've had enough of all this. 
Are you going with Nidamere or staying, Dandelion? The troubadour leaned over, placed his lute beneath a stone cautiously and with great care, and then straightened up. I'm staying. What did you say? The limits of possibility? I'm bagging that as the title of a ballad. It could be your last one, Dandelion. Geralt? Hmm? Don't kill it. Can you not? A sword is a sword, Dandelion. Once drawn, please try. I will. Dorigare chuckled, turned towards Yennefer and the Reavers, and pointed at the receding royal caravan. Over there, he said, King Nidamir is leaving. He no longer gives orders through Gillenstiern's mouth. He is departing, having demonstrated good sense. I'm glad you're here, Dandelion. I suggest you begin composing a ballad. What about? About? The sorcerer drew his wand from his coat. Master Dorigare, sorcerer, chasing back home the rabble who wanted to use vulgar methods to kill the last golden dragon left in the world. Don't move, Boholt. Yarpen, hands off your battle axe. Don't move a muscle, Yennefer. Off you go, good for nothings. Follow the king like good little boys. Be off. Mount your horses or wagons. I warn you that if anybody makes a false move, all that will remain of him will be a burning smell and a bit of fused sand. I am serious. Dorigare, Yennefer hissed. My lord sorcerer, Boholt said conciliatorily. Is this any way to act? Be quiet, Boholt. I told you not to touch that dragon. Fables are not to be killed. About turn and scram. Yennefer's hand suddenly shot forward and the ground around Dorigare exploded in blue flame, seething in a dust cloud of torn turf and grit. The sorcerer staggered, encircled by fire. Gar leapt forward and struck him in the face with the heel of his hand. Dorigare fell to the ground, a bolt of red lightning shooting from his wand and harmlessly zapping out among the rocks. Beanpole sprang at him from the other side, kicked the sorcerer to the ground and took a backswing to repeat the blow. Geralt fell among them pushed Beanpole away, drew his sword and thrust flat, aiming between the breastplate and the spalder. He was thwarted by Boholt, who parried the blow with the broad blade of his two-handed sword. Dandelion tried to trip Gar, but ineffectively. Gar clung to the bard's rainbow-hued jerkin and thumped him between the eyes with his fist. Yarpin Zigrin, leaping from behind, tripped Dandelion, hitting him behind his knees with the haft of a hatchet. Geralt spun into a pirouette, evading Boholt's sword, and jabbed at the onrushing beanpole, tearing off his iron bracer. Beanpole leapt back, tripped and fell over. Boholt grunted and whirled his sword like a scythe. Geralt jumped over the whistling blade, slammed the hilt of his sword into Boholt's breastplate, fended him off, and thrust, aiming for his cheek. Boholt, realising he could not parry with his heavy sword, threw himself backwards, falling on his back. The witcher leapt at him, and at that moment felt the earth fall away from under his rapidly numbing feet. He saw the horizon going from horizontal to vertical. Vainly trying to form a protective sign with his fingers, he fell heavily onto the ground on his side, his sword slipping from his numb hand. There was a pounding and a buzzing in his ears. Tie them up before the spell stops working, Yennefer said, somewhere above but very far away. All three of them. Dorigare and Geralt befuddled and paralysed, allowed themselves to be bound and tethered to a wagon, silently and without resisting. Dandelion fought and cursed, so he received a punch in the face before he was tied to the wagon. Why tie him up, traitors, sons of dogs, Sheepbagger said, walking over. They should be clubbed to death at once and be done with it. You're a son yourself and not a dog's, Yarpin Zigrin said. Don't insult dogs here. Scram, you heel. You're awfully brave, Sheepbagger snapped. We'll see if you're brave enough when my comrades arrive from Bearfield. They'll be here any moment. You... Yarpin, twisting with surprising agility, considering his build, whacked Sheepbagger over the head with his hatchet. Gar, standing alongside, gave him a kick for good measure. Sheepbagger flew a few feet through the air and fell nose first in the grass. You'll be sorry, he yelled, crawling on all fours. I'll fix... Lads, Yarpin Zigrin roared. Kick the cobbler in the cobblers. Grab him, Gar. Sheepbagger did not wait. He sprang up and dashed towards the eastern canyon. The Bearfield trackers followed him cringing. The dwarves cackling sent a hail of stones after them. The air's freshened up already, Yarpin laughed. Right, Bold, let's get down to the dragon. Hold on. 
Yennefer raised a hand. The only thing you're getting down to is the bottom of the valley. Be gone, all of you. Excuse me? Boholt bent over, his eyes blazing ominously. What did you say, most honourable Madam Witch? Follow that cobbler, Yennefer repeated. All of you. I'll deal with the dragon myself, using unconventional weapons. And you can thank me as you leave. Had it not been for me, you would have tasted the witcher's sword. Come now, quickly, Boholt, before I lose my temper. I warn you that I know a spell which can make you all geldings. I just have to raise my hand. Is that so? Boholt drawled. My patience has reached its limits. I won't be made a fool of. Beanpole, unhook the shaft from the cart. I feel I'll also be needing unconventional weapons. Someone is soon going to get a damn good thrashing, my lords. I won't point the finger, but a certain hideous witch is going to get a bloody sound hiding. Just try, Boholt. You'll brighten up my day. Why, Yennefer? the dwarf asked reproachfully. Perhaps I simply don't like sharing, Yarpin. Well, now, Yarpin Zigrin smiled. That's profoundly human. So human, it's almost dwarven. It's nice to see familiar qualities in a sorceress. But I don't like sharing either, Yennefer. He hunched into a short, very rapid backswing. A steel ball, appearing out of his pocket as if from nowhere, whirred through the air and smacked Yennefer right in the forehead. Before the sorceress had time to come to her senses, she was suspended in the air, being held up by Beanpole and Gar, and Yarpen was binding her ankles with twine. Yennefer screamed furiously, but one of Yarpen's boys threw the wagon's reins over her head from behind and pulled them tight, the leather strap digging into her open mouth, stifling her cries. Well, Yennefer, Boholt said as he walked over, how do you plan to turn me into a gelding now, when you can't move a hand? He tore the collar of her coat and then ripped and wrenched open her blouse. Yennefer shrieked, choked by the reins. I don't have the time now, Boholt said, groping her shamelessly to the cackling of the dwarves. But wait a little while, witch. Once we've sorted out the dragon, we'll make merry. Tie her family to the wheel, boys. Both little hands to the rim, so she won't be able to lift a finger. And no one's to bloody touch her yet, my lords. We'll sort the order out, depending on who does a good job on the dragon. Beware, Boholt, Geralt, arms tied, said softly calmly and ominously. I'll follow you to the ends of the world. You surprise me, the reaver replied just as calmly. In your place I'd keep mum. I know you, and I know I have to take your threat seriously. I won't have a choice. You might not come out of this alive, Witcher. We'll return to this matter. Go, Beanpole, to horse. What bad luck, Dandelion snapped. Why the hell did I get mixed up in this? Dorigare, lowering his head, watched the thick drops of blood slowly dripping from his nose onto his belly. Would you stop staring? the sorceress screamed at Geralt. She was writhing like a snake in her bonds, vainly trying to conceal her exposed charms. The witcher obediently turned his head away. Dandelion did not. You must have used an entire barrel of mandrake elixir on what I can see, Yennefer, the bard laughed. Your skin's like a sixteen-year-old's, damn it. Shut your trap, whore son, the sorceress bellowed. How old are you actually, Yennefer? Dandelion asked, not giving up. Two hundred? Well, a hundred and fifty, let's say. And you're behaving like... Yennefer twisted her neck and spat at him, but was wide of the mark. Yen, the witcher said reproachfully, wiping his spit-covered ear on his shoulder. I wish he would stop staring. Not on your life, Dandelion said without taking his eyes off the bedraggled sorceress. I'm here because of her. They may slit our throats, but at least I'll die happy. Shut up, Dandelion, the witcher said. I have no intention of so doing. In fact, I plan to compose the ballad of the two tits. Please don't interfere. Dandelion, Dorigare sniffed through his bloody nose. Be serious. I am being bloody serious. The dwarves heaved Boholt up into the saddle. He was heavy and squat from the armour and the leather pads he was wearing. Gar and Beanpole were already mounted, holding huge two-handed swords across their saddles. Right, Boholt rasped. Let's have at him. Oh, no, 
said the deep voice, sounding like a brass trumpet. I have come to you. From beyond the ring of boulders emerged a long snout shimmering with gold, a slender neck armed with a row of triangular serrated projections and behind taloned feet. The evil reptilian eyes with their vertical pupils peered from beneath horned eyelids. I was tired of waiting in the open, the dragon Vilentra Tenmerth said, looking around. So I came myself. Fewer and fewer challenges, I see. Boholt held the reins in his teeth and a longsword two-handed. That's not, he said indistinctly, holding the strap in his teeth. Shall fight, Hestile. I am, the dragon said, arching its back and lifting its tail insultingly. Boholt looked around. Gar and Beanpole, slowly, almost ostentatiously, calmly flanked the dragon. Yarpin Zigrin and his boys waited behind, holding battle axes. Ah! Boholt roared, striking his horse hard with his heels and lifting his sword. The dragon curled up, flattened itself to the ground, and struck with its tail from above and behind, like a scorpion hitting not Boholt but Gar, who was attacking from the side. Gar fell over with his horse amid a clanking, screaming, and neighing tumult. Boholt, charging at a gallop, struck with a terrible blow, but the dragon nimbly dodged the wide blade. The momentum of the gallop carried Boholt alongside the dragon's body. The dragon twisted, standing on its hind legs, and clawed Beanpole, tearing open his horse's belly and the rider's thigh with a single slash. Boholt, leaning far out from the saddle, managed to steer his horse around, pulling the reins with his teeth, and attacked once more. The dragon lashed its tail over the dwarves rushing towards it, knocking them all over, and then lunged at Boholt, en route, seemingly in passing, stamping vigorously on Beanpole, who was trying to get up. Boholt, jerking his head around, tried to steer his galloping horse, but the dragon was infinitely quicker and more agile. Cunningly stealing up on Boholt from the left in order to obstruct his swing, it struck with a taloned foot. The horse reared up and lurched over to one side. Boholt flew from the saddle, losing his sword and helmet, tumbling backwards onto the ground, banging his head against a rock. Run for it, lads, up the hill! Yarpin Zigrin bellowed, outshouting the screams of Gar, who was pinned down by his horse. Beards fluttering, the dwarves dashed towards the rocks at a speed that belied their short legs. The dragon did not give chase. It sat calmly and looked around. Gar was thrashing and screaming beneath the horse. Boholt lay motionless. Beanpole was crawling towards the rocks, sideways, like a huge iron crab. Staggering, Dora Gray whispered. Staggering. Hey! Dandelion struggled in his bonds, making the wagon shake. What is it? Uh, over there! Look! A great cloud of dust could be seen on the eastern side of the gorge, and shouting, rattling, and the tramping of hooves quickly reached them. The dragon extended its neck to look. Three large wagons full of armed men rolled onto the plain. Splitting up, they began to surround the dragon. It's... damn it! It's the constabulary and guilds from Bearfield, Dandelion called. They came around by the source of the Brer. Yes, it's them. Look, it's Sheepbagger, there at the front. The dragon lowered its head and gently pushed a small, green, greyish mewling creature towards the wagon. Then it struck the ground with its tail, roared loudly, and shot like an arrow towards the encounter with the men of Bearfield. What is it? Yennefer asked. That little thing, crawling around in the grass, Geralt. It's what the dragon was protecting from us, the witcher said. That's what hatched some time ago in the cave, over there in the northern canyon. It's the dragonling from the egg of the dragon that Sheepbagger poisoned. The dragonling, stumbling and dragging its bulging belly across the ground, scurried unsteadily over to the wagon, squealed, stood on its hind legs, stretched out its little wings, and then, without a second's thought, clung to the sorceress's side. Yennefer, with an extremely queer look on her face, sighed loudly. It likes you, Geralt murmured. He's young, but he ain't stupid. Dandelion, twisting in his fetters, grinned. Look where he stuck his snout. I'd like to be in his shoes, damn it. Hey, little one, run away. That's Yennefer, terror of dragons and witches.
well, at least one witcher. Quiet, Dandelion, Dorigore shouted. Look over there, on the battlefield. They've got him a pox on them. The barefield wagons, rumbling like war chariots, raced towards the attacking dragon. Smack him, Sheepbaggy yelled, hanging on to the wagoner's back. Smack him, kinsman, anywhere and anyhow. Don't hold back. The dragon nimbly eluded the first advancing wagon, flashing with scythe blades, forks and spears, but ended up between the next two, from which a huge double fishing net pulled by straps dropped onto it. The dragon, fully enmeshed, fell down, rolled over, curled up in a ball and spread its legs. The net tore to shreds with a sharp rending noise. More nets were thrown onto it from the first wagon, which it managed to turn around, this time utterly entangling the dragon. The two other wagons also turned back, dashed towards the dragon, rattling and bouncing over bumps. You're caught in the net, you carp, sheepbagger bawled, and we'll soon scale you. The dragon roared and belched a cloud of steam into the sky. The barefield constables rushed towards him, spilling out of the wagons. The dragon bellowed again, desperately with a thundering roar. From the northern canyon came a reply, a high-pitched battle cry. Out from the gorge, straining forward in a frenzied gallop, blonde plat streaming, whistling piercingly, surrounded by the flickering flashes of sabres, charged. The Zeracanians, the witcher shouted, helplessly tugging at the ropes. Oh, shit, Dandelion chimed in. Geralt, do you understand? The Zeracanians rode through the throng like hot knives through a barrel of butter scattering their path with massacred corpses and then leapt from their horses in full flight to stand beside the dragon struggling in the net. The first of the onrushing constables immediately lost his head. The second aimed a blow with his pitchfork at Vera, but the Zeracanian, holding her sabre in both hands upside down, with the tip pointing towards the ground, slashed him open from crotch to sternum. The others beat a hurried retreat. To the wagons! Sheepbagger yelled. To the wagons, kinsmen! We'll crush them into the wagons! Geralt, Yennefer suddenly shouted, pulling up her bound legs and pushing them with a sudden thrust under the wagon, beneath the arms of the witcher, which were bound and twisted behind him. The Igni sign! Make it! Can you feel the rope? Cast the bloody thing! Without looking, Geralt groaned. I'll burn you, Yen. Make the sign! I can take it! He obeyed and felt a tingling in his fingers, which were forming the Igni sign, just above the sorceress's bound ankles. Yennefer turned her head away, biting down on her coat collar and stifling a moan. The dragonling, squealing, beat its wings beside her. Yen, make it, she bellowed. Her bonds gave way in an instant, as the disgusting, nauseating odour of charred skin became unbearable. Dorigore uttered a strange noise and fainted, suspended by his fetters from the wagon wheel. The sorceress, wincing with the pain, straightened up, lifting her now free leg. She screamed in a furious voice, full of pain and rage. The medallion on Geralt's neck jerked as though it were alive. Yennefer straightened her thigh, waved her foot towards the charging wagons of the Barefield Constabulary, and shouted out a spell. The air crackled and gave off the smell of ozone. Oh, ye gods! Dandelion wailed in admiration. What a ballad this will be! Yennefer! The spell, cast by her shapely little foot, was not totally effective. The first wagon, and everything on it, took on the yellow colour of a king cup, which the barefield soldiers, in the frenzy of battle, did not even notice. It did better with the second wagon, whose entire crew were transformed into huge, rough-skinned frogs, which hopped around in all directions, croaking comically. The wagon, now bereft of a driver, tipped over and fell apart. The horses, neighing hysterically, fled into the distance, dragging the broken shaft behind them. Yennefer bit her lip and waved her leg in the air again. The King Cup Yellow Wagon suddenly dissolved into King Cup Yellow Smoke to the sound of lively musical tones drifting down from above, and its entire crew flopped onto the grass, stupefied, forming a picturesque heap. The wheels of the third wagon went from round to square, and the result was instant. The horses reared up, the wagon crashed over, and the barefield constabulary were tipped out and thrown onto the ground. Yennefer now driven by pure vindictiveness, flourished a leg ferociously and yelled out a spell, transforming the bare field as randomly into turtles, geese, woodlice, flamingos and stripy piglets. 
the Zeracanians expertly and methodically finished off the rest. The dragon, having finally torn the nets to shreds, leapt up, flapped its wings, roared and hurtled as straight as a ramrod after the unharmed and fleeing Sheepbagger. Sheepbagger was dashing like a stag, but the dragon was faster. Geralt, seeing the gaping jaws and razor-sharp flashing teeth, turned his head away. He heard a gruesome scream and a revolting crunching sound. Dandelion gave a stifled shout. Yennefer, her face as white as a sheet, bent over double, turned to one side and vomited under the wagon. A silence fell, interrupted only by the occasional gaggling, croaking and squealing of the remains of the Bearfield Constabulary. Veer, smiling and pleasantly, stood over Yennefer, legs wide apart. The Zeracanian raised her sabre. Yennefer, pale, raised a leg. No, said Borch, also known as Three Jackdaws, who was sitting on a stone. In his lap, he was holding the dragonling, peaceful and content. We aren't going to kill Madame Yennefer, the dragon villain Tretenmurth repeated. It is over. What is more, we are grateful to Madame Yennefer for her invaluable assistance. Release them, Veer. Do you understand, Geralt? Dandelion whispered, chafing feeling back into his numb arms. Do you understand? There's an ancient ballad about a golden dragon. A golden dragon can... Can assume any form it wishes, Geralt muttered. Even that of a human. I've heard that too, but I didn't believe it. Yap in Zigrin, sir, Villain Tretenmurth called to the dwarf, who was hanging onto a vertical rock twenty ells above the ground. What are you looking for there? Marmots? Not your favourite dish, if memory serves me. Climb down and busy yourself with the reavers. They need help. There won't be any more killing. Of anybody. Dandelion, casting anxious glances at the Zeracanians, who were vigilantly patrolling the battlefield, was still trying to revive the unconscious Dorigare. Geralt was dressing Yennefer's scorched ankles and rubbing ointment into them. The sorceress was hissing with pain and mumbling spells. Having completed his task, the witcher stood up. Stay here, he said. I have to talk to him. Yennefer stood up, wincing. I'm going with you, Geralt, she said, linking her arm in his. May I? Please, Geralt? With me, Yen. I thought, don't think. She pressed herself against his arm. Yen, it's all right, Geralt. He looked into her eyes, which were warm, as they used to be. He lowered his head and kissed her lips, hot, soft and willing, as they used to be. They walked over. Yennefer, held up by Geralt, curtsied low as though before a king, holding her dress in her fingertips. Three Jack, <laughs> villain Tretenmurth, the witcher said. My name, when freely translated into your language, means three black birds, the dragon said. The dragonling, little claws digging into his forearm, arched its back to be stroked. Chaos and order. Villain Tretenmurth smiled. Do you remember, Geralt? Chaos is aggression. Order its protection against it. It's worth rushing to the ends of the world to oppose aggression and evil, isn't it, Witcher? Particularly, as you said, when the pay is fair. And this time it was. It was the treasure hoard of the she-dragon Mirk Tabraka, the one poisoned outside Bearfield. She summoned me to help her, to stop the evil threatening her. Mirgta Braca flew away soon after Ike of Denesle was removed from the battlefield. She had sufficient time while you were talking and quarrelling. But she left me her treasure as my payment. The dragonling squealed and flapped its little wings. So you... That is right, the dragon interrupted. Well, it's the times we live in. For some time, creatures, which you usually call monsters have been feeling more and more under threat from people. They can no longer cope by themselves. They need a defender, some kind of witcher. 
and the destination, the goal at the end of the road. This is it. Wieland Tretenmer lifted his forearm. The dragonling squealed in alarm. I've just attained it. Owing to him, I shall survive, Geralt of Rivia. I shall prove there are no limits of possibility. One day you will also find such a purpose, Witcher. Even those who are different can survive. Farewell, Geralt. Farewell, Yennefer. The sorceress, grasping the witch's arm more firmly, curtsied again. Vilen Tretenmerth stood up and looked at her, and his expression was very serious. Forgive me my frankness and forthrightness, Yennefer. It is written all over your faces. I don't even have to try to read your thoughts. You were made for each other, you and the Witcher. But nothing will come of it. Nothing. I'm sorry. I know. Yennefer blanched slightly. I know, Villain Tretenmeth. But I would also like to believe there are no limits of possibility. Or at least I would like to believe that they are still very far away. Via walked over touched Geralt's shoulder, and quickly uttered a few words. The dragon laughed. Geralt, Vea says she will long remember the tub at the pensive dragon. She hopes we'll meet again some day. What? Yennefer answered, narrowing her eyes. Uh, nothing, the witcher said quickly. Villain to Tenmeth. Yes, Geralt of Olivia. You can assume any form, any that you wish. Indeed. Why then a man? Why Borg, with three black birds on his coat of arms? The dragon smiled cheerfully. I don't know, Geralt, in what circumstances the distant ancestors of our races encountered one another for the first time, but the fact is that for dragons there is nothing more repugnant than man. Man arouses instinctive, irrational disgust in a dragon. With me, it's different. To me, you're... likable. Farewell. It was not a gradual, blurred transformation, or a hazy, pulsating trembling as with an illusion. It was as sudden as the blink of an eye. Where a second before had stood a curly-haired knight in a tunic decorated with three black birds, now sat a golden dragon, gracefully extending its long, slender neck. Inclining its head, the dragon spread its wings, dazzlingly gold in the sunshine. Yennefer sighed loudly. Veer, already mounted beside Tyr, waved. Veer, the witcher said. You were right. Hmm? He is the most beautiful. A Shard of Ice Chapter One The dead sheep, swollen and bloated, its stiff legs pointing towards the sky moved. Geralt, crouching by the wall, slowly drew his sword, careful not to let the blade grate against the scabbard. Ten paces from him, a pile of refuse suddenly arched up and heaved. The witcher straightened and jumped before the wave of stench emanating from the disturbed midden reached him. A tentacle, ending in a rounded, tapering protuberance, bristling with spikes, suddenly shot out from under the rubbish, hurtling out towards him at incredible speed. The witcher landed surely on the remains of a broken piece of furniture, tottering on a pile of rotten vegetables. Swayed, regained his balance, and slashed the tentacle with a short blow of his sword, cutting off the tentacular club. He sprang back at once, but this time slipped from the boards and sank up to his thighs in the boggy midden. The rubbish heap erupted, throwing up viscous, foul-smelling slime, fragments of pots, rotten rags, and pale threads of sauerkraut, and from beneath it all burst an enormous, bulbous body, as deformed as a grotesque potato, lashing the air with three tentacles and the stump of a fourth. Geralt, trapped and immobilized, struck with a broad twist of his hips, smoothly hacking off another tentacle. The remaining two, as thick as tree boughs, fell on him with force, plunging him more deeply into the waste. The body glided towards him, ploughing into the midden like a barrel being dragged along. He saw the hideous bulbous shape snap open, gaping with a wide maw full of large, lumpish teeth. He let the tentacles encircle his waist, pull him with a squelch from the stinking slime, and drag him towards the body, 
now boring into the refuse heap with circular movements. The toothed maw snapped savagely and ferociously. Having been dragged close to the dreadful jaws, the witcher struck with his sword, two-handed, the blade biting smoothly and easily. The obnoxious, sweetish odour took his breath away. The monster hissed and shuddered, and the tentacles released their grip, flapping convulsively in the air. Geralt, bogged down in the refuse, slashed again backhanded, the blade repulsively crunching and grating on the bared teeth. The creature gurgled and drooped, but immediately swelled, hissing, vomiting putrid slime over the witcher. Keeping his balance with strenuous movements of his legs still stuck in the muck, Geralt broke free and lunged forward, cleaving the refuse with his chest like a swimmer moving through water, and struck with all his strength from above, powerfully bearing down on the blade as it cut into the body between the weakly glowing eyes. The monster groaned, flapped around, unfolding onto the pile of muck like a punctured bladder, emitting palpable warm gusts of stench. The tentacles twitched and writhed among the rubbish. The witcher clambered out of the treacly slime and stood on slippery but hard ground. He felt something sticky and revolting which had got into his boot, crawling over his calf. To the well, he thought. Wash it off. Wash off all the repulsiveness as soon as possible. Wash myself. The creature's tentacles flapped on the refuse one last time, sloppy and wet, and then stopped moving. A star fell. A brief flash of lightning, illuminating the black firmament, flecked with unmoving dots of light. The Witcher made no wish. He was breathing heavily, wheezing, and feeling the effects of the elixirs had drunk before the fight wearing off. The gigantic heap of rubbish and waste piled up against the town walls, descending steeply towards the glistening ribbon of the river, looked pretty and alluring in the starlight. The Witcher spat. The monster was dead now part of the midden where it had dwelled. Another star fell. A garbage heap, the witcher said with effort. Muck, filth and shit. Chapter Two You reek, Geralt, Yennefer grimaced, not turning from the mirror, where she was cleaning off the colouring from her eyelids and eyelashes. Take a bath. There's no water, he said, looking into the tub. We shall remedy that. The sorceress stood up and threw the window open. Do you prefer sea water or fresh water? Sea water for a change. Yennefer spread her arms vigorously and shouted a spell, making a brief, intricate movement with her hands. Suddenly, a sharp, wet coldness blew in through the open window. The shutters juddered, and a green cloud gushed into the room with a hiss, billowing in an irregular sphere. The tub foamed with water, rippling turbulently, banging against the edges and splashing onto the floor. The sorceress sat down and resumed her previously interrupted activity. How did it go? she asked. What was it on the midden? A zoigle, as I suspected, Geralt said, pulling off his boots, discarding his clothes, and lowering a foot into the tub. Bloody hell, Yen, that's cold. Can't you heat the water? No. The sorceress, moving her face towards the looking glass and instilling something into her eye using a thin glass rod. That spell is bloody wearying and makes me feel sick, and the cold will do you good after the elixirs. Geralt did not argue. There was absolutely no point arguing with Yennefer. Did the cycle cause you any problems? The sorceress dipped the rod into a vial and dropped something into her other eye twisting her lips comically. Not particularly. From outside the open window, there was a thud, the sharp crack of wood breaking, and an inarticulate voice, tunelessly and incoherently repeating the chorus of a popular, obscene song. A zoigel, said the sorceress, as she reached for another vial from the impressive collection on the table, and removed the cork from it. The fragrance of lilac and gooseberries filled the room. Well, well. Even in a town, it's easy for a witcher to find work. You don't have to roam through the wilds at all. You know, Istreth maintains it's becoming a general rule. The place of every creature from the forests and swamps that becomes extinct is occupied by something else, some new mutation, adapted to the artificial environment created by people. As usual, Geralt winced at the mention of Istreth. He was beginning to be sick of Yennefer's admiration for Istreth's brilliance. 
even if Istreth was right. Istreth is right, Yennefer continued, applying the lilac and gooseberry perfume something to her cheeks and eyelids. Look for yourself. Pseudo-rats in sewers and cellars, zoigles in rubbish dumps, neocorises in polluted moats and sewers, tagiers in mill ponds. It's virtually symbiosis, don't you think? And ghouls in cemeteries devouring corpses that after the funeral, he thought, rinsing off the soap. Total symbiosis. Yes. The sorceress put aside the vials and jars. Witches can be kept busy in towns, too. I think one day you'll settle in a city for good, Geralt. I'd rather drop dead, he thought, but he did not say it aloud. Contradicting Yennefer, as he knew, inevitably led to a fight, and a fight with Yennefer was not the safest thing. Have you finished, Geralt? Yes. Get out of the tub. Without getting up, Yennefer carelessly waved a hand and uttered a spell. The water from the tub, including everything which had spilled onto the floor or was dripping from Geralt, gathered itself with a swoosh into a translucent sphere and whistled through the window. He heard a loud splash. A pox on you, horsens! An infuriated yell rang out from below. Have you nowhere to pour away your piss? I bloody hope you're eaten alive by lice. Catch the ray pox and croak. The sorceress closed the window. Damn it, Yen, the witcher chuckled. You could have chucked the water somewhere else. I could have, she purred, but I didn't feel like it. She took the oil lamp from the table and walked over to him. The white nightdress clinging to her body as she moved made her tremendously appealing. More so than if she were naked, he thought. I want to look you over, she said. The Zoigel might have injured you. It didn't. I would have felt it. After the elixirs? Don't be ridiculous. After the elixirs, you wouldn't even have felt an open fracture until the protruding bones started snagging on hedges. And there might have been anything on the Zoigel, including tetanus and cadaveric poison. If anything happens, there's still time for countermeasures. Turn around. He felt the soft warmth of the lamp's flame on his body and the occasional brushing of her hair. Everything seems to be in order, she said. Lie down before the elixirs knock you off your feet. Those mixtures are devilishly dangerous. They'll destroy you in the end. I have to take them before I fight. Yennefer did not answer. She sat down at the looking glass once more and slowly combed her black, curly, shimmering locks. She always combed her hair before going to bed. Geralt found it peculiar, but he adored watching her doing it. He suspected Yennefer was aware of it. He suddenly felt very cold, and the elixirs indeed jolted him, numbed the nape of his neck, and swirled around the bottom of his stomach in vortices of nausea. He cursed under his breath and fell heavily onto the bed, without taking his eyes off Yennefer. A movement in the corner of the chamber caught his attention. A smallish, pitch-black bird sat on a set of antlers nailed crookedly to the wall and festooned in cobwebs. Glancing sideways, it looked at the witcher with a yellow, fixed eye. What's that, Yen? How did it get here? What? Yennefer turned her head. Oh, that? It's a kestrel. A kestrel? Kestrels are rufous and speckled, and that one's black. It's an enchanted kestrel. I made it. What for? I need it. She cut him off. Geralt did not ask any more questions, knowing that Yennefer would not answer. Are you seeing Istreth tomorrow? The sorceress moved the vials to the edge of the table, put her comb into a small box, and closed the side panels of the looking glass. Yes. First thing, why? Nothing. She lay down beside him, without snuffing out the lamp. She never doused lights. She could not bear to fall asleep in the dark, whether an oil lamp, a lantern, or a candle. It had to burn right down, always. One more foible. Yennefer had a remarkable number of foibles. Yen? Uh-huh. When are we leaving? Don't be tedious. She tugged the eider down sharply. We've only been here three days, and you've asked that question at least thirty times. I've told you. I have things to deal with. With Istreth? Yes. He sighed and embraced her, not concealing his intentions. Hey, she whispered, you've taken elixirs. What of it? Nothing. 
She giggled like a schoolgirl, cuddling up to him, arching her body and lifting herself to allow her nightdress to slip off. As usual, the delight in her nakedness coursed in a shudder down his back and tingled in his fingers as they touched her skin. His lips touched her breasts, rounded and delicate, with nipples so pale they were visible only by their contours. He entwined his fingers in her hair, her lilac and gooseberry perfumed hair. She succumbed to his caresses, purring like a cat, rubbing her bent knee against his hip. It rapidly turned out, as usual, that he had overestimated his stamina regarding the witcher elixirs, had forgotten about their disagreeable effects on his body. But perhaps it's not the elixirs, he thought. Perhaps it's exhaustion brought on by fighting, risks, danger and death. Exhaustion which has simply become routine. But my body, even though artificially enhanced, doesn't succumb to routine. It reacts naturally. Just not what it's supposed to, damn it. But Yennefer, as usual, was not discouraged by a mere trifle. He felt her touch him, heard her purr right by his ear. As usual, he involuntarily pondered over the colossal number of occasions she must have used that most practical of spells. And then he stopped pondering. As usual, it was anything but ordinary. He looked at her mouth, at its corners, twitching in an unwitting smile. He knew that smile well. It always seemed to him more one of triumph than of happiness. He had never asked her about it. He knew she would not answer. The black kestrel sitting on the antlers beat its wings and snapped its curved beak. Yennefer turned her head away and sighed, very sadly. Yen? It's nothing, Geralt, she said, kissing him. It's nothing. The oil lamp glimmered and flickered. A mouse was scratching in the wall, and a Death Watch beetle in the dresser clicked softly, rhythmically and monotonously. Yen? Hmm? Let's get away. I feel bad here. This town has an awful effect on me. She turned over on her side, ran a hand across his cheek, brushing some strands of hair away. Her fingers travelled downwards, touching the coarse scars marking the side of his neck. Do you know what the name of this town means? Ith Gainvir. No. Is it in the elven speech? Yes. It means a shard of ice. Somehow it doesn't suit this lousy dump. Among the elves, the sorceress whispered pensively, there is a legend about a winter queen who travels the land during snowstorms in a sleigh drawn by white horses. As she rides, she casts hard, sharp, tiny shards of ice around her, and woe betide anyone whose eye or heart is pierced by one of them. That person is then lost. No longer will anything gladden them. They find anything that doesn't have the whiteness of snow ugly, obnoxious, repugnant. They will not find peace, will abandon everything and will set off after the queen in pursuit of their dream and love. Naturally, they will never find it and will die of longing. Apparently, here, in this town, something like that happened in times long gone. It's a beautiful legend, isn't it? Elves can couch everything in pretty words, he muttered drowsily, running his lips over her shoulder. It's not a legend at all, Yen. It's a pretty description of the hideous phenomenon that is the wild hunt, the curse of several regions, an inexplicable collective madness, compelling people to join a spectral cavalcade rushing across the sky. I've seen it. Indeed, it often occurs during the winter. I was offered rather good money to put an end to that blight, but I didn't take it. There's no way of dealing with the wild hunt. Witcher, she whispered, kissing his cheek. There's no romance in you, and I... I like elven legends. They are so captivating. What a pity humans don't have any legends like that. Perhaps one day they will.
Perhaps they'll create some. But what would human legends deal with? All around, wherever one looks, there's greyness and dullness. Even things which begin beautifully lead swiftly to boredom and dreariness, to that human ritual, that wearisome rhythm called life. Oh, Geralt, it's not easy being a sorceress, but comparing it to mundane, human existence. Geralt? She laid her head on his chest which was rising and falling, with slow breathing. Sleep, she whispered. Sleep, Witcher. Chapter Three The town was having a bad effect on him. Since first thing that morning, everything was spoiling his mood, making him dejected and angry. Everything. It annoyed him that he had overslept, so the morning had become to all intents and purposes the afternoon. He was irritated by the absence of Yennefer, who had left before he woke up. She must have been in a hurry, because the paraphernalia she usually neatly put away in boxes was lying on the table, randomly strewn like dice cast by a soothsayer performing a prophecy ritual. Brushes made from delicate horsehair, the large ones used for powdering her face, the smaller ones which she used to apply lipstick to her mouth and the utterly tiny ones were the henna she used to dye her eyelashes. Pencils and sticks for her eyelids and eyebrows, delicate silver tweezers and spoons, small jars and bottles made of porcelain and milky glass, containing, as he knew, elixirs and balms with ingredients as banal as soot, goose grease and carrot juice, and as menacingly mysterious as mandrake, antimony, belladonna, cannabis, dragon's blood, and the concentrated venom of the giant scorpion. And above all of that, all around, in the air, the fragrance of lilac and gooseberry, the scent she always used. She was present in those objects. She was present in the fragrance. But she was not there. He went downstairs feeling anxiety and anger welling up in him, about everything. He was annoyed by the cold, congealed scrambled egg he was served for breakfast by the innkeeper, who tore himself away for a moment from groping a girl in the kitchen. He was annoyed that the girl was no more than twelve years old and had tears in her eyes. The warm spring weather and cheerful chatter of the vibrant streets did not improve Geralt's mood. He still did not enjoy being in Eirthgeinvale, a small town which he deemed to be a nasty parody of all the small towns he knew. It was grotesquely noisier, dirtier, more oppressive and more irritating. He could still smell the faint stench of the midden on his clothes and in his hair. He decided to go to the bathhouse. In the bathhouse, he was annoyed by the expression of the attendant, looking at his witcher medallion at his sword, lying on the edge of the tub. He was annoyed by the fact that the attendant did not offer him a whore. He had no intention of availing himself of one, but in bathhouses everybody was offered them, so he was annoyed by the exception being made for him. When he left, smelling strongly of lye ash soap, his mood had not improved, and Aeth Gainville was no more attractive. There was still nothing there that he could find to like. The Witcher did not like the piles of sloppy manure filling the narrow streets. He did not like the beggars squatting against the wall of the temple. He did not like the crooked writing on the wall reading, Elves to the Reservation. He was not allowed to enter the castle. Instead, they sent him to speak to the mayor in the Merchant's Guild that annoyed him. He was also annoyed when the dean of the guild, an elf, ordered him to search for the mayor in the marketplace, looking at him with a curious contempt and superiority for someone who was about to be sent to a reservation. The marketplace was teeming with people. It was full of stalls, carts, wagons, horses, oxen and flies. On a platform stood a pillory with a criminal being showered by the throng in mud and dung. The criminal, with admirable composure, showered his tormentors with vile abuse, making little effort to raise his voice. For Geralt, who possessed considerable refinement, the mayor's reason for being among this clamour was absolutely clear. The visiting merchants from caravans included bribes in their prices, and thus had to give someone the bribes. The mayor, well aware of this custom, would appear to ensure that the merchants would not have to go to any trouble. The place from which he officiated was marked by a dirty blue canopy supported on poles. Beneath it stood a table besieged by vociferous applicants. 
Mayor Herbalth sat behind the table, displaying on his faded face scorn and disdain to all and sundry. Hey, where might you be going? Geralt slowly turned his head. He instantly suppressed the anger he felt inside, overcame his annoyance, and froze into a cold, hard shard of ice. He could not allow himself to become emotional. The man who stopped him had hair as yellow as oriole feathers and the same colour eyebrows over pale, empty eyes. His slim, long-fingered hands were resting on a belt made from chunky brass plates, weighed down by a sword, mace and two daggers. Ah-ha, uh -huh, the man said. I know you. The Witcher, isn't it? To see her both. Geralt nodded, watching the man's hands the whole time. He knew it would be dangerous to take his eyes off them. I've heard of you, the bane of monsters, said the yellow-haired man, also vigilantly observing Geralt's hands. Well, I don't think we've ever met. You must have heard of me. I'm Ivo Mears, but everyone calls me Cicada. The Witcher nodded to indicate he had heard of him. He also knew the price that had been offered for Cicada's head in Vitsima, Kelf and Vatvir. Had he been asked his opinion, he would have said it was a low price, but he had not been asked. Very well. Cicada said. The mayor, from what I know, is waiting for you. You may go on. But you leave your sword, friend. I'm paid here, mark you, to make sure etiquette is observed. No one is allowed to approach Herbolth with a weapon. Understood? Geralt shrugged indifferently, unfastened his belt, wrapped it around the scabbard, and handed the sword to Cicada. Cicada raised the corners of his mouth in a smile. Well, well, he said. How meek! Not a word of protest. I knew the rumours about you were exaggerated. I'd like you to ask for my sword one day, then you'd see my answer. Hi, Cicada, the mayor called, getting up. Let him through. Come here, Lord Geralt. Look lively. Greetings to you. Step aside, my dear merchants. Leave us for a moment. Your business dealings must yield to wishes of greater note for the town. Submit your entreaties to my secretary. The sham geniality of the greeting did not deceive Geralt. He knew it served exclusively as a bargaining ploy. The merchants were being given time to worry whether their bribes were sufficiently high. I'll wager Sicarda tried to provoke you, Herboth said, raising his hand nonchalantly, in response to the witch's equally nonchalant nod. Don't fret about it. Sicarda only draws his weapon when ordered to. True, it's not especially to his liking, but while I pay him, he has to obey. Ought to be out on his ear, back on the highway. Don't fret about it. Why the hell do you need someone like Cicada, Mayor? Is it so dangerous here? It's not dangerous, because I'm paying Cicada. Herbolt laughed. His fame goes before him, and that suits me well. You see, I had Ganville and the other towns in the Dogbane Valley fall under the authority of the Viceroys of Rack Varelin. And in recent times, the Viceroys have changed every season. No one knows why they keep changing, because anyway, every second one is her half-elf or quarter-elf, a cursed blood and race. Everything bad is the fault of the elves. Geralt did not add that it was also the fault of the Carters, because the joke, although well known, did not amuse everybody. Every new Viceroy, Herbolth continued in a huff begins by removing the Castellans and mayors of the old regime in order to give its friends and relations jobs. But after what Cicada once did to the emissaries of a certain viceroy, no one tries to unseat me from my position any more, and I'm the oldest mayor of the oldest regime. Uh, which one I can't even remember. Well, but we're sitting here chinwagging and we need to get on, as my late first wife was wont to say. Let's get to the point. What kind of creature had infested our muck heap? A zoigle. First time I've ever heard of anything like that. I trust it's dead. It is. How much will it cost the town treasury? Seventy? A hundred. Oh, really, witcher, sir? You must have been drinking hemlock. A hundred marks for killing a lousy worm that burrowed into a pile of shit. Worm or no worm, may It devoured eight people, as you said yourself. People? <laughs> like that. The brute, so I'm informed, ate old Zacharek, who was famous for never being sober. One old bag from up near the castle, and several children of the ferryman Sulirad, which wasn't discovered very quickly, because Sulirad himself doesn't know how many children he has. He produces them too quickly to count them. People, my hat. Eighty. 
Had I not killed the Zeugel, it would soon have devoured somebody more important. The apothecary, let us say. And then where would you get your canker ointment from? One hundred. A hundred marks is a good deal of money. I don't know if I'd give that much for a nine-headed hydra. Eighty-five. A hundred, Mayor Herbolth. Mark that, although it wasn't a nine-headed hydra, no local man, including the celebrated cicada, was capable of dealing with a Zeugel. Because no local man is accustomed to slopping around in dung and refuse. This is my last word. Ninety. A hundred. Ninety-five, by all the demons and devils. Agreed. Well, now, Herbolf said, smiling broadly. That's settled. Do you always bark in so famously, Witcher? No. Geralt did not smile. Seldom, actually. But I wanted to give you the pleasure, Mayor. And you did a box on you, Herbolf cackled. Hey, the peregrine, over here. Give me the ledger and a purse and count me out ninety marks at once. It was supposed to be ninety-five. What about the tax? The Witcher swore softly. The Mayor applied his sprawling mark to the receipt and then poked around in his ear with the clean end of the quill. I trust things will be quiet on the muck heap now, eh, Witcher? Ought to be. There was only one Zoigel, though there is a chance it managed to reproduce. Zoigels are hermaphroditic like snails. What poppycock is that? Herbolt asked, looking askance at him. You need two to reproduce. I mean, a male and a female. What, do those Zoigels hatch like fleas or mice from the rotten straw in a palliasse? Every dimwit knows that there aren't he-mice and she-mice, that they're all identical and hatch out of themselves from rotten straw. And snails hatch from wet leaves, Secretary Peregrine interjected, still busy piling up coins. Everyone knows, Geralt concurred, smiling cheerfully. There aren't he-snails and she-snails, there are only leaves, and anyone who thinks differently is mistaken. Enough, the mayor interrupted, looking at him suspiciously. I've heard enough about vermin. I asked whether anything might hatch from the muck heap, so be so gracious as to answer clearly and concisely. In a month or so, the midden ought to be inspected, ideally using dogs. Young zoigels aren't dangerous. Couldn't you do it, Witcher? We can come to an agreement about payment. No, Geralt said, taking the money from Peregrib's hands. I have no intention of being stuck in your charming town for even a week, quite less a month. Fascinating what you're telling me. Herbolf smiled wryly, looking him straight in the eye. Fascinating indeed, because I think you'll be staying here longer. You think wrong, Mayor. Really? You came here with that black-haired witch. What was it again? I forget. Uh, Guinevere, wasn't it? You'd taken lodgings with her at the Sturgeon. In a single chamber, they say. And what of it? Well... Whenever she comes to Eirgein Vale, she does not leave so quickly. It's not the first time she's been here. Peregrib smiled broadly, gap-toothed and meaningfully. Herbolt continued to look Geralt in the eye without smiling. Geralt also smiled as hideously as he could. Actually, I don't know anything. The mayor looked away and bored his heel into the ground. And it interests me as much as dog's filth. But the wizard Istrev is an important figure here, mark you. Indispensable to this municipality. Invaluable, I'd say. People hold him in high regard, locals and outsiders too. We don't stick our noses in his sorcery, and especially not in his other matters. Wisely, perhaps, the witcher agreed. And where does he live, if I may ask? You don't know? Oh, that's right there. Uh, do you see that house? Uh, that tall, white one, stuck between the storehouse and the armoury, like, if you'll pardon the expression, a candle between two arse cheeks. But you won't find him there now. Not long ago, Istred dug something up by the southern embankment and is now burrowing around there like a mole. And he's put some men to work on the excavation. I went over there and asked politely, why, master, are you digging holes like a child? Folk are beginning to laugh. What is in that ground there? And he looks at me like I'm some sort of pillock and says, history. What do you mean, history? I asks. And he goes, the history of humanity answers to questions, to the question of what there was and the question of what there will be. There was fuck all here, I says to that, except green fields, bushes and werewolves, before they built the town. And what there will be depends on who they appoint Viceroy and rank Verilin, some lousy half-elf again. And there's no history in the ground. There's nothing there except possibly worms, if someone's fond of angling. Do you think he listened? Fat chance. He's still digging. So, 
If you want to see him, go to the southern embankment. Oh, come on, Mayor, Peregrine snorted. He's at home now. Why would he want to be at the diggings when he's... Hairbolt glanced at him menacingly. Peregrib bent over and cleared his throat, shuffling his feet. The witcher, still smiling unpleasantly, crossed his arms on his chest. Yes, <laughs> the mayor coughed. Who knows, perhaps Istreth really is at home. After all, what does it... Farewell, mayor, Geralt said, not even bothering with an imitation of a bow. I wish you a good day. He went over to Cicada, who was coming out to meet him, his weapons clinking. Without a word, he held out his hand for his sword, which Cicada was holding in the crook of his elbow. Cicada stepped back. In a hurry, witcher? Yes. I've examined your sword. Geralt shot a look at him, which, with the best will in the world, could not have been described as warm. That's quite something, he nodded. Not many have, and even fewer could boast about it. Ha <laughs> ha! Cicada flashed his teeth. That sounded so menacing it'd given me the shivers. It's always interested me, Witcher, why people are so afraid of you. And now I think I know. I'm in a hurry, Cicada. Hand over the sword, if you don't mind. Smoke in the eyes, Witcher. Nothing but smoke. You witches, frighten people like a beekeeper frightens his bees with smoke and stench, with your stony faces, with all your talk and those rumours which you probably spread about yourselves. And the bees run from the smoke. Foolish things, instead of shoving their stings in the witch's arse, which will swell up like any other. They say you can't feel like people can. Well, that's lies. If one of you was properly stabbed, you'd feel it. Have you finished? Yes, Cicada said handing him back his sword. Now what interests me, witcher? Yes, bees. No. I was wondering, if you was to enter an alley with a sword from one side and me from the other, who would come out the other side? I reckon it's worth a wager. Why are you goading me, Cicada? Looking for a fight? What's it about? Nothing. It just intrigues me how much truth there is in what folks say that you're so good in a fight, you witches, because there's no art, soul, mercy or conscience in you. And that suffices, because they say the same about me, for example, and not without reason. So, I'm terribly interested which of us, after going into that alley, would come out of it alive. What? Worth a wager? What do you think? I said, I'm in a hurry. I'm not here to waste time on your nonsense, and I'm not accustomed to betting. But... If you ever decide to hinder me walking down an alley, take my advice, Cicada. Think about it first. Smoke, Cicada smiled. Smoke in the eyes, Witcher. Nothing more. To the next time. Who knows? Maybe in some alley. Who knows? Chapter 4 We'll be able to talk freely here. Sit down, Geralt. What was most conspicuous about the workshop was the impressive number of books. They took up most of the space in the large chamber. Bulky tomes filled the bookcases on the walls, weighed down shelves, and were piled high on chests and cabinets. The witcher judged that they must have cost a fortune. Of course, neither was there any shortage of other typical elements of decor. A stuffed crocodile, dried porcupine fish hanging from the ceiling, a dusty skeleton, and a huge collection of jars full of alcohol containing, it seemed, every conceivable abomination. Centipedes, spiders, serpents, toads, and also countless human and non-human parts, mainly entrails. There was even a homunculus, or something that resembled a homunculus, but might just as likely have been a smoked newborn baby. The collection made no impression on Geralt, who had lived with Yennefer in Wengerberg for six months, and Yennefer had a yet more fascinating collection, even including a phallus of exceptional proportions, allegedly that of a mountain troll. She also possessed a very expertly stuffed unicorn, on whose back she liked to make love. Geralt was of the opinion that if there existed a place less suitable for having sex, it was probably only the back of a live unicorn. Unlike him, who considered his bed a luxury, and valued all the possible uses of that marvellous piece of furniture, Yennefer was capable of being extremely extravagant. 
Geralt recalled some pleasant moments spent with the sorceress on a sloping roof, in a tree hollow full of rotten wood, on a balcony, someone else's to boot, on the railing of a bridge, in a wobbly boat on a rushing river, and levitating thirty fathoms above the earth. But the unicorn was the worst. One happy day, however, the dummy broke beneath him, split and fell apart, supplying much amusement. What amuses you so much, Witcher? Istreth asked, sitting down behind a long table, overlaid with a considerable quantity of mouldy skulls, bones, and rusty ironware. Whenever I see things like that, the Witcher said, sitting down opposite the sorcerer, pointing at the array of jars, I wonder whether you really can't make magic without all that stomach-turning gasoliness. It's a matter of taste, the sorcerer said, and also of habit. What disgusts one person somehow doesn't bother another. And what, Geralt, repels you? I wonder what might disgust someone who, as I've heard, is capable of standing up to his neck in dung and filth. Please do not treat that question as insulting or provocative. I am genuinely fascinated to learn what might trigger a feeling of repugnance in a witcher. Does this jar, by any chance, contain the menstrual blood of an undefiled virgin, Istreth? Well, it disgusts me when I picture you, a serious sorcerer, with a file in your hand, trying to obtain that precious liquid, drop by drop, kneeling, so to speak, at the very source. Touché, Istreth said, smiling. I refer, naturally, to your cutting wit because as regards the jar's contents, you were wide of the mark. But you do use blood occasionally, don't you? You can't even contemplate some spells I've heard without the blood of a virgin, ideally one killed by a lightning bolt from a clear sky during a full moon. In what way, one wonders, is that blood better than that of an old strumpet who fell drunk from a palisade? In no way, the sorcerer agreed, a pleasant smile playing on his lips. But if it became common knowledge that that role could actually be played just as easily by hog's blood, which is much easier to obtain, then the rabble would begin experimenting with spells. But if it means the rabble having to gather and use virgin's blood, dragon's tears, white tarantula's venom, decoction of severed babies' hands, or a corpse exhumed at midnight, many would think again. They were silent. Istrith, apparently deep in thought, tapped his fingernails on a cracked, browned skull, which lacked its lower jaw, and ran his index finger over the serrated edge of a hole gaping in the temporal bone. Geralt observed him unobtrusively. He wondered how old the sorcerer might be. He knew that the more talented among them were capable of curbing the aging process permanently, and at any age they chose. Men preferred a mature age, suggesting knowledge and experience, for reasons of reputation and prestige. Women, like Yennefer, were concerned less with prestige and more with attractiveness. Istred looked no older than a well-earned, robust forty. He had straight, slightly grizzled, shoulder-length hair and numerous wrinkles on his forehead, around his mouth and at the corners of his eyelids. Geralt did not know whether the profundity and wisdom in his benign grey eyes were natural or brought on by charms. A moment later, he concluded that it made no difference. Istred. He interrupted the awkward silence. I came here because I wanted to see Yennefer. Even though she isn't here, you invited me inside. To talk. About what? About the rabble trying to break your monopoly on the use of magic. I know you include me among that rabble. That's nothing new to me. For a while I had the impression you would turn out to be different to confrères, who have often entered into serious conversations with me, in order just to inform me that they don't like me. I have no intention of apologising to you for my, as you call them, confrères. The sorcerer answered calmly. I understand them, for, just like them, in order to gain any level of proficiency at sorcery, I had to apply myself seriously. While still a mere stripling, when my peers were running around fields with bows, fishing or playing odds and evens, I was poring over manuscripts. My bones and joints ached from the stone floor in the tower. In the summer, of course, because in the winter the enamel on my teeth cracked. I would cough from the dust on old scrolls and books until my eyes bulged from their sockets, and my master, old Rodeskilde, never passed up an opportunity to flog me with a knout, clearly believing that without it I would not achieve satisfactory progress in my studies. I didn't enjoy soldiering or wenching or drinking during the years when all those pleasures taste the best. Poor thing. 
the Witcher grimaced. Indeed, it brings a tear to my eye. Why the sarcasm? I'm trying to explain why sorcerers aren't fond of village quacks, charmers, healers, wise women, and witches. Call it what you will, even simple envy. But here lies the cause of the animosity. It annoys us when we see magic, a craft we were taught to treat as an elite art, a privilege of the few and a sacred mystery, in the hands of laymen and dilettantes. Even if it is shoddy, pitiable, derisory magic. That is why my confrères don't like you. Incidentally, I don't like you either. Geralt had had enough of the discussion, of pussyfooting around, of the feeling of anxiety which was crawling over the nape of his neck and his back like a snail. He looked straight into Istreth's eyes and gripped the edge of the table. It's about Yennefer, isn't it? The sorcerer lifted his head, but continued to tap the skull on the table with his fingernails. I commend your perspicacity, he said, steadily returning the witch's gaze. My congratulations. Yes, it's about Yennefer. Geralt was silent. Once, years ago, many, many years ago, as a young witcher, he had been waiting to ambush a manticore, and he sensed the manticore approaching. He did not see or hear it. He sensed it. He had never forgotten that feeling, and now he felt exactly the same. Your perspicacity, the sorcerer went on, will save us a great deal of the time we would have wasted on further fudging, and this way the issue is out in the open. Geralt did not comment. My close acquaintance with Yennefer, Istreth continued, goes back a long way, Witcher. For a long time it was an acquaintance without commitment based on longer or shorter, more or less regular periods of time together. This kind of non-committal partnership is widely practiced among members of our profession. It's just that it suddenly stopped suiting me. I determined to propose to her that she remain with me permanently. How did she respond? That she would think it over. I gave her time to do so. I know it is not an easy decision for her. Why are you telling me this, Istreth? What drives you, apart from this admirable but astonishing candour, so rarely seen among members of your profession? What lies behind it? Prosaicness, the sorcerer sighed. For you see, your presence hinders Yennefer in making a decision. I thus request you to remove yourself, to vanish from her life, to stop interfering. In short, that you get the hell out of here, ideally quietly and without saying goodbye, which, as she confided in me, you are wont to do. Indeed. Geralt smiled affectedly. Your blunt sincerity astonishes me more and more. I might have expected anything but not such a request. Don't you think that instead of asking me, you ought rather to leap out and blast me with ball lightning? You'd be rid of the obstacle and there'd be just a little soot to scrape off the wall. An easier and more reliable method. Because, you see, a request can be declined, but ball lightning can't be. I do not countenance the possibility of your refusing. Why not? Would this strange request be nothing but a warning preceding the lightning bolt, or some other cheerful spell? Or is this request to be supported by some weighty arguments? Or a sum which would stupefy an avaricious witcher? How much do you intend to pay me to get out of the path leading to your happiness? The sorcerer stopped tapping the skull, placed his hand on it, and clenched his fingers around it. Geralt noticed his knuckles whitening. I did not mean to insult you with an offer of that kind, he said. I had no intention of doing so, but if... Geralt, I am a sorcerer, and not the worst. I wouldn't dream of feigning omnipotence here, but I could grant many of your wishes should you wish to voice them some of them as easily as this. He waved a hand, carelessly, as though chasing away a mosquito. The space above the table suddenly teemed with fabulously coloured Apollo butterflies. My wish, Istreth, the witcher drawled, shooing away the insects fluttering in front of his face, is for you to stop pushing in between me and Yennefer. I don't care much about the propositions you're offering her. 
You could have proposed to her when she was with you, long ago. Because then was then, and now is now. Now she is with me. You want me to get out of the way, make things easy for you? I decline. Not only will I not help you, but I'll hinder you, as well as my modest abilities allow. As you see, I'm your equal in candour. You have no right to refuse me, not you. What do you take me for, Isdreth? The sorcerer looked him in the eye and leaned across the table. A fleeting romance? A passing fascination, at best a whim, an adventure, of which Yenna has had hundreds, because Yenna loves to play with emotions. She's impulsive and unpredictable in her whims. That's what I take you for. Since, having exchanged a few words with you, I've rejected the theory that she treats you entirely as an object. And believe me, that happens with her quite often. You misunderstood the question. You're mistaken. I didn't. But I'm intentionally talking solely about Yenna's emotions. For you are a witcher, and you cannot experience any emotions. You do not want to agree to my request because you think she matters to you. You think she... <laughs> Geralt, you're only with her because she wants it, and you'll only be with her as long as she wants it. And what you feel is a projection of her emotions, the interest she shows in you. By all the demons of the netherworld, Geralt, you aren't a child. You know what you are. You're a mutant. Don't understand me wrongly. I don't say it to insult you or show you contempt. I merely state a fact. You're a mutant, and one of the basic traits of your mutation is utter insensitivity to emotions. You are created like that in order to do your job. Do you understand? You cannot feel anything. What you take for emotion is cellular, somatic memory, if you know what those words mean. It so happens I do. All the better. Then listen. I'm asking you for something which I can ask of a witcher, but which I couldn't ask of a man. I am being frank with a witcher. With a man, I couldn't afford to be frank. Geralt, I want to give Yenna understanding and stability, affection and happiness. Could you, hand on heart, pledge the same? No, you couldn't. Those are meaningless words to you. You trail after Yenna like a child, enjoying the momentary affection she shows you. Like a stray cat that everyone throws stones at, you purr, contented, because here is someone who's not afraid to stroke you. Do you understand what I mean? Oh, I know you understand. You want a fool, that's plain. You see yourself that you have no right to refuse me if I ask politely. I have the same right to refuse as you have to ask, Geralt drawled, and in the process they cancel each other out. So, we return to the starting point, and that point is this. Yen, clearly not caring about my mutation and its consequences, is with me right now. You proposed to her. That's your right. She said she'd think it over. That's her right. Do you have the impression I'm hindering her in taking a decision? That she's hesitating? That I'm the cause of her hesitation? Well, that's my right. If she's hesitating, she clearly has reason for doing so. I must be giving her something, though perhaps the word is absent from the witch dictionary. Listen, no, you listen to me. She used to be with you, you say. Who knows? Perhaps it wasn't me, but you who was the fleeting romance, a caprice, a victim of those uncontrolled emotions so typical of her. Isreth, I cannot even rule out her treatment of you as completely objectionable. That, my dear sorcerer, cannot be ruled out just on the basis of a conversation. In this case, it seems to me, the object may be more relevant than eloquence. Isreth did not even flinch. He did not even clench his jaw. Geralt admired his self-control. Nonetheless, the lengthening silence seemed to indicate that the blow had struck home. You're playing with words, the sorcerer said finally. You're becoming intoxicated with them. You try to substitute words for normal human feelings which you do not have. Your words don't express feelings, they are only sounds, like those that skull emits when you tap it. For you are just as empty as this skull. You have no right. Enough! Geralt interrupted harshly, perhaps even a little too harshly. Stop stubbornly denying me rights. I've had enough of it, do you hear? I told you, our rights are equal. No, damn it, mine are greater. Really? The sorcerer said. 
paling somewhat, which caused Geralt unspeakable pleasure. For what reason? The Witcher wondered for a moment and decided to finish him off. For the reason, he shot back, that last night she made love with me and not with you. Istrev pulled the skull closer to himself and stroked it. His hand, to Geralt's dismay, did not even twitch. Does that, in your opinion, give you any rights? Only one. The right to draw a few conclusions. Ah, the sorcerer said slowly. Very well. As you wish. She made love with me this morning. Draw your own conclusions. You have the right. I already have. The silence lasted a long time. Geralt desperately searched for words. He found none. None at all. This conversation is pointless, he finally said, getting up, angry at himself because it sounded blunt and stupid. I'm going. Go to hell, Istreth said equally bluntly, not looking at him. Chapter 5 when she entered, he was lying on the bed fully dressed, with his hands under his head. He pretended to be looking at the ceiling. He looked at her. Yennefer slowly closed the door behind her. She was ravishing. How ravishing she is, he thought. Everything about her is ravishing and menacing. Those colours of hers, that contrast of black and white, beauty and menace. Her raven black, natural curls. Her cheekbones pronounced, emphasising a wrinkle which her smile, if she deigned to smile, created beside her mouth, wonderfully narrow and pale beneath her lipstick. Her eyebrows, wonderfully irregular when she washed off the coal that outlined them during the day. Her nose, exquisitely too long, her delicate hands, wonderfully nervous, restless and adroit. Her waist, willowy and slender, emphasised by an excessively tightened belt, slim legs setting in motion the flowing shapes of her black skirt. Ravishing. She sat down at the table without a word, resting her chin on clasped hands. Very well, let's begin, she said. This growing dramatic silence is too banal for me. Let's sort this out. Get out of bed and stop staring at the ceiling, looking upset. The situation is idiotic enough, and there's no point making it any more idiotic. Get up, I said. He got up obediently, without hesitation, and sat astride the stool opposite her. She did not avoid his gaze. He might have expected that. As I said, let's sort it out and sort it out quickly. In order not to put you in an awkward situation, I'll answer any questions at once. You don't even have to ask them. Yes, it's true that when I came with you to Ayr Gainvale, I was coming to meet Istreth, and I knew I would go to bed with him. I didn't expect it to come out that you'd boast about it to each other. I know how you feel now, and I'm sorry about that, but no, I don't feel guilty. He said nothing. Yennefer shook her head, her shining black locks cascading from her shoulders. Geralt, say something. He... The witcher cleared his throat. He calls you Yenna. Yes, she said, not lowering her eyes. And I call him Val. It's his first name. Istreth is a nickname. I've known him for years. He's very dear to me. Don't look at me like that. You're also dear to me, and that's the whole problem. Are you considering accepting his proposal? For your information, I am. I told you, we've known each other for years, for many years. We share common interests, goals and ambitions. We understand each other wordlessly. He can give me support and, who knows, perhaps there'll come a day when I'll need it. And above all, he, he loves me, I think. I won't stand in your way yet. She tossed her head, and her violet eyes flashed with blue fire. In my way? Don't you understand anything, you idiot? 
If you'd been in my way, if you were bothering me, I'd have got rid of the obstacle in the blink of an eye. I'd have teleported you to the end of Cape Bremervold or transported you to the land of Han in a whirlwind. With a bit of effort, I'd have embedded you in a piece of quartz and put you in the garden in a bed of peonies. I could have purged your brain such that you would have forgotten who I was and what my name was. I could have done all that had I felt like it. But I could also have simply said, it was agreeable, farewell. I could have quietly taken flight, as you once did, when you fled my house in Wengerberg. Don't shout, Yen. Don't be aggressive, and don't drag up that story from Wengerberg. We swore not to go back to it, after all. I don't bear a grudge against you, Yen. I'm not reproaching you, am I? I know you can't be judged by ordinary standards, and the fact that I'm saddened, the fact that I know I'm losing you, is cellular memory. The atavistic remnants of feelings in a mutant purged of emotion. I can't stand it when you talk like that, she exploded. I can't bear it when you use that word. Don't ever use it again in my presence. Never. Does it change the fact? After all, I am a mutant. There is no fact. Don't Utter that word in front of me. The black kestrel sitting on the stag's antlers flapped its wings and scratched the perch with its talons. Geralt glanced at the bird, at its motionless yellow eye. Once again, Yennefer rested her chin on clasped hands. Yen. Yes, Geralt. You promised to answer my questions. Questions I don't even have to ask. One remains, the most important, the one I've never asked you, which I've been afraid to ask. Answer it. I'm incapable of it, Geralt, she said firmly. I don't believe you yet. I know you too well. No one can know a sorceress well. Answer my question, Yen. My answer is... I don't know. But what kind of answer is that? They were silent. The din from the street had diminished, calmed down. The sun, setting in the west, blazed through the slits of the shutters and pierced the chamber with slanting beams of light. I have gone veil, the witcher muttered. A shard of ice. I felt it. I knew this town was hostile to me, evil. I have gone fail, she repeated slowly. The sleigh of the elf queen. Why? Why, Geralt? I'm travelling with you, Yen, because the harness of my sleigh got entangled, caught up in your runners. And a blizzard is all around me, and a frost. It's cold. Warmth would melt the shard of ice in you, the shard I stabbed you with, she whispered. Then the spell would be broken, and you would see me as I really am. Then lash your white horses, Yen. May they race north where a thaw never sets in. I hope it never sets in. I want to get to your ice castle as quickly as I can. That castle doesn't exist, Yennefer said, her mouth twitching. She grimaced. It's a symbol. And our sleigh ride is the pursuit of a dream which is unattainable. For I, the elf queen, desire warmth. That is my secret. Which is why every year my sleigh carries me amidst a blizzard through some little town, and every year someone dazzled by my spell gets their harness caught in my runners. Every year. Every year someone knew. Endlessly, because the warmth I so desire at the same time blights the spell, blights the magic and the charm. My sweetheart, stabbed with that little icy star, suddenly becomes an ordinary nobody, and I become, in his thawed-out eyes, no better than all the other mortal women. And from under the unblemished whiteness emerges spring, he said, emerges Ierdgain Vale, an ugly little town with a beautiful name. Ierdgain Vale and its muckheap, 
that enormous stinking pile of garbage which I have to enter because they pay me to, because I was created to enter filth which fills other people with disgust and revulsion. I was deprived of the ability to feel, so I wouldn't be able to feel how dreadfully vile is that vileness, so I wouldn't retreat from it, wouldn't run horror-stricken from it. Yes, I was stripped of feelings. But not utterly. Whoever did it made a botch of it yet. They were silent. The black kestrel rustled its feathers, unfurling and folding its wings. Gerald? Yes, Yen. Now you answer my question. The question I've never asked you. The one I've always feared. I won't ask you it this time either, but answer it. Because because I greatly desire to hear your answer. It's the one word, the only word you've never told me. Utter it, Geralt. Please. I cannot yet. Why not? You don't know. He smiled sadly. My answer would just be a word. A word which doesn't express a feeling, doesn't express an emotion, because I'm bereft of them. A word which will be nothing but the sound made when you strike a cold, empty skull. She looked at him in silence. Her eyes, wide open, assumed an ardent violet colour. No, Geralt, she said. That's not the truth. Or perhaps it is, but not the whole truth. You aren't bereft of feeling. Now I see it. Now I know you. She was silent. Complete the sentence yet. You decided. Don't lie. I know you. I can see it in your eyes. She did not lower her eyes. He knew. Yen, he whispered. Give me your hand she said. She took his hand between hers, and at once he felt a tingling and the pulsing of blood in the veins of his forearm. Yennefer whispered a spell in a serene, measured voice, but he saw the beads of sweat which the effort caused to stipple her pale forehead, saw her pupils dilate in pain. Releasing his arm, she extended her hands and moved them, smoothing an invisible shape with tender strokes, slowly from top to bottom. The air between her fingers began to congeal and become turbid, swell and pulsate like smoke. He watched in fascination. Creational magic, considered the most elevated accomplishment among sorcerers, always fascinated him, much more than illusions or transformational magic. Yes, Ystred was right, he thought. In comparison with this kind of magic, my signs just look ridiculous. The form of a bird, as black as coal, slowly materialised between Yennefer's hands, which were trembling with effort. The sorceress's fingers gently stroked the ruffled feathers, the small, flattened head and curved beak. One more hypnotically fluid, delicate movement, and a black kestrel, turning its head, cried loudly. Its twin, still sitting motionless on the antlers, gave an answering cry. Two. Kestrels, Geralt said softly. Two black kestrels created by magic. I presume you need them both. You presume right, she said with effort. I need them both. I was wrong to believe one would suffice. How wrong I was, Geralt. To what an error the vanity of the Ice Queen, convinced of her omnipotence, has brought me. For there are some things which there is no way of obtaining, even by magic. And there are gifts which may not be accepted if one is unable to reciprocate them with something equally precious. Otherwise such a gift will slip through the fingers, melt like a shard of ice gripped in the hand. Then only regret, the sense of loss and hurt will remain. Yen, I am the sorceress, Galt. 
The power over matter which I possess is a gift, a reciprocated gift. For it I paid with everything I possessed. Nothing remained. He said nothing. The sorceress wiped her forehead with a trembling hand. I was mistaken, she repeated. But I shall correct my mistake. Emotions and feelings. She touched the black kestrel's head. The bird fluffed up its feathers and silently opened its curved beak. Emotions, whims and lies, fascinations and games, feelings and their absence, gifts which may not be accepted, lies and truth. What is truth? The negation of lies? Or the statement of a fact? And if the fact is a lie, what then is the truth? Who is full of feelings which torment him, and who is the empty carapace of a cold skull? Who? What is truth, Geralt? What is the essence of truth? I don't know, Yen. Tell me. No, she said, and lowered her eyes for the first time. He had never seen her do that before. Never. No, she repeated. I cannot, Geralt. I cannot tell you that. That bird, begotten from the touch of your hand, will tell you. Bird, what is the essence of truth? Truth, the kestrel said, is a shard of ice. Chapter 6 Although it seemed to him he was roaming the streets aimlessly and purposelessly, he suddenly found himself at the southern wall by the excavations, among the network of trenches crisscrossing the ruins by the stone wall and wandering in zigzags among the exposed squares of ancient foundations. Istreth was there, dressed in a smock with rolled-up sleeves and high boots. He was shouting instructions to his servants, who were digging with hose into the coloured stripes of earth, clay and charcoal, which made up the walls of the excavation. Alongside, on planks, lay blackened bones, shards of pots and other objects, unidentifiable, corroded and gnarled into rusty lumps. The sorcerer noticed him immediately. After giving the workers some loud instructions, he jumped out of the trench and walked over, wiping his hands on his breeches. Yes, what is it? he asked bluntly. The witcher, standing in front of him without moving, did not answer. The servants, pretending to work, watched them attentively whispering among themselves. You're almost bursting with hatred. Istreth grimaced. What is it? I asked. Have you decided? Where's Yenna? I hope she... Don't hope too much, Istreth. Oh, ho, the sorcerer said. What do I hear in your voice? Is it what I sense it is? And what is it you sense? Istreth placed his fists on his hips and looked at the witcher provocatively. Let's not deceive ourselves, Geralt, he said. I hate you, and you hate me. You insulted me by saying that Yennefer... You know what? I came back with a similar insult. You're in my way, and I'm in your way. Let's solve this like men. I don't see any other solution. That's why you've come here, isn't it? Yes, Geralt said, rubbing his forehead. That's right, Istreth. That's why I came here, undeniably. Indeed. It cannot go on like this. Only today did I learn that for several years Yenna has been circulating between us like a rag ball. First she's with me, then she's with you. She runs from me to look for you, then the other way round. The others she's with during the breaks don't count. Only we two count. This can't go on. There are two of us, but only one can remain. Yes, Geralt repeated, without removing his hand from his forehead. Yes, you're right. In our conceit, the sorcerer continued, we thought that Yenna would, without hesitation, choose the better man. Neither of us was in any doubt as to who that was. In the end, we started to argue over her favours like whipsters, and like foolish whipsters understood what those favours were and what they meant. I suppose that, like me, you thought it through and know how mistaken the two of us were. Yenna, Geralt, hasn't the slightest intention of choosing between us, were we even to assume she's capable of choosing. Well, 
we'll have to decide for her, for I wouldn't dream of sharing Yenna with anyone, and the fact that you're here says the same about you. We, Geralt, simply know her too well. While there are two of us, neither of us can be certain. There can only be one. That's the truth, isn't it? It is, the Witcher said, moving his numb lips with difficulty. The truth is a sure device. What? Nothing. What's the matter with you? Are you infirm or in your cups? Or perhaps stuffed full of Witcher herbs? There's nothing wrong with me. I've... I've got something in my eye. Istred, there can only be one. Yes, that's why I came here, undeniably. I knew, the sorcerer said. I knew you'd come. As a matter of fact, I'm going to be frank with you. You anticipated my plans. Ball lightning? The witcher asked, smiling wanly. Istred frowned. Perhaps, he said. Perhaps there'll be ball lightning, but definitely not shot from around the corner. Honorably, face to face, you're a witcher, that evens things out. Very well, decide when and where. Geralt pondered and decided. That little square, he pointed. I passed through it, I know. There's a well there called the Green Key. By the well, then. Yes, indeed. By the well. Tomorrow. Two hours after sunup. Very well. I shall be on time. They stood still for a moment, not looking at each other. The sorcerer finally muttered something to himself, kicked a lump of clay and crushed it under his heel. Geralt? What? Do you feel foolish by any chance? Yes, I do, the witcher reluctantly admitted. That's a relief. Eastreth muttered, because I feel like an utter dolt. I never expected I'd ever have to fight a witcher to the death over a woman. I know how you feel, Eastreth. Well, the sorcerer smiled affectedly. The fact that it's come to this, that I've decided to do something so utterly against my nature, proves that... that it has to be done. I know, Eastreth. Needless to say, you know that whichever of us survives will have to flee at once and hide from Yenna at the end of the world. I do. And needless to say, you count on being able to go back to her when she simmers down. Of course. It's all settled then, the sorcerer said, and made to turn away, but after a moment's hesitation, held out his hand to him. Till tomorrow, Geralt. Till tomorrow, the witcher said, shaking his hand. Till tomorrow, Eastreth. Chapter 7 Hey, Witcher! Geralt looked up from the table, on which he had been absent-mindedly sketching fanciful squiggles in the spilled beer. It was hard to find you, Mayor Herbolth said, sitting down and moving aside the jugs and beer mugs. They said in the inn that you'd moved out to the stables, but I found only a horse and some bundles of clothes there. And you're here. This is probably the most disreputable inn in the entire town. Only the worst scum comes here. What are you doing? Drinking. I can see that. I wanted to converse with you. Are you sober? As a child. I'm pleased. What is it you want here, both? As you can see, I'm busy. Geralt smiled at the wench who was putting another jug on the table. There's a rumour doing the rounds, the mayor said, frowning, that you and our sorcerer plan to kill each other. That's our business. His and mine. Don't interfere. No, it isn't your business, Herbolth countered. We need Eastreth. We can't afford another sorcerer. Go to the temple and pray for his victory, then. Don't scoff, the mayor snapped, and don't be a smart ass, you vagrant. By the gods, if I didn't know that the sorcerer would never forgive me, I would have thrown you into the dungeons, right at the very bottom, or dragged you beyond the town behind two horses, or ordered Cicada to stick you like a pig. But alas, Eastreth has a thing about honour and wouldn't have excused me it. I know you wouldn't forgive me either. It's turned out marvellously, the witcher said, draining another mug and spitting out a straw which had fallen into it. I'm a lucky fellow, am I? Is that all? No, Herbolf said, taking a full purse out from under his coat. Here is a hundred marks, witcher. Take it and get out of Aelgain Vale. 
Get out of here, at once, if possible, but in any case, before sunrise. I told you, we can't afford another sorcerer, and I won't let ours risk his neck in a duel with someone like you for a stupid reason, because of some... He broke off without finishing, although the Witcher did not even flinch. Take your hideous face away, Herbolf, Geralt said, and stick your hundred marks up your arse. Go away, because the sight of you makes me sick. A little longer, and I'll cover you in puke from your cap to your toes. The mayor put away the purse and put both hands on the table. If that's how you want it, he said, I tried to let you leave of your own free will, but it's up to you. Fight, cut each other up, burn each other, tear each other to pieces for that slut who spreads a length for anyone who wants her. I think Eastred will give you such a thrashing, you thug, that only your boots will be left, and if not, I'll catch you before his body cools off and break all your bones on the wheel. I won't leave a single part of you intact, you... He did not manage to remove his hands from the table. The witch's movement was so swift. The arm which shot out from under the table was a blur in front of the mayor's eyes, and a dagger lodged with a thud between his fingers. Perhaps, the witcher whispered, clenching his fist on the dagger's haft and staring into Herbolt's face, from which the blood had drained. Perhaps Eastraith will kill me, but if not, then I'll leave, and don't try to stop me, you vile scum, if you don't want the streets of your filthy town to form with blood. Now get out of here. Mayor, what's going on here? Hi, you. Calm down, Cicada, Herbolt said, slowly withdrawing his hand cautiously sliding it across the table as far as possible from the dagger's blade. It's nothing, nothing. Cicada returned his half-drawn sword to its scabbard. Geralt did not look at him. He did not look at the mare as he left the inn, shielded by Cicada from the staggering log drivers and carters. A small man with a ratty face and piercing black eyes sitting a few tables away was watching him. I'm annoyed, he realised in amazement. My hands are trembling. Really? My hands are trembling. It's astonishing what's happening to me. Could it mean that? Yes, he thought, looking at the little man with the ratty face. I think so. I'll have to, he thought. How cold it is. He got up. He smiled as he looked at the small man. Then he drew aside the front of his jacket, took two coins from the full purse and threw them on the table. The coins clinked. One of them rolled across the table and struck the dagger's blade, still stuck into the polished wood. Chapter 8 The blow fell unexpectedly. The club swished softly in the darkness, so fast that the witcher only just managed to protect his head by instinctively raising an arm, and only just managed to cushion the blow by lithely twisting his body. He sprang aside, dropping on one knee. Somersaulted, landed on his feet, felt a movement of the air yielding before another swing of the club, evaded the blow with a nimble pirouette, spinning between the two shapes closing in on him in the dark, and reached above his right shoulder for his sword. His sword was not there. Nothing can take these reactions from me, he thought, leaping smoothly aside. Routine, cellular memory. I'm a mutant. I react like a mutant, he thought dropping to one knee again, dodging a blow and reaching into his boot for his dagger. There was no dagger. He smiled wryly and was hit on the head with a club. A light blazed in his eyes and the pain shot down to his fingertips. He fell, relaxing, still smiling. Somebody flopped onto him, pressing him against the ground. Somebody else ripped the purse from his belt. His eye caught sight of a knife flashing. The one, kneeling on his chest, tore open his jerkin at the neck, seized the chain and pulled out his medallion, and immediately let go of it. By Baal Zeboth, Geralt heard somebody pant. It's a witcher, a real bruiser. The other swore, breathing heavily. He didn't have a sword. Oh, gods, save us from the evil. Let's scarp a Radgast. Don't touch him. For a moment, the moon shone through a wispy cloud. Geralt saw, just above him, a gaunt, ratty face and small, black, shining eyes. He heard the other man's loud footsteps fading away, vanishing into an alleyway reeking of cats and burnt fat. The small man with the ratty face slowly removed his knee from Geralt's chest. Next time, 
Geralt heard the clear whisper. Next time you feel like killing yourself, Witcher, don't drag other people into it. Just hang yourself in the stable from your reins. Chapter 9 It must have rained during the night. Geralt walked out in front of the stable, wiping his eyes, combing the straw from his hair with his fingers. The rising sun glistened on the wet roofs, gleamed gold in the puddles. The witcher spat. He still had a nasty taste in his mouth, and the lump on his head throbbed with a dull ache. A scrawny black cat sat on a rail in front of the stable, licking a paw intently. Here, yeah, kitty, kitty, the witcher said. The cat stopped what it was doing and looked at him malevolently, flattened its ears and hissed, baring its little fangs. I know, Geralt nodded. I don't like you either. I'm only joking. He pulled tight the loosened buckles and clasps of his jerkin with unhurried movements, smoothed down the creases in his clothing, and made sure it did not hinder his freedom of movement at any point. He slung his sword across his back and adjusted the position of the hilt above his right shoulder. He tied a leather band around his forehead, pulling his hair back behind his ears. He pulled on long combat gloves, bristling with short conical silver spikes. He glanced up at the sun once more, his pupils narrowing into vertical slits. A glorious day, he thought. A glorious day for a fight. He sighed, spat, and walked slowly down the narrow road, beside walls giving off the pungent, penetrating aroma of wet plaster and lime mortar. Hey, freak! He looked around. Cicada, flanked by three suspicious-looking armed individuals, sat on a heap of timbers piled up beside the embankment. He rose, stretched, and walked into the middle of the alley, carefully avoiding the puddles. Where are you going? he asked, placing his slender hands on his belt, weighed down with weapons. None of your business. Just to be clear, I don't give a tinker's cuss about the mayor, the sorcerer, or this whole shitty town, Cicada said, slowly emphasising the words. This is about you, witcher. You won't make it to the end of this alley. Hear me? I want to find out how good a fighter you are. The matter's tormenting me. Stop, I said. Get out of my way. Stop, Cicada yelled, placing a hand on his sword hilt. Didn't you hear what I said? We're going to fight. I'm challenging you. We'll soon see who's the better man. Geralt shrugged without slowing down. I'm challenging you to fight. Do you hear me, mutant? Cicada shouted, barring his way again. What are you waiting for? Draw your weapon. What? Got cold feet? Or perhaps you're nothing more than one of those other fools who's humping that witch of yours, like Eastred. Geralt walked on, forcing Cicada to retreat, to walk clumsily backwards. The individuals with Cicada got up from the pile of timbers and followed them, although they hung back a little way off. Geralt heard the mud squelching beneath their boots. I challenge you, Cicada repeated, blanching and flushing by turns. Do you hear me, you witcher pox? What else do I have to do to you? Spit in your ugly face? Go ahead and spit. Cicada stopped and indeed took a breath, pursing his lips to spit. He was watching the witcher's eyes, not his hands, and that was a mistake. Geralt, still not slowing down, struck him very fast without a backswing just flexing from the knees, his fist encased in the spiked glove. He punched Cicada right in the mouth, straight in his twisted lips. They split, exploding like mashed cherries. The witcher crouched and struck once again in the same place, this time from a short backswing, feeling the fury spilling from him with the force and the momentum. Cicada, whirling around with one foot in the mud and the other in the air, spat blood and splashed onto his back into a puddle. The witcher, Hearing behind him the hiss of a sword blade in the scabbard, stopped and turned sinuously around, his hand on his sword hilt. Well, he said in a voice trembling with anger, be my guests. The one who had drawn the sword looked him in the eyes, briefly. Then he averted his gaze. The others began to fall back, first slowly, then more and more quickly. Hearing it, the man with the sword also stepped back, noiselessly moving his lips. 
the furthest away of them, turned and ran, splattering mud. The others froze to the spot, not attempting to come closer. Cicada turned over in the mud and dragged himself up on his elbows. He mumbled, hawked, and spat out something white amid a lot of red. As Geralt passed, he casually kicked him in the face, shattering his cheekbone and sending him splashing into the puddle again. He walked on without looking back. Istred was already by the well and stood leaning against it, against the wooden cover, green with moss. He had a sword in his belt, a magnificent light Turganian sword with a half-basket hilt, the metal-fitted end of the scabbard resting against the shining leg of a riding boot. A black bird with ruffled feathers sat on the sorcerer's shoulder. It was a kestrel. You're here, witcher, Istred said proffering the kestrel a gloved hand, and gently and cautiously setting the bird down on the canopy of the well. Yes, I am, Istreth. I hadn't expected you to come. I thought you'd leave town. I didn't. The sorcerer laughed loudly and freely, throwing his head back. She wanted. She wanted to save us, he said. Both of us. Never mind, Geralt. Let's cross swords. Only one of us can remain. Do you mean to fight with a sword? Does that surprise you? After all you do. Come on, have at you. Why, Istreth? Why with swords and not with magic? The sorcerer blanched, and his mouth twitched anxiously. Have at you, I said, he shouted. This is not the time for questions. That time has passed. Now is the time for deeds. I want to know. Geralt said slowly. I want to know why, with swords. I want to know why you have a black kestrel and where it came from. I have the right to know. I have the right to know the truth, Istreth. The truth? The sorcerer repeated bitterly. Yes, perhaps you have. Perhaps you have. Our rights are equal. The kestrel, you ask? <laughs> it came at dawn, wet from the rain. It brought a letter. A very short one, I know it by heart. Farewell, Val, forgive me. There are gifts which one may not accept, and there is nothing in me I could repay you with. And that is the truth, Val. Truth is a shard of ice. Well, Geralt, are you satisfied? Have you availed yourself of your right? The Witcher slowly nodded. Good, Istreth said. Now I shall avail myself of mine because I don't acknowledge that letter. Without her, I cannot... I prefer to... Have at you, damn it! He crouched over and drew his sword with a swift, lithe movement, demonstrating his expertise. The kestrel cried. The witcher stood motionless, his arms hanging at his sides. What are you waiting for? The sorcerer barked. Geralt slowly raised his head, looked at him for a moment, and then turned on his heel. No, Istreth, he said quietly. Farewell. What do you bloody mean? Geralt stopped. Istreth, he said over his shoulder, don't drag other people into your suicide. If you must, hang yourself in the stable from your reins. Geralt, the sorcerer screamed, and his voice suddenly cracked jarring the ear with a false wrong note. I'm not giving up. She won't run away from me. I'll follow her to Wengerberg. I'll follow her to the end of the world. I'll find her. I'll never give her up. Know that. Farewell, Istreth. He walked off into the alley without turning back at all. He walked, paying no attention to the people quickly getting out of his way, or to the hurried slamming of doors and shutters. He did not notice any body or anything. He was thinking about the letter waiting for him in the inn. He speeded up. He knew that a black kestrel, wet from the rain, holding a letter in its curved beak, was waiting for him on the bedhead. He wanted to read the letter as soon as possible, even though he knew what was in it. Eternal Flame Chapter 1
You pig. You plague-stricken warbler, you trickster. Geralt, his interest piqued, led his mare around the corner of the alleyway. Before he located the source of the screams, a deep, stickily glassy clink joined them. A large jar of cherry preserve, thought the witcher. A jar of cherry preserve makes that noise when you throw it at somebody from a great height or with great force. He remembered it well. When he lived with Yennefer, she would occasionally throw jars of preserve at him in anger. Jars she had received from clients. Yennefer had no idea how to make preserve. Her magic was fallible in that respect. A large group of onlookers had formed around the corner, outside a narrow, pink-painted cottage. A young, fair-haired woman in a nightdress was standing on a tiny balcony decorated with flowers just beneath the steep eaves of the roof. Bending a plump, fleshy arm visible beneath the frills of her nightdress, the woman hurled down a chipped flower pot. A slim man in a plum bonnet with a white feather jumped aside like a scalded cat, and the flower pot crashed onto the ground just in front of him, shattering into pieces. Please, Vespula, the man in the bonnet shouted. Don't lend credence to the gossip. I was faithful to you. May I perish if it is not true? You bastard, you son of the devil, you wretch! The plump blonde yelled and went back into the house, no doubt in search of further missiles. Hey, Dandelion, called the witcher, leading his resisting and snorting mare onto the battlefield. How are you? What's going on? Nothing special, said the troubadour, grinning. The usual. Greetings, Geralt. What are you doing here? Oh, bloody hell, look out! A tin cup whistled through the air and bounced off the cobbles with a clang. Dandelion picked it up, looked at it, and threw it in the gutter. Take those rags, the blonde woman screamed, the frills on her plump breasts swaying gracefully. And get out of my sight! Don't set foot here again, you bastard! These aren't mine, Dandelion said in astonishment, taking a pair of men's trousers with odd-coloured legs from the ground. I've never had trousers like these in my life. Get out! I don't want to see you any more. You... you... Do you know what you're like in bed? Pathetic. Pathetic. Do you hear? Do you hear, everybody? Another flower pot whistled down, a dried stalk that had grown out of it flapping. Dandelion barely managed to dodge. Following the flower pot, a copper cauldron of at least two and a half gallons came spinning down. The crowd of onlookers standing a safe distance away from the cannonade reeled with laughter. The more active and unprincipled jokers among them applauded and incited the blonde to further action. She doesn't have a crossbow in the house, does she? The witcher asked anxiously. It can't be ruled out, said the poet, lifting his head up towards the balcony. She has a load of junk in there. Did you see those trousers? Perhaps we ought to get out of here. You can come back when she calms down. Hell no, Dandelion grimaced. I shall never go back to a house from which calumny and copper pots are showered on me. I consider this fickle relationship over. Let's just wait till she throws my... Oh, mother, no! Vespula! My loot! He lunged forward, arms outstretched, stumbled, fell, and caught the instrument at the last moment, just above the cobbles. The loot spoke plaintively and melodiously. Phew! sighed the bard, springing up. I've got it. Oh, it's fine, Geralt. We can go now. Admittedly, my cloak with a martin collar is still there, but too bad. Let it be my grievance. Knowing her, she won't throw the cloak down. You lying sloven! the blonde screamed and spat copiously from the balcony. You vagrant! You croaking pheasant! What's the matter with her? What have you been up to, Dandelion? Oh, nothing unusual, the troubadour shrugged. She demands monogamy, like they all do, and then throws another man's trousers at a fellow. Did you hear what she was screaming about me? By the gods! I also know some women who decline their favours more prettily than she gives hers, but I don't shout about it from the rooftops. Let's go. Where do you suggest we go? Are you serious? The Temple of the Eternal Fire? Let's drop into this spear blade. I have to calm my nerves. Without protest, the witcher led his mare after Dandelion, who had headed off briskly into a narrow lane. The troubadour tightened the pegs of his lute as he strode, strummed the strings to test them, and played a deep, resounding chord. The air bears autumn's cool scent, our words seized by an icy gust. 
Your tears have my heart rent, but all is gone, and part we must. He broke off, waving cheerfully at two maids who were passing, carrying baskets of vegetables. The girls giggled. What brings you to Novigrad, Geralt? Fitting out, a harness, some tackle, and a new jacket. The witcher pulled down the creaking, fresh-smelling leather. How do you like it, Dandelion? You don't keep up with the fashion, the bard grimaced, brushing a chicken feather from his gleaming cornflower blue caftan with puffed sleeves and a serrated collar. Oh, I'm glad we've met. Here in Novigrad, the capital of the world, the centre and cradle of culture. Here, a cultured man can live life to the full. Let's live it one lane further on, suggested Geralt, glancing at a tramp who had squatted down and was defecating, eyes bulging in an alleyway. Your constant sarcasm is becoming annoying, Dandelion said, grimacing again. Novigrad, I tell you, is the capital of the world. Almost 30,000 dwellers, Geralt, not counting travellers. Just imagine. Brick houses, cobbled main streets, a seaport, stores, shops, four water mills, slaughterhouses, sawmills, a large manufactory making beautiful slippers, and every conceivable guild and trade. A mint. Eight banks and nineteen pawnbrokers, a castle and guardhouse to take the breath away, and diversions. A scaffold, a gallows with a drop, thirty-five taverns, a theatre, a menagerie, a market, and a dozen whorehouses. And I can't remember how many temples, but plenty. Oh, and the women, Geralt, bathed, coiffured, and fragrant. Those satins, velvets and silks, those whalebones and ribbons, oh, <laughs> Geralt, the rhymes pour out by themselves. Around your house now white from frost, sparkles ice on the pond and marsh, your longing eyes grieve what is lost, but naught can change this parting harsh. A new ballad. Aye, I'll call it Winter, but it's not ready yet. I can't finish it. Vespulas made me completely jittery, and the rhymes won't come together. Ah, Geralt, I've got to ask, how is it with you and Yennefer? It isn't. I understand. No, you bloody don't. Is it far to this tavern? Just round the corner. Ah, here we are. Can you see the sign? Yes, I can. My sincere and humble greetings. Dandelion flashed a smile at the wench sweeping the steps. Has anyone ever told you, my lady, that you are gorgeous? The wench flushed and gripped her broom tightly. For a moment, Geralt thought she would whack the troubadour with a handle. He was mistaken. The wench smiled engagingly and fluttered her eyelashes. Dandelion, as usual, paid absolutely no attention. Greetings to one and all. Good day, he bellowed, entering the tavern and plucking the lute strings hard with his thumb. Master Dandelion, the most renowned poet in the land, has visited your tawdry establishment, landlord, for he has a will to drink beer. Do you mark the honour I do you, swindler? I do, said the innkeeper morosely, leaning forward over the bar. I'm content to see you, minstrel, sir. I see that your word is indeed your bond. After all, you promised to stop by first thing to pay for yesterday's exploits. And I, just imagine, presumed you were lying as usual. I swear I am ashamed. There is no need to feel shame, my good man, the troubadour said lightheartedly, for I have no money. We shall converse about that later. No, the innkeeper said coldly. We should converse about it right away. Your credit has finished, my lord poet. No one befools me twice in a row. Dandelion hung up his lute on a hook protruding from the wall, sat down at a table, took off his bonnet, and pensively stroked the egret's feather pinned to it. "'Do you have any funds, Geralt?' he asked with hope in his voice. "'No, I don't. Everything I had went on the jacket.' "'That is ill. That is ill,' Dandelion sighed. "'There's not a bloody soul to stand around. Innkeeper, why is it so empty here today?' It's too early for ordinary drinkers, and the journeyman masons who are repairing the temple have already been and returned to the scaffolding, taking their master with them. And there's no one, no one at all. 
no one aside from the Honourable Merchant Bieberveld, who is breaking his fast in the large snug. Dainties here, Dandelion said, pleased. You should have said at once. Come to the snug, Geralt. Do you know the halfling, Dainty Bieberveld? No. Never mind, you can make his acquaintance. Ah, the troubadour called, heading towards the snug. I smell from the east a whiff and hint of onion soup pleasing to my nostrils. Peekaboo! It's us! Surprise! A chubby-cheeked, curly-haired halfling in a pistachio-green waistcoat was sitting at the table in the centre of the chamber beside a post decorated with garlands of garlic and bunches of herbs. In his left hand he held a wooden spoon and in his right an earthenware bowl. At the sight of Dandelion and Geralt, the halfling froze and opened his mouth and his large nut-brown eyes widened in fear. "'What cheer, Dainty!' Dandelion said, blithely waving his bonnet. The halfling did not move or close his mouth. His hand, Geralt noticed, was trembling a little, and the long strips of boiled onion hanging from the spoon were swinging like a pendulum. G -g "'Greetings! G -g -g Greetings, the Dandelion!' he stammered and swallowed loudly. Do you have the hiccups? Would you like me to frighten you? Look out, your wife's been seen on the turnpike. She'll be here soon, Gardenia Bieberveld in person. <laughs> you really are an ass, Dandelion, the halfling said reproachfully. Dandelion laughed brightly again, simultaneously playing two complicated chords on his lute. Well, you have an exceptionally stupid expression on your face, and you're goggling at us as though we had horns and tails. Perhaps you're afraid of the witcher. What? Perhaps you think halfling season has begun. Perhaps... Stop it! Geralt snapped, unable to stay quiet, and walked over to the table. Forgive us, friend. Dandelion has experienced a serious personal tragedy, and he still hasn't got over it. He's trying to mask his sorrow, dejection, and disgrace by being witty. Don't tell me, the halfling said, finally slurping up the contents of the spoon. Let me guess. Vespula has finally thrown you out on your ear. What, Dandelion? I don't engage in conversations or sensitive subjects with individuals who drink and gorge themselves while their friends stand, the troubadour said, and then sat down without waiting. The halfling scooped up a spoon of soup and licked off the threads of cheese hanging from it. Right you are, he said glumly. So, be my guests. Sit you down and help yourselves. Would you like some onion pottage? In principle, I don't dine at such an early hour, Dandelion said, putting on airs. But... Very well. Just not on an empty stomach. I say, landlord, a beer, if you please, and swiftly. A lass, with an impressive thick plait reaching her hips, brought the mugs and bowls of soup. Geralt, observing her round, downy face, thought that she would have a pretty mouth if she remembered to keep it closed. Forest dryad, Dandelion cried, seizing the girl's arm and kissing her on her open palm. Sylph! Fairy, oh, divine creature, with eyes like azure lakes. Thou art as exquisite as the morn, and the shape of thy parted lips are enticingly. Give him some beer, quick, Dainty groaned, or it'll end in disaster. No, it won't. No, it won't, the bard assured him. Right, Geralt? You'd be hard-pressed to find more composed men than we two. I... Dear sir, I'm a poet and a musician, and music soothes the savage breast, and the witcher here present is menacing only to monsters. I present Geralt of Rivia, the terror of striggers, werewolves, and sundry vileness. You've surely heard of Geralt, dainty? Yes, I have, the halfling said, glowering suspiciously at the witcher. What, what brings you to Novigrad, sir? Have some dreadful monsters been sighted here? Have you been <coughs> commissioned? No, smiled the witcher. I'm here for my own amusement. Oh, Dainty said, nervously wriggling his hirsute feet, which were dangling half a cubit above the floor. That's good. What's good? Dandelion asked, swallowing a spoonful of soup and sipping some beer. Do you plan to support us, Bieberveld? In our amusements, I mean. Excellent. We intend to get tipsy here in the spear blade, and then we plan to repair to the Passiflora, a very dear and high-class den of iniquity, where we may treat ourselves to a half-blood she-elf, and who knows, maybe even a pure-blood she-elf. Nonetheless, we need a sponsor. What do you mean? Someone to pay the bills? As I thought, Dainty muttered, 
I'm sorry. Firstly, I've arranged several business meetings. Secondly, I don't have the funds to sponsor such diversions. Thirdly, they only admit humans to the passiflora. What are we, then? Short-eared owls? Oh, I understand. They don't admit halflings. That's true. You're right, Dainty. This is Novigrad, the capital of the world. Right, then, the halfling said, still looking at the witcher and twisting his mouth strangely. I'll be off. I'm due to be... The door to the chamber opened with a bang, and in rushed Dainty Biebervelt. Oh, ye gods! Dandelion yelled. The halfling standing in the doorway in no way differed from the halfling sitting at the table, if one were to disregard the fact that the one at the table was clean and the one in the doorway was dirty, dishevelled and haggard. Got you, you bitch's tail! The dirty halfling roared, lunging at the table. You thief! His clean twin leapt to his feet, overturning his stool and knocking the dishes from the table. Geralt reacted instinctively and very quickly. Seizing his scabbard sword from the table, he lashed Biebervelt on the nape of his neck with the heavy belt. The halfling tumbled onto the floor, rolled over, dived between Dandelion's legs and scrambled towards the door on all fours, his arms and legs suddenly lengthening like a spider's. Seeing this, the dirty dainty Biebervelt swore, howled and jumped out of the way, slamming his back into the wooden wall. Geralt threw aside the scabbard and kicked the stool out of the way, darting after him. The clean dainty Biebervelt, now utterly dissimilar apart from the colour of his waistcoat, cleared the threshold like a grasshopper and hurtled into the common bar, colliding with the lass with a half-open mouth. Seeing his long limbs and melted, grotesque physiognomy, the lass opened her mouth to its full extent and uttered an ear-splitting scream. Geralt, taking advantage of the loss of momentum caused by the collision, caught up with the creature in the centre of the chamber and knocked it to the ground with a deft kick behind the knee. Don't move a muscle, chum, he hissed through clenched teeth, holding the point of his sword to the oddity's throat. Don't budge. What's going on here? the innkeeper yelled, running over, clutching a spade handle. What's all this about? Guard! Detchka, run and get the guard! No! the creature wailed, flattening itself against the floor and deforming itself even more. Have mercy, no! Don't call them, the dirty halfling echoed, rushing out of the snug. Grab that girl, dandelion! The troubadour caught the screaming Detchka, carefully choosing the places to seize her by. Detchka squealed and crouched on the floor by his legs. Calm down, innkeeper, Dainty Beavervelt panted. It's a private matter. We won't call out the guard. I'll pay for any damage. There isn't any damage, the innkeeper said level-headedly, looking around. But there will be, the plump halfling said, gnashing his teeth because I'm going to thrash him, and properly. I'm going to thrash him cruelly, at length, and frenziedly, and then everything here will be broken. The long-limbed and spread-out caricature of Dainty Biebervelt flattened on the floor, snivelled pathetically. Nothing doing, the innkeeper said coldly, squinting and raising the spade handle a little. Thrash it in the street or in the yard, sir, not here, and I'm calling the guard. Needs must, it is my duty. For sooth, it's some kind of monster. Innkeeper, sir, Geralt said calmly, not relieving the pressure on the freak's neck. Keep your head. No one is going to destroy anything. There won't be any damage. The situation is under control. I'm a witcher, and, as you can see, I have the monster in my grasp. And, because, indeed, it does look like a private matter, we'll calmly sort it out here in the snug. Release the girl, Dandelion, and come here. I have a silver chain in my bag. Take it out and tie the arms of this gentleman securely around the elbows behind its back. Don't move, chum. The creature whimpered softly. Very well, Geralt, Dandelion said. I've tied it up. Let's go to the snug. And you, landlord, what are you standing there for? I ordered beer. And when I order beer, you're to keep serving me until I shout water. Geralt pushed the tied-up creature towards the snug and roughly sat him down by the post. Dainty Biebervelt also sat down and looked at him in disgust. It's monstrous the way it looks, he said, just like a pile of fermenting dough. Look at its nose, Dandelion. It'll fall off any second, go blimey. And its ears are like my mother-in-law's just before a funeral. Ugh. Hold hard, hold hard, Dandelion muttered. 
Are you, Biebervelt? Yes, you are, without doubt. But whatever sitting by that post was you a moment ago, if I'm not mistaken. Geralt? Everybody's watching you. You're a witcher. What the bloody hell is going on here? What is it? It's a mimic. You're a mimic yourself, the creature said in a guttural voice, swinging its nose. I'm not a mimic. I'm a Doppler, and my name is Teleco Lungravink Latorta, Penstock for short. My close friends call me Doodoo. -Doo. I'll give you Doodoo, -Doo, you horson, Dainty yelled, aiming a punch at him. Where are my horses, you thief? Gentlemen, the innkeeper cautioned them, entering with a jug and a handful of beer mugs. You promise things will be peaceful. Ah, beer, the halfling sighed. Oh, but I'm damned thirsty and hungry. I could do with a drink, too, Teleco Lungravink Latort declared gurglingly. He was totally ignored. What is it? the innkeeper asked, contemplating the creature, who at the sight of the beer stuck its long tongue out beyond sagging, doughy lips. What is it, gentlemen? A mimic, the witcher repeated, heedless of the faces the monster was making. It actually has many names. A changeling. Shapeshifter, Vexling, or Fetch, or a Doppler, as it called itself. A Vexling? the innkeeper yelled. Here, in Novigrad, in my inn. Swiftly, we must call the guard, and the priests, or it'll be on my head. Easy does it, Dainty Bibivelt rasped, hurriedly finishing off dandelion soup from a bowl, which by some miracle had not been spilled. There'll be time to call anyone we need, but later. This scoundrel robbed me, and I have no intention of handing it over to the local law before recovering my property. I know you, Novigradians, and your judges. I might get a tenth, nothing more. Have mercy, the Doppler whimpered plentifully. Don't have me over to humans. Do you know what they do to the likes of me? Naturally we do, the innkeeper nodded. The priests perform exorcisms on any vexling they catch. Then they tie it up with a stick between its knees and cover it thickly with clay, mixed with iron filings, roll it into a ball and bake it in a fire until the clay hardens into brick. At least that's what used to be done years ago, when these monsters occurred more often. A barbaric custom. Human, indeed, Dainty said, grimacing, and pushing the now empty bowl away. But perhaps it is a just penalty for banditry and thievery. Well, talk, you good-for-nothing. Where are my horses? Quickly, before I stretch that nose of yours between your legs and shove it up your backside. Where are my horses? I said. I've... I've sold them, Teleco Lungrevik Latort stammered, and his sagging ears suddenly curled up into balls resembling tiny cauliflowers. Sold them? Did you hear that? The halfling cried, frothing at the mouth. It sold my horses! Of course, Dandelion said. It's had time to. It's been here for three days. For the last three days, you've... I mean, it's... Damn it, Dainty. Does that mean... Of course that's what it means, the merchant yelled, stamping his hairy feet. It robbed me on the road, a day's ride from the city. It came here as me, get it? And sold my horses. I'll kill it. I'll strangle it with my bare hands. Tell us how it happened, Mr. Biebervelt. Get out of Rivia, if I'm not mistaken. The Witcher? Geralt nodded in reply. That's a stroke of luck, the halfling said. I'm Dainty Bibivelt of Knotgrass Meadow, farmer, stock breeder and merchant. Call me Dainty, Geralt. Say on, Dainty. Very well. It was like this. Me and my ostlers were driving my horses to be sold at the market in Devil's Ford. We had our last stop a day's ride from the city. We overnighted, having first dealt with a small cask of burnt caramel vodka. I woke up in the middle of the night feeling like my bladder was about to burst, got off the wagon, and I thought to myself, I'll take a look at what the nags are doing in the meadow. A walk out, fog thick as buggery, a look, and suddenly someone's coming. Who goes there? I ask. He says nothing. I walk up closer and see myself, like in a looking glass. I think I oughtn't to have drunk that bloody moonshine, a cursed spirit. And this one here, for that's what it was, ups and conks me on a noggin. I saw stars and went arse over tit. The next day, I woke up in a bloody thicket with a lump like a cucumber on my head and not a soul in sight, not a sign of our camp either. I wandered the whole day before I finally found the trail. Two days, I trudged, eating roots and raw mushrooms, and in the meantime, that... that... lousy... do... 
Dulico or whatever it was, has ridden to Novigrad as me and flogged my horses. I'll get the bloody... and I'll thrash my ostlers. I'll give each one a hundred lashes on his bare ass. the cretins. Not to recognise their own governor, to let themselves be outwitted like that. Numbskulls, imbeciles, sots. Don't be too hard on them, dainty, Geralt said. They didn't have a chance. A mimic copy so exactly there's no way of distinguishing it from the original. I mean, from its chosen victim. Have you never heard of mimics? Some? I thought it was all fiction. Well, it isn't. All a Doppler has to do is observe its victim closely in order to quickly and unerringly adapt to the necessary material structure. I would point out that it's not an illusion, but a complete, precise transformation to the minutest detail. How a mimic does it, no one knows. Sorcerers suspect the same component of the blood is at work here as with lycanthropy, but I think it's either something totally different or a thousandfold more powerful. After all, a werewolf has only two, at most, three different forms, while a Doppler can transform into anything it wants to, as long as the body mass more or less tallies. Body mass? Well, it won't turn into a mastodon or a mouse. Oh, I understand. And the chain you've bound him up in, what's that about? It's silver. It's lethal to a lycanthrope, but as you see, for a mimic, it merely stops the transmutations. That's why it's sitting here in its own form. The Doppler pursed its glutinous lips and glowered at the Witcher with an evil expression in its dull eyes, which had already lost the hazel colour of the halfling's irises and were now yellow. I'm glad it's sitting, cheeky bastard, Dainty snarled. Just to think it even stopped here, at the blade, where I customarily lodge. It already thinks it's me. Dandelion nodded. Dainty, he said. It was you. I've been meeting it here for three days now. It looked like you and spoke like you, and when it came to standing around, it was as tight as you. Possibly even tighter. That last point doesn't worry me, the halfling said, because perhaps I'll recover some of my money. <laughs> it disgusts me to touch it. Take the purse of it, Dandelion, and check what's inside. There ought to be plenty, if that horse thief really did sell my nags. How many horses did you have, Dainty? A dozen. Calculating according to world prices, the troubadour said, looking into the purse, what's here would just about buy a single horse if you chanced upon an old foundered one. Calculated according to Novigradian prices, there's enough for two goats, three at most. The merchant said nothing but looked as though he were about to cry. Teleco Lungrevinkle Torte hung his nose down low and his lower lip even lower, after which he began to softly gurgle. In a word, the halfling finally sighed, I've been robbed and ruined by a creature whose existence I previously didn't believe in. That's what you call bad luck. That about sums it up, the witch said casting a glance at the Doppler huddled on the stool. I was also convinced that mimics had been wiped out long ago. In the past, so I've heard, plenty of them used to live in the nearby forests and on the plateau, but their ability to mimic seriously worried the first settlers, and they began to hunt them, quite effectively. Almost all of them were quickly exterminated. And lucky for us, the innkeeper said, spitting onto the floor. I swear on the eternal fire, I prefer a dragon or a demon, which is always a dragon or a demon. You know where you are with them. But werewolfry, all those transmutations and metamorphoses, that hideous demonic practice, trickery, and the treacherous deceit conjured up by those hideous creatures will be the detriment and undoing of people. I tell you, let's call the guard and into the fire with this repugnance. Geralt, Dandelion asked curiously, I'd be glad to hear an expert's opinion. Are these mimics really so dangerous and aggressive? Their ability to mimic, the witcher said, is an attribute which serves as defence rather than aggression. I haven't heard of... A pox on it! Dainty interrupted angrily, slamming his fist down on the table. If thumping a fellow in the head and plundering him isn't aggression, I don't know what is. Stop being clever. The matter is simple. I was waylaid and robbed, not just of my hard-earned property, but also of my own form. I demand compensation, and I shall not rest... The guard. We must call the guard, the innkeeper said. And we should summon the priests and burn that monster, that non-human. Give over, landlord, the halfling said, raising his head. You're becoming a bore, that guard of yours. I would like to point out that that non-human hasn't harmed anybody else, only me. And incidentally, I'm also a non-human. 
Oh, don't be ridiculous, Mr. Peeper felt. The innkeeper laughed nervously. Oh, what are you and what is that? You're not far off being a man, and uh, that's a monster. It astonishes me that you're sitting there so calmly, witches, sir. What's your trade, if you'll pardon me? It's your job to kill monsters, isn't it? Monsters, Geralt said coldly, but not the members of intelligent races. Come, come, sir, the innkeeper said. That's a bit of an exaggeration. Indeed, Dandelion cut in. You've overstepped the mark, Geralt, with that intelligent race. Just take a look at it. Teleco Lungrevinkla Torta, indeed, did not resemble a member of an intelligent race at that moment. He resembled a puppet made of mud and flour, looking at the witcher with a beseeching look in its dull yellow eyes. Neither were the snuffling sounds being emitted from its nose, which now reached the table, consistent with a member of an intelligent race. Enough of this empty bullshit, Dainty Bibivelt suddenly roared. There's nothing to argue about. The only thing that counts is my horses and my loss. Do you hear, you bloody slippery jack, you? Who did you sell my nags to? What did you do with the money? Tell me now before I kick you black and blue and flay you alive. Dechka, opening the door slightly, stuck her flaxen-haired head into the chamber. We have visitors, father, she whispered. Journeyman masons from the scaffolding and others. I'm serving them, but don't shout so loudly in here, because they're beginning to look funny at the snog. By the eternal fire, the innkeeper said in horror, looking at the molten Doppler. If someone looks in and sees it... Oh, it'll look bad. If we aren't to call the guard, then... Witcher, sir? If it really is a vexling, tell it to change into something decent, as a disguise, like... Just for now. That's right, Dainty said. Have him change into something, Geralt. Into whom? The Doppler suddenly gurgled. I can only take on a form I've had a good look at. Which of you shall I turn into? Not me, the innkeeper said hurriedly. Nor me, Dandelion snorted. Anyway, it wouldn't be any disguise. Everybody knows me, so the sight of two dandelions at one table would cause a bigger sensation than the one here in person. It will be the same with me, Geralt smiled. That leaves you, dainty. And it's turned out well. Don't be offended, but you know yourself that people have difficulty distinguishing one halfling from another. The merchant did not ponder this for long. Very well, he said. Let it be. Take the chain off him, Witcher. Right then, turn yourself into me, O oh intelligent race. After the chain had been removed, the Doppler rubbed its doughy hands together, felt its nose, and stared goggle-eyed at the halfling. The sagging skin on its face tightened up and acquired colour. Its nose shrank and drew in with a dull, squelching sound, and curly hair sprouted on its bald pate. Now... It was Dainty's turn to goggle. The innkeeper opened his mouth in mute astonishment, and Dandelion heaved a sigh and groaned. The last thing to change was the colour of its eyes. The second Dainty Beavervelt cleared its throat, reached across the table, seized the first Dainty Beavervelt's beer mug, and greedily pressed its mouth to it. It can't be. It can't be, Dandelion said softly. Just look. He's been copied exactly. They're indistinguishable, down to the last detail. This time even the mosquito bites and stains on its breeches. Yes, on its breeches. Geralt, not even sorcerers can manage that. Feel it, it's real wool. Well, that's no illusion. Extraordinary. How does it do it? No one knows, the witcher muttered. It doesn't either. I said it has the complete ability for the free transformation of material structure, but it is an organic, instinctive ability. But the breeches! What has it made the breeches out of? And the waistcoat? That's its own adapted skin. I don't think it'd be happy to give up those trousers. Anyway, they'd immediately lose the properties of wool. Pity, Dainty said, showing cunning, because I was just wondering whether to make it change a bucket of matter into a bucket of gold. The Doppler now a faithful copy of the halfling, lounged comfortably and grinned broadly, clearly glad to be the centre of interest. It was sitting in an identical pose to Dainty, swinging its hairy feet the same way. You know plenty about Dopplers, Geralt, it said, then took a swig from the mug, smacked its lips and belched. Plenty indeed. Ye gods! 
Its voice and mannerisms are also Bibervelt's, Dandelion said. Haven't any of you got a bit of red silk thread? We ought to mark it, damn it, because there might be trouble. Come on, Dandelion, the first dainty Bibervelt said indignantly. Surely you won't mistake it for me. The differences are clear at first glance. The second dainty Bibervelt completed the sentence and belched again gracefully. Indeed, in order to be mistaken, you'd have to be more stupid than a mayor's ass. Didn't I say? Dandelion whispered in amazement. It thinks and talks like Bibervelt. They're indistinguishable. An exaggeration, the halfling said, pouting. A gross exaggeration. No, Geralt rebutted. It's not an exaggeration. Believe it or not, but at this moment, it is you, Dainty. In some unknown way, the Doppler also precisely copies its victim's mentality. Mental what? The mind's properties, the character, feelings, thoughts, the soul which would confirm what most sorcerers and old priests would deny, that the soul is also matter. Blasphemy, the innkeeper gasped. And poppycock, Dainty Bieberbelt said firmly. Don't tell stories, Witcher. The mind's properties are like that. Copying someone's nose and breeches is one thing, but someone's mind is no bloody mean feat. I'll prove it to you now. If that lousy Doppler had copied my merchant's mind, he wouldn't have sold the horses in Novigrad, where there's no market for them. He would have ridden to the horse fair in Devil's Ford, where they're sold to the highest bidder. You don't lose money there. Well, actually, you do. The Doppler imitated the halfling's offended expression and snorted characteristically. First of all, the prices at the auction in Devil's Ford are coming down because the merchants are fixing the bidding. And, in addition, you have to pay the auctioneer's commission. Don't teach me how to trade, you prat, Bibervelt said indignantly. I would have taken ninety or a hundred apiece in Devil's Ford, and how much did you get off those Novigradian chances? A hundred and thirty, the Doppler replied. You're lying, you rascal. I am not. I drove the horses straight to the port, sir, and found a foreign fur trader. Furriers don't use oxen when they assemble their caravans because oxen are too slow. Furs are light but costly, so one needs to travel swiftly. There's no market for horses in Novigrad, so neither are there any horses. I had the only available ones, so I could name my price. Simple. Don't teach me, I said. Dainty yelled, flushing red. Very well. You made a killing, so where's the money? I reinvested it, Teleco said proudly, imitating the halfling's typical raking of his fingers through his thick mop of hair. Money, Mr Dainty, has to circulate and business has to be kept moving. Be careful I don't wring your neck. Tell me what you did with the cash you made on the horses. I told you. I sank it into goods. What goods? What did you buy, you freak? Co co cochineal, the Doppler stuttered, and then enumerated quickly. A thousand bushels of cochineal, sixty-two hundred weight of mimosa bark, fifty-five gallons of rose oil, twenty-three barrels of cod liver oil, six hundred earthenware bowls, and eighty pounds of beeswax. I bought the cod liver oil very cheaply, incidentally, because it was a little rancid. Oh, yes, I almost forgot. I also bought a hundred cubits of cotton string. A long, very long silence fell. Cod liver oil? Dainty finally said, enunciating each word very slowly. Cotton string? Rose oil? <laughs> I must be dreaming. Yes, it's a nightmare. You can buy anything in Novigrad, every precious and everyday thing, and this moron here spends my money on shit, pretending to be me. I'm finished. My money's lost. My merchant's reputation is lost. No, I've had enough of this. Lend me your sword, Geralt. I'll cut him to shreds here and now. The door to the chamber creaked open. The merchant Bibervilt crowed an individual in a purple toga, which hung on his emaciated frame as though on a stick. He had a hat on his head, shaped like an upturned chamber pot. Is the merchant Bibervelt here? Yes, the two halflings answered in unison. The next moment, one of the dainty Bibervelts flung the contents of the mug in the witch's face, deftly kicked the stool from under Dandelion, and slipped under the table towards the door, knocking over the individual in the ridiculous hat on the way. Fire! Help! it yelled, rushing out towards the common chamber. Murder! Calamity! Geralt, shaking off the beer froth, rushed after him. But the second Bibervelt, who was also tearing towards the door, slipped on the sawdust and fell in front of him. The two of them fell over right on the threshold. Dandelion, clambering out from under the table, 
cursed hideously. Assault! yelled the skinny individual entangled in his purple toga from the floor. Robbery! Criminals! Geralt rolled over the halfling and rushed into the main chamber to see the Doppler, jostling the drinkers, running out into the street. He rushed after him, only to run into a resilient but hard wall of men barring his way. He managed to knock one of them over, smeared with clay and snaking of beer, but others held him fast in the iron grip of powerful hands. He fought furiously, but heard the dry report of snapping thread and rending leather, and the sleeve become loose under his right armpit. The witcher swore and stopped struggling. We have him, the masons yelled. We've got the robber. What do we do now, master? Lime, the master bellowed, raising his head from the table and looking around with unseeing eyes. God, the purple one yelled crawling from the chamber on all fours. An official has been assaulted. God, it will be the gallows for you, villain. We have him, the masons shouted. We have him, sir. That's not him, the individual in the toga bellowed. Catch the scoundrel after him. Who? Oh, Bibervelt the halfling. After him. Give chase to the dungeons with him. Hold on a moment, Dainty said, emerging from the snug. What's it all about, Mr. Schwann? Don't drag my name through the mud and don't sound the alarm. There's no need. Schwann was silent and looked at the halfling in astonishment. Dandelion emerged from the chamber, bonnet at an angle, examining his loot. The masons, whispering among themselves, finally released Geralt. The witcher, although absolutely furious, limited himself to spitting copiously on the floor. Merchant Beeperveld, Schwann crowed, narrowing his myopic eyes. What is the meaning of this? An assault on a municipal official may cost too dearly. Who was that? That halfling who bolted? My cousin, Dainty said quickly. A, a distant cousin. Uh, yes, yes, Dandelion agreed, swiftly backing him up and feeling in his element. Biebervelt's distant cousin, uh, known as Nutcase Biebervelt, the black sheep of the family. When he was a child, he fell into a well, a, a dried-up well, but unfortunately the pail hit him directly on his head. He's usually peaceful. It's just that the colour purple infuriates him. But there's nothing to worry about, because he's calmed by the sight of red hairs on a lady's loins. That's why he rushed straight to passive flora. I tell you, Mr. Schwann, that's enough, Dandelion, the witcher hissed. Shut up, damn it. Schwann pulled his toga down, brushed the sawdust off it, and straightened up, assuming a haughty air. Now then, he said, heed your relatives more attentively, much to be bevelt, because as you well know, you are responsible. Were I to lodge a complaint, but I cannot afford the time. I am here, Bebevelt, on official business. On behalf of the municipal authorities, I summon you to pay tax. Hey? Tax, the official repeated and pouted his lips in a grimace probably copied from someone much more important. What are you doing? Been infected by your cousin? If you make a profit, you have to pay taxes, or you'll have to do time in the dungeon. Me? Dainty roared. Me? Make a profit? <laughs> All I have is losses for fuck's sake. I... Careful, Beaverbelt, the witcher hissed, while Dandelion kicked the halfling furtively in his hairy shin. The halfling coughed. <coughs> of course, he said, struggling to put a smile on his chubby face. Of course, Mr. Schwann, if you make a profit, you have to pay taxes. High profits, high taxes. And the other way round, I'd say. It is not for me to judge your business, sir, the official said, making a sour face. He sat down at the table, removing from the fathomless depths of his toga an abacus and a scroll of parchment which he unrolled on the table, first wiping it with a sleeve. It is my job to count up and collect. Now then, let us reckon this up. That will be... Two down, carry the one... You know, then, one thousand five hundred and fifty-three crowns and twenty pennies. A hushed wheeze escaped Dainty Bibervelt's lips. The masons muttered in astonishment. The innkeeper dropped a bowl. Dandelion gasped. Very well. <laughs> Goodbye, lads, the halfling said bitterly. If anybody asks, I'm in the dungeon. Chapter 2
by tomorrow at noon, Dainty groaned. And that horse and that swan, damn him, the repulsive creep, could have extended it. Over fifteen hundred crowns. How am I to come by that kind of coin by tomorrow? I'm finished, ruined. I'll rot in the dungeons. Oh, don't let's sit here, damn it. Let's catch that bastard Doppler, I tell you. We have to catch it. The three of them were sitting on the marble sill of a disused fountain, occupying the centre of a small square among sumptuous but extremely tasteless merchants' townhouses. The water in the fountain was green and dreadfully dirty, and the golden ides swimming among the refuse worked their gills hard and gulped in air from the surface through open mouths. Dandelion and the halfling were chewing some fritters which the troubadour had swiped from a stall they had just passed. In your shoes, the bard said, I'd forget about catching it and start looking around for somebody to borrow the money off. What will you get from catching the Doppler? Perhaps you think Schwann will accept it as an equivalent? You're a fool, Dandelion. When I catch the Doppler, I'll get my money back. What money? Everything he had in that purse went on covering the damage and a bribe for Schwann. It didn't have any more. Dandelion, the halfling grimaced, you may know something about poetry, but in business matters, forgive me, you're a total blockhead. Did you hear how much tax Schwann is charging me? And what do you pay tax on, eh? On what? On everything, the poet stated. I even pay tax on singing, and they don't give a monkeys about my explanations that I was only singing from an inner need. You're a fool, I said. In business, you pay taxes on profits. On profits, dandelion. Do you comprehend? That rascal of a Doppler impersonated me and made some business transactions, fraudulent ones, no doubt, and made money on them. It made a profit. And I'll have to pay tax and probably cover the debts of that scoundrel, if it has run up any debts. And if I don't pay it off, I'm going to the dungeons. They'll brand me with a red-hot iron in public and send me to the mines. Oh, box on it. Ha, huh, dandelion said cheerfully. So? You don't have a choice, Dainty. You'll have to flee the city in secret. Know what? I have an idea. We'll wrap you up in a sheepskin. You can pass through the gate, calling, I'm a little bar lamb, ba ba ba. No one will recognise you. Dandelion, the halfling said glumly. Shut up, or I'll kick you. Geralt. What, Dainty? Will you help me to catch the Doppler? Listen, the witcher said still trying in vain to sew up his torn jacket sleeve. This is Novigrad, a population of 30,000 humans, dwarves, half-elves, halflings and gnomes, and probably as many out-of-towners again. How do you mean to find someone in this rabbit warren? Dainty swallowed a fritter and licked his fingers. And magic, Geralt? Those witcher spells of yours about which so many tales circulate? A Doppler is only magically detectable in its own form, and doesn't walk down the street in it. And even if it did, magic would be no use, because there are plenty of weak sorcerer signals all around. Every second house has a magical lock on the door, and three quarters of the people wear amulets of all kinds, against thieves, fleas and poisoning. Too many to count. Dandelion ran his fingers over the lute's fingerboard and strummed the strings. Spring will return with warm rain perfumed, he sang. No, that's no good. Spring will return. The sun... Oh, no, damn it. It's just not coming. Not at all. Stop squawking, the halfling snapped. You're getting on my nerves. Dandelion threw the ides, the rest of his fritter, and spat into the fountain. Look, he said, golden fish. It's said that they grant wishes. Those ones are red, Dainty observed. Never mind, it's a trifle. Damn it, there are three of us, and they grant three wishes. That works out at one each, what? Dainty? Wouldn't you wish for the fish to pay the tax for you? Of course. And apart from that, for something to fall from the sky and whack the Doppler on the noggin. And also, stop, stop, we also have our wishes. I'd like the fish to supply me with an ending for my ballad. And you, Geralt? Get off my back, Dandelion. Don't spoil the game, Witcher. Tell us what you'd wish for. The Witcher got up. I would wish, he murmured, that the fact we're being surrounded would turn out to be a misunderstanding. From an alleyway opposite the fountain emerged four individuals dressed in black, wearing round leather caps, heading slowly towards them. Dainty swore softly and looked around. 
another four men came out of a street behind their backs. They did not come any closer, and, having positioned themselves, stood blocking the street. They were holding strange-looking discs resembling coiled ropes. The witcher looked around and moved his shoulders, adjusting the sword slung across his back. Dandelion groaned. From behind the backs of the individuals in black emerged a small man in a white caftan and a short grey cape. The gold chain on his neck sparkled to the rhythm of his steps, flashing yellow. Chapel, Dandelion groaned. It's Chapel. The individuals in black behind them moved slowly towards the fountain. The witcher reached for his sword. No, Geralt, Dandelion whispered, moving closer to him. For God's sake, don't draw your weapon. It's the temple guard. If we resist, we won't leave Novigrad alive. Don't touch your sword. The man in the white caftan walked swiftly towards them. The individuals in black followed him, surrounding the fountain at a march, and occupied strategic, carefully chosen positions. Geralt observed them vigilantly, crouching slightly. The strange discs they were holding were not, as he had first thought, ordinary whips. They were Lamia's. The man in the white caftan approached them. Geralt, the bard whispered, by all the gods, keep calm. I won't let them touch me, the witcher muttered. I won't let them touch me, whoever they are. Be careful, Dandelion. When it starts, you two flee as fast as you can. I'll keep them busy for some time. Dandelion did not answer. Slinging the lute over one shoulder, he bowed low before the man in the white caftan, which was ornately embroidered with gold and silver threads in an intricate mosaic pattern. Venerable Chapel! The man addressed as Chapel stopped and swept them with his gaze. His eyes, Geralt noticed, were frost-cold and the colour of steel. His forehead was pale, beaded unhealthily with sweat, and his cheeks were flushed with irregular red blotches. Mr. Dainty Bibervelt, merchant, he said. The talented Dandelion and Geralt of Rivia, a representative of the oh-so-rare witch's profession. A reunion of old friends, here in Novigrad? None of them answered. I consider it highly regrettable, Chappell continued, that a report has been submitted about you. Dandelion blanched slightly, and the halfling's teeth chattered. The witcher was not looking at Chappell. He did not take his eyes off the weapons of the men in leather caps surrounding the fountain. In most of the countries known to Geralt, the production and possession of spiked lamias, also called Mahanian scourges, were strictly prohibited. Novigrad was no exception. Geralt had seen people struck in the face by a lamia. He would never forget those faces. The keeper of the spear blade in, Chapel continued had the audacity to accuse you gentlemen of collusion with a demon, a monster known as a changeling or a vexling. None of them answered. Chappell folded his arms on his chest and looked at them coldly. I felt obliged to forewarn you of that report. I shall also inform you that the above-mentioned innkeeper has been imprisoned in the dungeons. There is a suspicion that he was raving under the influence of beer or vodka. Astonishing what people will concoct. Firstly, there are no such things as vexlings. It is a fabrication of superstitious peasants. No one commented on this. Secondly, what vexling would dare to approach a witcher? Chappell smiled. And not be killed at once. Am I right? The innkeeper's accusation would thus be ludicrous, were it not for one vital detail. Chappell nodded, pausing dramatically. The witcher heard Dainty slowly exhaling a large lungful of air. Yes, a certain vital detail, Chappell repeated. Namely, we are facing heresy and sacrilegious blasphemy here, for it is a well-known fact that no vexling, absolutely no vexling, nor any other monster could even approach the walls of Novigrad, because here, in nineteen temples, burns the eternal fire whose sacred power protects the city. Whoever says that he saw a vexling at the spear blade, a stone's throw from the chief altar of the eternal fire, is a blasphemous heretic, and will have to retract his claim. 
Should he not want to, he shall be assisted by the power and means which, trust me, I keep close at hand in the dungeons. Thus, as you can see, there is nothing to be concerned about. The expressions on the faces of Dandelion and the halfling showed emphatically that they both thought differently. There is absolutely nothing to be concerned about, Chappelle repeated. You may leave Novigrad without let or hindrance. I will not detain you. I do have to insist, gentlemen, however, that you do not broadcast the lamentable fabrications of the innkeeper, that you do not discuss this incident openly. Statements calling into question the divine power of the eternal fire, irrespective of the intention, we, the humble servants of the temple, would have to treat as heresy with all due consequences. Your personal religious convictions, whatever they might be, and however I respect them, are of no significance. Believe in what you will. I am tolerant while somebody venerates the eternal fire and does not blaspheme against it. But should they blaspheme, I shall order them burnt at the stake, and that is that. Everybody in Novigrad is equal before the law, and the law applies equally to everybody. Anyone who blasphemes against the eternal fire perishes at the stake and their property is confiscate. But enough of that. I repeat, you may pass through the gates of Novigrad without hindrance. Ideally. Chappelle smiled slightly, sucked in his cheeks in a cunning grimace, and his eyes swept the square. The few passers-by observing the incident quickened their step and rapidly turned their heads away. Ideally, Chappelle finished. Ideally, with immediate effect. Forthwith. Obviously, with regard to the Honourable Merchant Biebervelt, that forthwith means forthwith, having settled all fiscal affairs. Thank you for the time you have given me. Dainty turned away, mouth moving noiselessly. The Witcher had no doubt that the noiseless word had been wholesome. Dandelion lowered his head, smiling foolishly. My dear Witcher, Chappelle suddenly said, a word in private, if you would. Geralt approached, and Chappelle gently extended an arm. If he touches my elbow, I'll strike him, the Witcher thought. I'll strike him whatever happens. Chappelle did not touch Geralt's elbow. My dear Witcher, he said quietly, turning his back on the others, I am aware that some cities, unlike Novigrad, are deprived of the divine protection of the eternal fire. Let us then suppose that a creature similar to a vexling was prowling in one of those cities. I wonder how much you would charge in that case for undertaking to catch a vexling alive. I don't hire myself out to haunt monsters in crowded cities. The witcher shrugged. An innocent bystander might suffer harm. Are you so concerned about the fate of innocent bystanders? Yes, I am, because I am usually held responsible for their fate and have to cope with the consequences. I understand. And would not your concern for the fate of innocent bystanders be in inverse proportion to the fee? It would not. I do not greatly like your tone, Witcher. But no matter. I understand what you hint at by it. You are hinting that you do not want to do... What I would ask you to do, making the size of the fee meaningless. And the form of the fee? I do not understand. Come, come, I mean it. Purely theoretically, Chappelle said, quietly, calmly, without any anger or menace in his voice. It might be possible that the fee for your services would be a guarantee that you and your friends would leave this, leave the theoretical city alive. What then? It is impossible, the witcher said, smiling hideously, to answer that question theoretically. The situation you are discussing, Reverend Chapel, would have to be dealt with in practice. I am in no hurry to do so, but if the necessity arises, if there proves to be no other choice, I am prepared to go through with it. Ah, perhaps you are right, Chapel answered dispassionately. Too much theory. As concerns practice, I see that there will be no collaboration. A good thing, perhaps? In any case, 
I cherish the hope that it will not be a cause for conflict between us. I also cherish that hope. Then may that hope burn in us, Geralt of Livia. Do you know what the eternal fire is? A flame that never goes out, a symbol of permanence, a way leading through the gloom, a harbinger of progress, of a better tomorrow. The eternal fire, Geralt, is hope. For everybody, everybody without exception. For if something exists that embraces us all, you, me, others, then that something is precisely hope. Remember that. It was a pleasure to meet you, Witcher. Geralt bowed stiffly, saying nothing. Chappelle looked at him for a moment, then turned about energetically and marched through the small square without looking around at his escort. The men, armed with lamias, fell in behind him, forming up into a well-ordered column. Oh, mother of mine, Dandelion whimpered timidly, watching the departing men, but we were lucky. If that is the end of it, if they don't collar us right away. Calm down, the witcher said, and stop whining. Nothing happened after all. Do you know who that was, Geralt? No. That was Chapel, Minister for Security Affairs. The Novigrad Secret Service is subordinate to the temple. Chapel is not a priest, but the eminence grieves to the hierarch, the most powerful and most dangerous man in the city. Everybody. Even the council and the gills shaking their shoes before him because he's a first-rate bastard, Geralt, drunk on power, like a spider drunk on flies' blood. It's common knowledge, though not discussed openly in the city, what he's capable of. People vanishing without trace, falsified accusations, torture, assassinations, terror, blackmail and plain plunder. Extortion, swindles and fraud. By the gods, you've landed us in a pretty mess, Beeperfelt. Give it a rest, Dandelion, Denty snapped. It's not that you have to be afraid of anything. No one ever touches a troubadour. For unfathomable reasons, you are inviolable. In Novigrad, Dandelion whined, still pale, an inviolable poet may still fall beneath a speeding wagon, be fatally poisoned by a fish or accidentally drown in a moat. Chappelle specialises in mishaps of that nature. I consider the fact that he talked to us at all something exceptional. One thing is certain... He didn't do it without a reason. He's up to something. You'll see. They'll soon embroil us in something, clap us in irons and drag us off to be tortured with the sanction of the law. That's how things are done here. There is quite some truth, the halfling said to Geralt, in what he says. We must watch out. It's astonishing that that scoundrel Chappelle hasn't keeled over yet. For years they've been saying he's sick, that his heart will give out, and everybody's waiting for him to croak. Be quiet, Bebervelt. The troubadour hissed apprehensively, looking around. Because somebody's bound to be listening. Look how everybody's staring at us. Let's get out of here, I'm telling you. And I suggest we treat seriously what Chappelle told us about the Doppler. I, for example, have never seen a Doppler in my life, and if it comes to it, I'll swear as much before the eternal fire. Look, the halfling suddenly said. Somebody is running towards us. Let's flee, Dandelion howled. Calm yourself, calm yourself, Dainty grinned and combed his mop of hair with his fingers. I know him. It's Muskrat, a local merchant, the guild's treasurer. We've done business together. Hey, look at the expression on his face, as though he's shat his breeches. Hey, Muskrat, are you looking for me? I swear by the eternal fire, Muskrat panted, pushing back a fox fur cap and wiping his forehead with his sleeve. I was certain they'd drag you off to the barbican. It's truly a miracle. I'm astonished. It's nice of you, the halfling sneeringly interrupted, to be astonished. You'll delight us even more if you tell us why. Don't play, dumb Bebervelt, Muskrat frowned. The whole city already knows the profit you made on the Cotch and Eel. Everybody's talking about it already, and it has clearly reached the hierarch and chapel. Now... Cunning you are, how craftily you benefited from what happened in Porvis. What are you blathering about, Muskrat? Ye gods, would you stop trying to play the innocent dainty? Did you buy that cochineal? For a song at ten forty a bushel? Yes, you did. Taking advantage of the meagre demand, you paid with a backed bill without paying out a penny of cash. And what happened? In the course of a day, you palmed off the entire cargo at four times the price for cash on the table. Perhaps you'll have the cheek to say it was an accident, a stroke of luck. 
that when buying the cochineal you knew nothing about the coup in Povis. The what? What are you talking about? There was a coup in Povis, Muskrat yelled. I'm one of those, you know, Leverutians. King Reed was overthrown, and now the Thiasnid clan is in power. Reed's court, the nobility in the army, wore blue, and the weaving mills there only bought indigo. But the colour of the Thiasinids is scarlet, so the price of indigo went down, and cotchard eels gone up. And then it came out that you, Biebervelt, had the only available cargo in your grasp. Ha! Ah! Dainty fell silent and looked distressed. Crafty, Biebervelt, must be said, Muskrat continued. And you didn't tell anybody anything, not even your friends. If you'd let on, we might both have made a profit, might even have set up a joint factory. But you prefer to act alone, softly, softly. Your choice. But don't count on me any longer, either. On the eternal fire, it's true that every halfling is a selfish bastard and awesome. Vimy Vivaldi never gives me a backed bill. And you, on the spot, because you're one tribe, you damned inhumans, you poxy halflings and dwarves, damn the lot of you. Muskrat, spat, turned on his heel and walked off. Dainty, lost in thought, scratched his head until his mop of hair crunched. Something's dawning on me, boys, he said at last. Now I know what needs to be done. Let's go to the bank. If anyone can make head or tail of all this, that someone is the banker friend of mine, Vimy Vivaldi. Chapter 3 I imagined the bank differently, Dandelion whispered, looking around the room. Where do they keep the money, Geralt? The devil only knows, the witcher answered quietly, hiding his torn jacket sleeve. And in the cellars, perhaps. Not a chance. I've had a look around. There aren't any cellars here. They must keep it in the loft, then. Would you come to my office, gentlemen? Vimy Vivaldi asked. Young men and dwarves of indiscernible age, sitting at long tables, were busy covering sheets of parchment with columns of figures and letters. All of them, without exception, were hunched over, with the tips of their tongues sticking out. The work, the witcher judged, was fiendishly monotonous, but seemed to preoccupy the staff utterly. In the corner, on a low stool, sat an elderly, beggarly-looking man, busy sharpening quills. He was making hard work of it. The banker carefully closed the door to the office, stroked his long, white, well-groomed beard, spotted here and there with ink, and straightened a claret-coloured velvet jerkin stretched over a prominent belly. "'You know, Dandelion, sir,' he said, sitting down at an enormous mahogany table, piled with parchments, "'I imagined you quite differently, and I know your songs. I know them. I've heard them. About Princess Vanda, who drowned in the River Dupi because no one wanted her, and about the Kingfisher that fell into a privy. They aren't mine.' Dandelion flushed in fury. I've never written anything like that. Ah, I'm sorry then. Perhaps we could get to the point, Dainty cut in. Time is short and you're talking nonsense. I'm in grave difficulties, Vimy. I was afraid of that, the dwarf nodded. As you recall, I warned you, Bibivelt. I told you three days ago not to sink any resources into that rancid cod liver oil. What if it was cheap? It is not the nominal price that is important, but the size of the profit on resale. The same applies to the rose oil and the wax and those earthenware bowls. What possessed you, Dainty, to buy that shit and in hard cash to boot rather than judiciously pay with a letter of credit or by draft? I told you that storage costs in Novigrad are devilishly high. In the course of two weeks, they will surpass the value of those goods threefold. But you... Yes, the halfling quietly groaned. Tell me, Vivaldi... What did I do? But you told me not to worry, that you would sell everything in the course of twenty-four hours, and now you come and declare that you are in trouble, smiling foolishly and disarmingly all the while. But it's not selling, is it? And costs are rising, what? Ah, that's not good, not good. How am I to get you out of it, Dinty? Had you at least insured that junk, I would have sent some of the clerks at once to quietly torch the store. No, oh, my dear... The only thing to be done is to approach the matter philosophically and say to oneself, fuck this for a game of soldiers. This is business. You win some, you lose some. What kind of profit was it anyway, that cod liver oil, wax and rose oil? Risible. Let us talk about serious business. 
tell me if I should sell the mimosa bark yet, because the offers have begun to stabilise at five and five-sixths. Hey, are you deaf? The banker frowned. The last offer was exactly five and five-sixths. You came back, I hope, to close the deal. You won't get seven anyhow, dainty. I came back. Vivaldi stroked his beard and picked some crumbs of fruitcake from it. You were here an hour since, he said calmly, with instructions to hold out for seven. A sevenfold increase on the price you paid is two crowns five and forty pennies a pound. That is too high, dainty, even for such a perfectly timed market. The tanneries will already have reached agreement, and they will solidly stick to the price, I am absolutely certain. The door to the office opened, and something in a green felt cap and a coat of dappled coney fur girded with hemp and twine rushed in. Merchant Sulamir is offering two crowns fifteen, it squealed. Six and one-sixth, Vivaldi swiftly calculated. What do we do, dainty? Sell, the halfling yelled. A six-fold profit, and you're still bloody wondering. Another something in a yellow cap and a mantle resembling an old sack dashed into the office. Like the first something, it was about two cubits tall. Merchant paper fell its trucks now to sell for below seven, it shouted, wiped its nose on its sleeve and ran out. Aha, the dwarf said after a long silence. One Bibervelt orders us to sell, and another Bibervelt orders us to wait. An interesting situation. What do we do, Dainty? Do you set about explaining at once, or do we wait until a third Bibervelt orders us to load the bark onto galleys and ship it to the land of the Sinocephali, eh? What is that? Dandelion stammered, pointing at the something in a green cap still standing in the doorway. What the bloody hell is it? A young gnome, Geralt said. Undoubtedly, Vivaldi confirmed coldly. It is not an old troll. Anyway, it's not important what it is. Very well, dainty, if you please. Vimy, the halfling said. If you don't mind, don't ask questions. Something awful has happened. Just accept that I, dainty Beaverbelt of Knockgrass Meadow, an honest merchant, do not have a clue what's happening. Tell me everything in detail, the events of the last three days. Please, Vimy? Curious, the dwarf said. Well, for the commission I take, I have to grant the wishes of the client, whatever they might be. So, listen. You came rushing in here three days ago, out of breath, gave me a deposit of a thousand crowns, and demanded an endorsement on a bill amounting to two thousand five hundred and twenty to the bearer. I gave you that endorsement. Without a guarantee? Correct. I like you, Dainty. Go on, Vimy. The next day, you rushed in with a bang and a clatter, demanding that I issue a letter of credit on a bank in Vitsima, for the considerable sum of three thousand five hundred crowns. The beneficiary was to be, if I remember rightly, a certain fair Lukokian, alias Truffle. Well, I issued that letter of credit. Without a guarantee, the halfling said hopefully. Uh, my affection for you, Bibervelt the banker said, ceases at around three thousand crowns. This time I took from your written obligation that in the event of insolvency, the mill would be mine. What mill? That of your father-in-law, Arno Hardbottom in Notgrass Meadow. I'm not going home, Dainty declared glumly, but determinedly. I'll sign on to a ship and become a pirate. Vimy Vivaldi scratched an ear and looked at him suspiciously. Oh, come on, he said. You took that obligation and tore it up almost right away. You're solvent. No small wonder with profits like that. Profits? That's right. I forgot, muttered the dwarf. I was meant not to be surprised by anything. You made a good profit on the cochineal, Bibervelt, because, you see, there was a coup in Porvis. I already know, the halfling interrupted. Indigo's gone down and cochineal's gone up, and I made a profit. Is that true, Vimy? Yes, it is. You have in my safekeeping six thousand three hundred and forty-six crowns and eighty pennies, net, after deducting my commission and tax. You paid the tax for me. What else would I do? Vivaldi said in astonishment. After all, you were here an hour ago and told me to pay it. The clerk has already delivered the entire sum to City Hall. Something around fifteen hundred, because the sale of the horses was, of course, included in it. The door opened with a bang, and something in a very dirty cap came running in. Two crowns thirty, it shouted. Merchant Hazelquist. Uh, don't sell, Dainty called. We'll wait for a better price. Uh, be gone. Back to the market with the both of you.
The two gnomes caught some coppers thrown to them by the dwarf and disappeared. Right, uh, where was I? Vivaldi wondered, playing with a huge, strangely formed amethyst crystal serving as a paperweight. Aha! With the cochineal bought with the bill of exchange. And you needed the letter of credit I mentioned to purchase a large cargo of mimosa bark. You bought a deal of it, but quite cheaply, for thirty-five pennies a pound, from a Zangweberian factor, that truffle or perhaps moral. The galley sailed into port yesterday, and then it all began. I can imagine, Dainty groaned. What is mimosa bark needed for? Dandelion blurted out. Nothing, the halfling muttered dismally. Unfortunately. Mimosa bark, poet sir, the dwarf explained, is an agent used for tanning hides. If somebody was so stupid, Dainty interrupted, as to buy mimosa bark from beyond the seas, when oak bark can be bought into Maria for next to nothing. And here is the nub of the matter, Vivaldi said. Because in Temeria the druids have just announced that if the destruction of oaks is not stopped immediately, they will afflict the land with a plague of hornets and rats. The druids are being supported by the dryads, and the king there is fond of dryads. In short, since yesterday there has been a total embargo on Temerian oak, for which reason Mimosa is going up. Your information was accurate, dainty. A stamping was heard from the chambers beyond the room, and then the something in a green cap came running into the office out of breath. The Honourable Merchant Sulebeer, the note panted, has instructed me to repeat that Merchant Bibervelt, the halfling, is a reckless, bristly swine, a profiteer and charlatan, and that he, Sulebeer, hopes that Bibervelt gets the mange. He'll give two crowns forty-four, and that is his last word. Sell, the halfling blurted out. Go on, shorty, run off and accept it. Count it up for me. Vivaldi reached beneath some scrolls of parchment and took out a dwarven abacus, a veritable marvel. Unlike abacuses used by humans, the dwarven one was shaped like a small open-work pyramid. Vivaldi's abacus, though, was made of gold wires over which slid angular beads of ruby, emerald, onyx and black agate, which fitted into each other. The dwarf slid the gemstones upwards, downwards and sideways for some time with quick, deft movements of his plump finger, that will be, minus the costs and my commission, minus tax, yes, 15,622 crowns and five and twenty pennies. Not bad. If I've reckoned correctly, Dainty Beaverbelt said slowly, altogether net, then I... Ought to have in my account precisely twenty one thousand nine hundred and sixty nine crowns and five pennies. Not bad. Not bad, Dandelion roared. Not bad. You could buy a large village or, or a small castle for that. I've never ever seen that much money at one time. I haven't either, the halfling said. But simmer down, Dandelion. It so happens that no one has seen that money yet, and it isn't certain if anyone ever will. Hey, Bibervelt, the dwarf snorted. Why such gloomy thoughts? Sulamir will pay in cash or buy a bill of exchange, and Sulamir's bills are reliable. What then is the matter? Are you afraid of losing on that stinking cod liver oil and wax? With profits like that, you'll cover the losses with ease. That's not the point. So, what is the point? Dainty coughed and lowered his curly mop. Vinny, he said, eyes fixed on the floor. Chapelle is snooping around me. The banker clicked his tongue. Very bad, he drawled. But it was to be expected. You see, Bibervelt, the information you use when carrying out the transactions does not just have commercial significance, but also political. No one knew what was happening in Porvis and Temeria, Chapelle included, and Chapelle likes to be the first to know. So, now, as you can imagine, he is racking his brains about how you knew. I think he has guessed, because I think I've also worked it out. That's fascinating. Vivaldi swept his eyes over Dandelion and Geralt and wrinkled his snub nose. Fascinating? I'll tell you what's fascinating. Your party, Dainty, he said. A troubadour, a witcher and a merchant. Congratulations. Master Dandelion shows up here and there, even at royal courts, and no doubt keeps his ears open. And the witcher? A bodyguard, someone to frighten debtors. Hasty conclusions, Mr. Vivaldi, Geralt said coldly. We are not partners. And I, Dandelion said, flushing, do not eavesdrop anywhere. 
I'm a poet, not a spy. People say all sorts of things, the dwarf grimaced. All sorts of things, Master Dandelion. Lies, the troubadour yelled. Damned lies. Very well, I believe you. I believe you. I just don't know if Chapel will believe it. But who knows? Perhaps it will all blow over. I tell you, Bibbevelt, that Chapel has changed a lot since his last attack of apoplexy. Perhaps the fear of death looked him in the arse and forced him to think things over. I swear he is not the same Chapel. He seems to have become courteous, rational, composed, and, and somehow honest. Get away, the halfling said. Chapel, honest, courteous, impossible. I'm telling you how it is, Vivaldi replied. And how it is is what I'm telling you. What is more, now the temple is facing another problem, namely the eternal fire. What do you mean? The eternal fire, as it's known, is supposed to burn everywhere. Altars dedicated to that fire are going to be built everywhere, all over the city. A huge number of altars. Don't ask me for details, Dinty. I'm not very familiar with human superstitions. But I know that all the priests and chapel also are concerned about almost nothing else but those altars and that fire. Great preparations are being made. Tax says we'll be going up. That is certain. Uh, yes, Dainty said. Cold comfort, but... The door to the office opened again, and the witcher recognised the something in a green cap and coney fur coat. Merchant Bieberville, it announced. Instructs to buy more pots should they run out. Price no object. Excellent. The halfling smiled, and his smile called to mind the twisted face of a furious wildcat. We will buy huge quantities of pots. Mr. Bieberveld's wish is our command. What else shall we buy more of? Cabbage? Wood tar? Iron rakes? Furthermore, the something in the fur coat croaked, Merchant Bieberveld requests thirty crowns in cash because he has to pay a bribe, eat something and drink some beer, and three miscreants stole his purse in the spear blade. Oh, three miscreants, Dainty said in a slow, drawling voice. Yes, this city seems to be full of miscreants, and where, if one may ask, is the Honourable Merchant Bieberveldt at this very moment? Where else would he be? The something said, sniffing. Than at the Western Market. Vimy, Dainty said malevolently. Don't ask questions, but find me a stout, robust stick from somewhere. I'm going to the Western Market, but I can't go without a stick. There are too many miscreants and thieves there. A stick, you see? Of course. But, Dainty, I'd like to know something, because it is preying on me. I was supposed not to ask any questions, but I shall make a guess, and you can either confirm or deny it. All right. Guess away. That rancid cod liver oil, that oil, that wax and those balls, that bloody twine. It was all a tactical gambit, wasn't it? You wanted to distract the competition's attention from the cochineal and the mimosa, didn't you? To stir up confusion on the market. Eh, didn't he? The door opened suddenly, and something without a cap ran in. Sorrel reports that everything is ready, it yelled shrilly, and asks if he should start pouring. Yes, he should, the halfling bellowed, at once. By the red beard of old Rundurin, Vimy Vivaldi bellowed as soon as the gnome had shut the door. I don't understand anything. What is happening here? Pour what? Into what? I have no idea, Dinty admitted. But, Vimy, the wheels of business must be oiled. Chapter 4 Pushing through the crowd with difficulty, Geralt emerged right in front of a stall laden with copper skillets, pots and frying pans, sparkling in the rays of the twilight sun. Behind the stall stood a red-bearded dwarf in an olive-green hood and heavy sealskin boots. The dwarf's face bore an expression of visible dislike. To be precise, he looked as though any moment he intended to spit on the female customer sifting through the goods. The customer's breast was heaving. She was shaking her golden curls and was besetting the dwarf with a ceaseless and chaotic flow of words. The customer was none other than Vespula, known to Geralt as the thrower of missiles. Without waiting for her to recognise him, he melted swiftly back into the crowd. The Western Market was bustling with life, and getting through the crowd was like forcing one's way through a hawthorn bush. 
Every now and then, something caught on his sleeves and trouser legs. At times, it was children who had lost their mothers while they were dragging their fathers away from the beer tent. At others, it was spies from the guardhouse. At others, shady vendors of caps of invisibility, aphrodisiacs and bawdy scenes carved in cedar wood. Geralt stopped smiling and began to swear, making judicious use of his elbows. He heard the sound of a lute and a familiar peal of laughter. The sounds drifted from a fabulously coloured stall, decorated with the sign, Buy your wonders, amulets and fish bait here. Has anyone ever told you, madam, that you are gorgeous? Dandelion yelled, sitting on the stall and waving his legs cheerfully. No, it cannot be possible. This is a city of blind men, nothing but a city of blind men. Come, good folk, who would hear a ballad of love? Whoever would be moved and enriched spiritually, let him toss a coin into the hat. What are you shoving your way in for, you bastard? Keep your pennies for beggars, and don't insult an artist like me with copper. Perhaps I could forgive you, but art never could. Dandelion, Geralt said, approaching. I thought we'd split up to search for the Doppler, and you're giving concerts. Aren't you ashamed to sing at markets like an old beggar? Ashamed? the bard said, astonished. What matters is what and how one sings, not where. Besides, I'm hungry, and the stallholder promised me lunch. As far as the Doppler is concerned, look for it yourselves. I'm not cut out for chases, brawls, or mob law. I'm a poet. You would do better not to attract attention, old poet. Your fiancé is here. There could be trouble. Fiancé? Dandelion blinked nervously. Which one do you mean? I have several. Vespula, clutching a copper frying pan, had forced her way through the audience with the momentum of a charging aurochs. Dandelion jumped up from the stall and darted away nimbly, leaping over some baskets of carrots. Vespula turned towards the witcher, dilating her nostrils. Geralt stepped backwards, his back coming up against the hard resistance of the stall's wall. Geralt! Dainty Bibivelt shouted, jumping from the crowd and bumping into Vespula. Quickly! Quickly! I've seen him! Look, there! He's getting away! I'll get you, you lechers! Vespula screamed, trying to regain her balance. I'll catch up with the whole of your debauched gang. A fine company. A pheasant, a scruff and a midget with hairy heels. You'll be sorry. This way, get out, Dainty yelled as he ran, jostling a small group of schoolboys intently playing the shell game. There, there! He scarpered between those wagons. Steal up on him from the left, quick! They rushed off in pursuit, the curses of the stallholders and customers they had knocked over ringing in their ears. By a miracle, Geralt avoided tripping over a snot-nosed tot caught up in his legs. He jumped over it, but knocked over two barrels of herrings, for which an enraged fisherman lashed him across the back with a live eel, which he was showing to some customers at that moment. They saw the Doppler trying to flee past a sheep pen. From the other side, Dinty yelled. Cut him off from the other side, Geralt. The Doppler shot like an arrow along the fence, green waistcoat flashing. It was becoming clear why he was not changing into anybody else. No one could rival a halfling's agility. No one, apart from another halfling. Or a witcher. Geralt saw the Doppler suddenly changing direction, kicking up a cloud of dust and nimbly ducking into a hole in the fence surrounding a large tent serving as a slaughterhouse and a shambles. Dainty also saw it. The Doppler jumped between the palings and began to force his way between the flock of bleating sheep crowded into the enclosure. It was clear he would not make it. Geralt turned and rushed after him between the palings. He felt a sudden tug, heard the crack of leather tearing, and the leather suddenly became very loose under his other arm. The witcher stopped, swore, spat, and swore again. Dainty rushed into the tent after the Doppler. From inside came screaming, the noise of blows, cursing, and an awful banging noise. The witcher swore a third time, extremely obscenely, then gnashed his teeth, raised his hand, and formed his fingers into the Ard sign, aiming it straight at the tent. The tent billowed up like a sail during a gale, and from the inside reverberated a hellish howling, clattering and lowing of oxen. The tent collapsed. The Doppler, crawling on its belly, darted out from beneath the canvas and dashed towards another smaller tent, probably the cold store. Right away, Geralt pointed his hand towards him and jabbed him in the back with the sign. The Doppler tumbled to the ground as though struck by lightning, turned a somersault, but immediately sprang up and rushed into the tent. The Witcher was hot on his heels.
It stank of meat inside the tent, and it was dark. Teleco, Lungreving, Latorte were standing there, breathing heavily, clinging with both hands onto a side of pork hanging on a pole. There was no other way out of the tent, the canvas firmly fastened to the ground with numerous pegs. It's a pleasure to meet you again, Mimic, Geralt said coldly. The Doppler was breathing heavily and hoarsely. Leave me alone, it finally grunted. Why are you tormenting me, Witcher? Teleco, Geralt said. You're asking foolish questions. In order to come into possession of Bibavelt's horses and identity, you cut his head open and abandoned him in the wilds. You're still making use of his personality and ignoring the problems you're causing him. The devil only knows what else you're planning, but I shall confuse those plans in any event. I don't want to kill you or turn you over to the authorities, but you must leave the city. I'll see to it that you do. And if I don't want to? I'll carry you out in a sack on a handcart. The Doppler swelled up abruptly and then suddenly became thinner and began to grow, his curly chestnut hair turning white and straightening, reaching his shoulders. The halfling's green waistcoat shone like oil becoming black leather and silver studs sparkled on the shoulders and sleeves. The chubby, ruddy face elongated and paled. The hilt of a sword extended above its right shoulder. Don't come any closer, the second witcher said huskily and smiled. Don't come any nearer, Geralt. I won't let you lay hands on me. What a hideous smile I have, Geralt thought, reaching for his sword. What a hideous face I have, and how hideously I squint. So, is that what I look like? Damn. The hands of the Doppler and the Witcher simultaneously touched their sword hilts, and both swords simultaneously sprang from their scabbards. Both Witchers simultaneously took two quick, soft steps, one to the front, the other to the side. Both of them simultaneously raised their swords and swung them in a short, hissing moulinet. Simultaneously, they both stopped dead, frozen in position. You cannot defeat me, the Doppler snarled, because I am you, Geralt. You are mistaken, Teleco, the Witcher said softly. Drop your sword and resume Bibervelt's form. Otherwise, you'll regret it, I warn you. I am you, the Doppler repeated. You will not gain an advantage over me. You cannot defeat me, because I am you. You cannot have any idea what it means to be me, Mimic. Teleco lowered the hand, gripping the sword. I am you, he repeated. No, the Witcher countered. You are not. And do you know why? Because you're a poor, little, good-natured Doppler. A Doppler who, after all, could have killed Bibervelt and buried his body in the undergrowth by so doing, gaining total safety and utter certainty that he would not be unmasked, ever, by anybody, including the halfling's spouse, the famous Gardenia Bibervelt. But you didn't kill him, Teleco, because you didn't have the courage, because you're a poor, little, good-natured Doppler, whose close friends call him Doodoo, and whoever you might change into, you'll always be the same. You only know how to copy what is good in us, because you don't understand the bad in us. That's what you are, Doppler. Teleco moved backwards, pressing his back against the tent's canvas. Which is why, Geralt continued, you will now turn back into Bibervelt and hold your hands out nicely to be tied up. You aren't capable of defying me, because I am what you are unable of copying. You are absolutely aware of this, Dudu, because you took over my thoughts for a moment. Teleco straightened up abruptly. His face's features, still those of the Witcher, blurred and spread out, and his white hair curled and began to darken. You're right, Geralt, he said indistinctly, because his lips had begun to change shape. I took over your thoughts only briefly, but it was sufficient. Do you know what I'm going to do now? The leather Witcher jacket took on a glossy cornflower blue colour. The Doppler smiled, straightened his plum bonnet with its egret's feather, and tightened the strap of the lute slung over his shoulder, the lute which had been a sword a moment ago. I'll tell you what I'm going to do, Witcher, he said with the rippling laughter characteristic of Dandelion. I'll go on my way, squeeze my way into the crowd, and change quietly into any old body, even a beggar, because I prefer being a beggar in Novigrad to being a Doppler in the wilds. Novigrad owes me something, Geralt. The building of a city here tainted a land we could have lived in, lived in in our natural form. We have been exterminated, hunted down like rabid dogs. 
I'm one of the few to survive. I want to survive, and I will survive. Long ago, when wolves pursued me in the winter, I turned into a wolf and ran with a pack for several weeks, and survived. Now I'll do that again, because I don't want to roam about through wildernesses and be forced to winter beneath fallen trees. I don't want to be forever hungry. I don't want to serve as target practice all the time. Here in Novigrad it's warm. There's grub. I can make money, and very seldom do people shoot arrows at each other. Novigrad is a pack of wolves. I'll join that pack and survive. Understand? Geralt nodded reluctantly. You gave dwarves, halflings, gnomes, and even elves, the Doppler continued, twisting his mouth in an insolent dandelion smile. The modest possibility of assimilation. Why should I be any worse off? Why am I denied that right? What do I have to do to be able to live in this city? Turn into a she-elf with doe eyes, silky hair and long legs? Well, in what way is a she-elf better than me? Only that at the sight of the she-elf you pick up speed, and at the sight of me you want to puke. You know where you can stuff an argument like that. I'll survive anyway. I know how to. As a wolf I ran, I howled, and I fought without others over a she-wolf. As a resident of Novigrad I'll trade. We wicker baskets, beg or steal. As one of you I'll do what one of you usually does. Who knows? Perhaps I'll even take a wife. The Witcher said nothing. Yes, as I said, Teleko continued calmly, I'm going, and you, Geralt, will not even try to stop me, because I, Geralt, knew your thoughts for a moment, including the ones you don't want to admit to, the ones you even hide from yourself, because to stop me, you'd have to kill me, and the thought of killing me in cold blood fills you with disgust, doesn't it? The Witcher said nothing. Teleko adjusted the strap of the lute again, turned away, and walked towards the exit. He walked confidently, but Geralt saw him hunch his neck and shoulders in expectation of the whistle of a sword blade. He put his sword in its scabbard. The Doppler stopped in mid-step and looked around. Farewell, Geralt, he said. Thank you. Farewell, Dudu, the Witcher replied. Good luck. The Doppler turned away and headed towards the crowded bazaar with Dandelion's sprightly, cheerful, swinging gait. Like Dandelion, he swung his left arm vigorously, and just like Dandelion, he grinned at the wenches as he passed them. Geralt set off slowly after him. Slowly. Teleko seized his lute in full stride. After slowing his pace, he played two chords, and then dexterously played a tune Geralt knew. Turning away slightly, he sang exactly like Dandelion. Spring will return, on the road the rain will fall, hearts will be warmed by the heat of the sun. It must be thus, for fire still smoulders in us all, an eternal fire, hope for each one. Pass that on to Dandelion, if you remember, he called, and tell him that winter is a lousy title. The ballad to be called The Eternal Fire. Farewell, Witcher. Hey! suddenly resounded. You pheasant! Teleko turned around in astonishment. From behind a stall emerged Vespula, her breast heaving violently, raking him up with a foreboding gaze. Eyeing up tarts, you cad! she hissed, breast heaving more and more enticingly. Singing your little songs, are you, you knave? Teleko took off his bonnet and bowed, broadly smiling Dandelion's characteristic smile. Vespula, my dear, he said ingratiatingly, how glad I am to see you. Forgive me, my sweet, I owe you... Oh, you do, you do, Vespula interrupted loudly. And what you owe me, you will now pay me. Take that! An enormous copper frying pan flashed in the sun, and with a deep, loud clang, smacked into the Doppler's head. Teleko staggered and fell with an indescribably stupid expression frozen on his face, arms spread out, and his physiognomy suddenly began to change, melt, and lose its similarity to anything at all. Seeing it, the Witcher leapt towards him in full flight, snatching a large killim from a stall. Having unfurled the killim on the ground, he sent the Doppler onto it with two kicks and rolled it up in it quickly but tightly. Sitting down on the bundle, he wiped his forehead with a sleeve. Vespula, gripping the frying pan, looked at him malevolently, and the crowd closed in all around. 
He's sick, the witcher said, and smiled affectedly. It's for his own good. Don't crowd good people. The poor thing needs air. Did you hear? Chappell asked, calmly but resonantly, suddenly pushing his way through the throng. Please, do not form a public gathering here. Please disperse. Public gatherings are forbidden, punishable by a fine. In the blink of an eye, the crowd scattered to the sides, only to reveal Dandelion approaching swiftly to the sounds of his loot. On seeing him, Vespula let out an ear-splitting scream, dropped the frying pan, and fled across the square. What happened? Dandelion asked. Did she see the devil? Geralt stood up, holding the bundle, which had begun to move weakly. Chapelle slowly approached. He was alone, and his personal guard was nowhere to be seen. I wouldn't come any closer, Geralt said quietly. If I were you, Lord Chapel, sir, I wouldn't come any closer. You wouldn't? Chapel tightened his thin lips, looking at him coldly. If I were you, Lord Chapel, I would pretend I never saw anything. Yes, no doubt, Chapel said. But you are not me. Dainty Biebervelt ran up from behind the tent out of breath and sweaty. On seeing Chapel, he stopped, began to whistle, held his hands behind his back, and pretended to be admiring the roof of the granary. Chapel went over and stood by Geralt, very close. The witcher did not move, but only narrowed his eyes. For a moment, they looked at each other, and then Chapel leaned over the bundle. Do do, he said to Dandelion's strangely deformed Cordovan boots sticking out of the rolled-up kilim. Copy Bieberveld and quickly. What? Dainty yelled, stopping staring at the granary. What's that? Be quiet, Chapel said. Well, Doodoo, are things coming along? I'm just... A muffled grunting issued from the kilim. I'm just a moment. The cordovan boots sticking out of the kilim stretched, became blurred, and changed into the halfling's bare, hairy feet. Get out, Doodoo, Chapel said. And you, Dainty, be quiet. All halflings look the same, don't they? Dainty mumbled something indistinctly. Geralt, eyes still narrowed, looked at Chapel suspiciously. The minister, however, straightened up and looked all around, and all that remained of any gawkers who were still in the vicinity was the clacking of wooden clogs dying away in the distance. The second dainty beavervelt scrambled and rolled out of the bundle, sneezed, sat up and rubbed his eyes and nose. Dandelion perched himself on a trunk lying alongside and strummed away on his lute with an expression of moderate interest on his face. Who do you think that is, dainty? Chapel asked mildly. Very similar to you, don't you think? He's my cousin. The halfling shot back and grinned. A close relative. Doo Doo Biebervelt of Knockgrass Meadow, an astute businessman. I've actually just decided. Yes, Dainty? I've decided to appoint him my factor in Novigrad. What do you say to that, cousin? Oh, thank you, cousin. His close relative, the pride of the Biebervelt clan and an astute businessman, smiled broadly. Chapel also smiled. Has your dream about life in the city come true? Geralt muttered. What do you see in this city? Dudu. And you, Chapel. Had you lived on the moors, Chapel muttered back, and eaten roots, got soaked and frozen, you'd know. We also deserve something from life, Geralt. We aren't inferior to you. Very true, Geralt nodded. You aren't. Perhaps it even happens that you're better. What happened to the real Chapel? Popped his clogs, the second Chapel whispered. Two months ago now, apoplexy. May the earth lie lightly on him and may the eternal fire light his way. I happened to be in the vicinity. No one noticed. Geralt, you aren't going to... What didn't anyone notice? The witcher asked, with an inscrutable expression. Thank you, Chapel muttered. Are there more of you? Is it important? No, agreed the witcher. It isn't. 
A two-cubit-tall figure in a green cap and spotted coney fur coat dashed out from behind the wagons and stalls and trotted over. Mr. Bebervelt, the gnome panted and stammered, looking around and sweeping his eyes from one halfling to the other. I presume, Shorty, Dainty said, that you have a matter for my cousin Dudu Bebervelt to deal with? Speak. Speak. That is him. Sorrel reports that everything has gone, the gnome said, and smiled broadly, showing small pointed teeth. For four crowns apiece. I think I know what it's about, Dainty said. Pity Vivaldi's not here. You would have calculated the profit in no time. If I may, cousin, Teleko, longer of England taught, Penstock for short, Dudu to his close friends, and for the whole of Novigrad, a member of the large Bibervelt family spoke up. If I may, I'll calculate it. I have an infallible memory for figures, as well as for other things. By all means. Dainty gave a bow. By all means, cousin. The costs, the Doppler frowned, were low. Eighteen for the oil, eight fifty for the cod liver oil. Hmm. Altogether, including the string, forty-five crowns. Takings, six hundred at four crowns makes two thousand four hundred. No commission, because there weren't any middlemen. Please, do not forget about the tax, the second Chappelle reminded him. Please do not forget that standing before you is a representative of the city authorities and the temple who treats his duties gravely and conscientiously. It's exempt from tax, Dudu Bibervelt declared, because it was sold in a sacred cause. Hey, the cod liver oil, wax and oil dyed with a little cochineal, the dopper explained. Need only be poured into earthenware bowls with a piece of string dipped into it. The string, when lit, gives a beautiful red flame, which burns for a long time and doesn't smell. The eternal fire. The priests needed vigil lights for the altars of the eternal fire. Now they don't need them. Bloody hell, Chappell muttered. You're right. They needed vigil lights. Doodoo, you're brilliant. I take after my mother, Teleko said modestly. Yes, indeed, the spitting image of his mother, Dainty agreed. Just look into those intelligent eyes. Begonia Bibervelt, my darling aunt, as I live and breathe. Geralt, Dandelion groaned, he's earned more in three days than I've earned in my whole life by singing. In your place, the witcher said gravely, I quit singing and take up commerce. Ask him, he may take you on as an apprentice. Witcher, Teleko said, tugging him by the sleeve. Tell me how I could repay you. Twenty-two crowns. What? For a new jacket. Look what's left of mine. Do you know what? Dandelion suddenly yelled. Let's all go to the house of ill repute, to passive Flora. The Bieberbelts are paying. Do they admit halflings? Dainty asked with concern. Just let them try not to. Chapel put on a menacing expression. Just let them try, and I'll accuse that entire bordello of heresy. Right, Dandelion called. Very satisfactory. Geralt, are you coming? The Witcher laughed softly. Do you know what, Dandelion? he said. I'll come with pleasure. A Little Sacrifice Chapter One The mermaid emerged to waist height from the water and splashed her hands violently and hard against the surface. Geralt saw that she had gorgeous, utterly perfect breasts. Only the colour spoiled the effect. The nipples were dark green, and the areoli around them were only a little lighter. Nimbly aligning herself with an approaching wave, the mermaid arched gracefully, shook her wet willow-green hair, and sang melodiously. What? The duke leaned over the side of the cog. What is she saying? She's declining, Geralt said. She says she doesn't want to. Have you explained that I love her? That I can't imagine life without her? That I want to wed her? Only her, no other. Yes, I am. And? And nothing. Say it again. The witcher touched his lips and produced a quavering warble. Struggling to find the words and the intonation, he began to translate the Duke's avowal. The mermaid, lying back on the water, interrupted. Don't translate. Don't tire yourself, she sang. I understand. When he says he loves me, he always puts on such a foolish expression. 
Did he say anything definite? Not really. Pity, the mermaid said, before she flapped in the water and dived under, flexing her tail powerfully and making the sea foam with her notched flukes, which resembled the tail of a mullet. What? What did she say? the duke asked. That it's a shame. What's a shame? What does she mean, a shame? I'd say she turned you down. Nobody refuses me, the duke roared, denying the obvious facts. My lord, the skipper of the cog muttered, walking over to them. The nets are ready. All we need do is cast them and she will be yours. I wouldn't advise it, Geralt said softly. She is not alone. There are more of them beneath the waves, and there may be a kraken deeper down there. The skipper quaked, blanched, and seized his backside with both hands in a nonsensical gesture. A, a, cra a kraken? Yes, a kraken, the witcher repeated. I don't advise fooling around with nets. All she need do is scream, and all that'll be left of this tub will be a few floating planks that'll drown us like kittens. Besides, Aglaval, you should decide whether you want to wed her or catch her in a net and keep her in a barrel. I love her, Aglaval said firmly. I want her for my wife, but for that she must have legs and not a scaly tail, and it's feasible, since I bought a magical elixir with a full guarantee for two pounds of exquisite pearls. After drinking it, she'll grow legs. She'll just suffer a little for three days, no more. Call her, witcher. Tell her again. I've already told her twice. She said absolutely no. She doesn't consent. But she added that she knows a witch, a sea witch, who is prepared to cast a spell to turn your legs into a handsome tail, painlessly. She must be insane. She thinks I would have a fishy tail. Not a chance. Call her, get out. The witcher leaned far out over the side. The water in the boat's shadow was green and seemed as thick as jelly. He did not have to call. The mermaid suddenly shot out above the surface in a fountain of water. For a moment, she literally stood on her tail, then dived down into the waves and turned on her back, revealing her attributes in all their glory. Geralt swallowed. Hey, she sang, will this take much longer? My skin's getting chapped from the sun. White hair, ask him if he consents. He does not, the witcher sang back. She nuts, understand, he cannot have a tail, cannot live beneath the water. You can breathe air, but he cannot breathe underwater. I knew it, the mermaid screamed shrilly. I knew it. Excuses, foolish, naive excuses, not a bit of sacrifice. Whoever loves makes sacrifices. I made sacrifices for him every day. I hauled myself out onto the rocks for him. I wore out the scales on my bottom, frayed my fins. I caught coals for him, and he will not sacrifice those two hideous pegs for me. Love! doesn't just mean taking. One also has to be able to give up things to make sacrifices. Tell him that. She and that, Geralt called. Don't you understand? He cannot survive in the water. I don't accept stupid excuses. I, I like him too and want to have his fry. But how can I, if he doesn't want to be a spawner? Where should I deposit my eggs, huh? In his cap? What is she saying? the duke yelled. Geralt, I didn't bring you here to chat with her. She's digging her heels in, she's angry. Cast those nets, Aglaval roared. I'll keep her in a pool for a month, and then she'll... Shove it, the skipper yelled back, demonstrating what he was to shove with his middle finger. There might be a kraken beneath us. Ever seen a kraken, my lord? Hop into the water, if that is your will, and catch her with your hands. I'm not getting involved. I make my living by fishing from this cog. You make your living by my good will, you scoundrel. Cast your net, or I'll order you strung up. Kiss a dog's arse. I'm in charge on this cog. Be quiet, both of you, Geralt shouted irately. She's saying something. It's a difficult dialect. I need to concentrate. I've had enough, Shinats yelled melodiously. I'm hungry. Well, 
White hair, he must decide, decide at once. Tell him just one thing. I will not be made a laughingstock of any longer or associate with him if he is going to look like a four-armed starfish. Tell him I have girlfriends who are much better at those frolics he was suggesting on the rocks, but I consider them immature games fit for children before they shed their scales. I'm a normal, healthy mermaid. She and that's. Don't interrupt. I haven't finished yet. I'm healthy, normal, and ripe for spawning. And if he really desires me, he must have a tail, fins, and everything a normal merman has. Otherwise, I don't want to know him. Geralt translated quickly, trying not to be vulgar. He was not very successful. The duke flushed and swore foully. The brazen hussy, he yelled. The frigid mackerel. Let her find herself a cod. What did he say? She nuts asked curiously, swimming over. That he doesn't want a tail. Then tell him. Tell him to dry up. What did she say? She told you, the witcher translated, to go drown yourself. Chapter Two Ah, oh, well, Dandelion said. Pity I couldn't sail with you, but what can I do? Sailing makes me puke like nobody's business. But you know what? I've never spoken to a mermaid. It's a shame, damn it. I know you, Geralt said, fastening his saddlebags. You'll write a ballad anyway. Well, never fear. I already have the first stanzas. In my ballad, the mermaid will sacrifice herself for the duke. She'll exchange her fishtail for slender legs, but will pay for it by losing her voice. The duke will betray her, abandon her, and then she'll perish from grief and turn into foam when the first rays of sunshine... Who'd believe such rot? It doesn't matter, Dandelion snorted. Ballads aren't written to be believed. They're written to move their audience. But why am I talking to you about this when you know bugger all about it? You'd better tell me how much Aglaval paid you. He didn't pay me anything. He claimed I'd failed to carry out the task, that he'd expected something else, and he pays for results, not good intentions. Dandelion shook his head, took off his bonnet, and looked at the witcher with a forlorn grimace on his mouth. You mean we still don't have any money? So it would seem. Dandelion made an even more forlorn face. It's all my fault, he moaned. I'm to blame for it all, Geralt. Are you angry at me? No. The witcher wasn't angry at Dandelion. Not at all. There was no doubt Dandelion was to blame for what had befallen them. He had insisted they went to the fair at Four Maples. Organising festivities, the poet argued, satisfied people's profound and natural needs. From time to time, the bard maintained, a chap has to meet other people in a place where he can have a laugh and a sing-song, gorge himself on kebabs and pierogies, drink beer, listen to music, and squeeze a girl as he swung her around in the dance. If every chap wanted to satisfy those needs, Dandelion argued, individually, periodically and randomly, an indescribable mess would arise. For that reason, holidays and festivities were invented, and since holidays and festivities exist, a chap ought to frequent them. Geralt did not challenge this, although taking part in festivities occupied a very low position on the list of his own profound and natural needs. Nonetheless, he agreed to accompany Dandelion for he was counting on obtaining information from the gathered concentration of people about a possible mission or job. He'd had no work for a long time, and his cash reserves had shrunk alarmingly. The Witcher did not bear Dandelion a grudge for provoking the rangers of the forest. He was not innocent either, for he could have intervened and held the bard back. He did not, however, for he could not stand the infamous guardians of the forest, known as the rangers, a volunteer force whose mission was to eradicate non-humans. It had annoyed him to hear their boasts about elves, spriggans and eerie wives bristling with arrows, butchered or hanged. Dandelion, though, who after travelling for some time with the Witcher had become convinced of his impunity from retaliation, had surpassed himself. Initially, the rangers had not reacted to his mockery, taunts or filthy suggestions, which aroused the thunderous laughter of the watching villagers. When, however, Dandelion sang a hastily composed obscene and abusive couplet, ending with the words, if you want to be a nothing, be a ranger. 
an argument and then a fierce mass punch-up broke out. The shed, serving as the dance hall, went up in smoke. Intervention came in the form of a squad of men belonging to Catalan Budibog, also known as the Empty-Headed, on whose estates lay four maples. The rangers, Dandelion and Geralt, were found jointly guilty of all the damage and offences, which included the seduction of a red-headed and mute girl, who was found in the bushes behind the barn following the incident, blushing and grinning foolishly, with her shift torn up to her armpits. Fortunately, Castellan Budibog knew Dandelion, so it ended with a fine being paid, which nonetheless ate up all the money they had. They also had to flee from Four Maples as fast as they could ride, because the rangers, who had been chased out of the village, were threatening revenge, and an entire squad of them, numbering over forty men, was hunting Rosalkas in the neighbouring forests. Geralt did not have the slightest desire to be hit by one of the rangers' arrows, whose heads were barbed like harpoons and inflicted dreadful injuries. So they had to abandon their original plan, which had involved doing the rounds of the villages on the edge of the forest, where the witcher had reasonable prospects of work. Instead, they rode to Bremervold on the coast. Unfortunately, apart from the love affair between Duke Aglaval and the mermaid Sheernats, which offered small chances of success, the witcher had failed to find a job. They had already sold Geralt's gold signet for food, and an Alexandrite brooch the troubadour had once been given as a souvenir by one of his numerous paramours. Things were tight. But no, the witcher was not angry with Dandelion. No, Dandelion, he said, I'm not angry with you. Dandelion did not believe him, which was quite apparent by the fact that he kept quiet. Dandelion was seldom quiet. He patted his horse's neck and fished around in his saddlebags for the umpteenth time. Geralt knew he would not find anything there they could sell. The smell of food, borne on a breeze from a nearby tavern, was becoming unbearable. Master! somebody shouted. Hey! Master! Yes, Geralt said, turning around. A big-bellied, well-built man in felt boots and a heavy fur-lined wolfskin coat clambered out of a cart pulled by a pair of onagers, which had just stopped alongside. Um, that is, the porchy man said, embarrassed, walking over. I didn't mean you, sir. I meant, I meant, Master Dandelion. It is I. The poet proudly sat up straight, adjusting his bonnet, bearing an egret feather. What is your need, my good man? Begging your pardon, the paunchy man said. I am Teleri Drohard, spice merchant and dean of our local guild. My son, Gaspar, has just plighted his troth to Dahlia, the daughter of Mestfin the cog skipper. Ha, huh, Dandelion said, maintaining a haughty air. I offer my congratulations and extend my wishes of happiness to the betrothed couple. How may I be of help? Uh, does it concern jus prime noctis? I never decline that. Eh? Uh, uh, no. That is, you see, the betrothal banquet and ball are this evening. Since it got out that you, master, have come to Bramavord, my wife will let up, just like a woman. Listen, she says to Larry, we'll show everybody we aren't churls like them, that we stand for culture and art, that when we have a feast it's refined and not an excuse to get pissed and throw up. I says to her, silly moo, but we've already hired one bard, won't that suffice? And she says one is too few. Ho, ho, Master Dandelion. Well, I never, such a celebrity. That'll be one in the eye for our neighbours. Master, do us the honour. I prefer to give five and twenty talars as a gesture, naturally, uh, to show my support for the arts. Do my ears deceive me? Dandelion drawled. I, I am to be the second bard? An appendix to some other musician? I? I have not sunk so low, my dear sir, as to accompany somebody. Gerhard blushed. Forgive me, master, he gibbered. That isn't what I meant. It was my wife. Forgive me. Do us the honour. Dandelion, Geralt hissed softly. Don't put on airs. We need those few pennies. Don't try to teach me the poet yelled. Me putting on airs? Me? Look at him. What should I say about you, who rejects a lucrative proposition every other day? You won't kill hirikas because they're an endangered species, or mecopterans because they're harmless, or night spirits because they're sweet, or dragons because your code forbids it. 
I, just to match it, also have my self-respect. I also have a code. Dandelion, please, do it for me. A little sacrifice, friend, nothing more. I swear I won't turn my nose up at the next job that comes along. Come on, Dandelion. The troubadour looked down at the ground and scratched his chin, which was covered in soft, fair bristles. Drowhard, mouth gaping, moved closer. Master, do us this honour. My wife won't forgive me if I don't invite you. Uh, now then, I'll make it thirty. Thirty-five, Dandelion said firmly. Geralt smiled and hopefully breathed in the scent of food wafting from the tavern. Agreed, master, agreed, Teleri Drowhard said quickly. So quickly, it was evident he would have given forty had the need arisen. And now, my home, if you desire to groom yourself and rest, is your home. And you, sir, what do they call you? Geralt of Rivia. And I invite you too, sir, of course, for a bite to eat and something to drink. Certainly, with pleasure. Dandelion said. Show us the way, my dear sir. And just between us, who is the other bard? The Honourable Miss Essie Davin. Chapter 3 Geralt rubbed a sleeve over the silver studs of his jacket and his belt buckle one more time, smoothed down his hair, which was held down with a clean headband, and polished his boots by rubbing one leg against the other. Dandelion? Hmm? The bard smoothed the egret feather pinned to his bonnet and straightened and pulled down his jerkin. The two of them had spent half the day cleaning their garments and tidying them up. What, Geralt? Behave in such a way as they throw us out after supper and not before. You must be joking, the poet said indignantly. Watch your manners yourself. Shall we go in? We shall. Do you hear? Somebody's singing. A woman. Have you only just noticed? That's Essie Darwin, known as Little Eye. What? Have you never met a female troubadour? True, I forgot you steer clear of places where art flourishes. Little Eye is a gifted poet and singer, though not without her flaws, among which impertinence, so I hear, is not the least. What she is singing now happens to be one of my ballads. She will soon hear a piece of my mind which will make that Little Eye of hers water. Dandelion, have mercy. They'll throw us out. Don't interfere. These are professional issues. Let's go in. Dandelion? Huh? Why little I? You'll see. The banquet was being held in a huge storeroom, emptied of barrels of herrings and cod liver oil. The snail had been killed, though not entirely, by hanging up bunches of mistletoe and heather decorated with coloured ribbons wherever possible. Here and there, as is customary, were also hung plats of garlic, meant to frighten off vampires. The tables and benches, which had been pushed towards the walls, had been covered with white linen, and in a corner there was a large makeshift hearth and spit. It was crowded, but not noisy. More than four dozen people of various estates and professions, not to mention the pimply youth and his snub-nosed fiancée, with her eyes fixed on her husband-to-be, were listening reverentially to a sonorous and melodious ballad, sung by a young woman in a dim